Magic Brownies. Book two of the cozy mystery series Camping Girl. Written by Josephine Beintema. Narrated by Josephine Beintema. Magic Brownies. Book two of the cozy mystery series Camping Girl. Written by Josephine Beintema. Narrated by Josephine Beintema. Chapter One. Reunited. There was a knock at my camper door. I opened it up and was immediately enveloped in a hug. It's so good to see you, Ivy, Molly exclaimed as she examined me from head to toe. Did you get a tan? Molly, I said in surprise. Wow, how are you? I had not been expecting to see my old roommate. Molly had neglected to tell me she was coming or why she was now here. It had been three weeks since I had given her notice I was moving out of our apartment in the city. Molly and I had worked together waitressing at a restaurant. While she waited full-time, I had only had part-time hours, also working as a baker part-time. Since my grandmother's death a month ago, I had been living in and running a derelict campground I had inherited. It was called the Happy Camper Resort and had an assortment of retirees as permanent residents. It also needed a lot of work if it was going to be financially viable. Thankfully, I had also inherited some money from one of the previous inhabitants, Ethel Merlay. The money was mine with the stipulation I run the Happy Camper Resort for a period of one year and use the money to update the campground. I missed you! Molly slung a large canvas bag onto my bed as she surveyed the tiny vintage camper I now lived in. My two dogs, Cookie and Cupcake, a pair of Boston Terriers which I had also inherited from my grandmother, sniffed curiously at her feet. I thought I would bring a few of your things that you had left at the apartment. Plus, I brought a few of mine, too. I looked outside to see a rented U-Haul sitting on the dirt road which wound through the lots of the campground. You needed a U-Haul? I didn't think I had left very much behind. Just my bed and dresser set. It was necessary. A nonchalant Molly shrugged as she explored my cupboards. Where's the guest room in this rig? There is none. I was now suspicious. Why are you wearing a hat? You never wear a hat unless you've made a bad hair dye decision, which happens after a breakup. Tiny bathroom, commented Molly as she ignored my question. Molly? I waited patiently for her to get around to reveal the real reason she had come. Fine. With a sigh, she swept the hat off her head, revealing a cascade of vivid blue hair which darkened as it got closer to her scalp. Gil dumped me. He got a promotion in the kitchen, then decided he wanted someone better than a waitress to bring home to his mama. Felix didn't want to deal with the drama and chose Gil over me. I got let go because Gil's a big baby who can't work with his ex. Molly flopped onto my bed dramatically. What's really in the U-Haul? I crossed my arms. Somehow the blue hair looked good on her. It would never look as good on me as my own caramel locks, I reflected. You could have rented a much smaller van, cheaper just for my stuff. No job, no roommate, no rent money, replied Molly in a practical tone. The boys in 4B were happy to help load my furniture after I bribed them with pizza. I thought I might stay with you for a while, just until I figure out what I'm going to do. There is no place to stay, especially with furniture. I had intended to sell mine to raise a little cash for my own bills. I sighed and flopped down on the bed with her. It was all the invitation Cupcake and Cookie needed to join us. I fingered a strand of her hair. That bad? She shrugged and pouted. Not really. He wasn't worth it. Chocolate? I asked. Please, agreed Molly. And then she said nine magic words. I will pay rent if you let me stay. How? I questioned as I got up to open the fridge. I kept all the good chocolate frozen so I would not be tempted to just eat it all at once. Pulling out a bar, I broke it in half, offering a portion to her. No job, no roommate, no rent money, remember? Molly took the chocolate, peeling back the wrapper. I have a little money for emergencies. Plus, there must be some sort of job openings around here. Like I said, I just need a diversion until I figure out what I'm going to do. I thought about Ethel's trailer and all the money I was about to lose. I had intended to use the camper as a weekend glamping getaway. It would have made more money doing that than having another full-time resident. However, a full-time resident was money I could count on. I have a camper you can rent. Really? perked up Molly. All you need to do is help me clean it out, I happily told her. Molly pouted again. Cleaning? 
You know I'm allergic to dust mites. Do you want a place to stay or not? I reasoned with her. I've got a storage room in the clubhouse where you can put your things for now. Deal. Promptly, Molly pounced on the idea. Can anyone help him load the truck? I should get the U-Haul to a dealer tonight if I don't want to get charged for an extra day. I'm afraid it's just you and I are unloading, I sighed. I had never mind a little hard work, but those dressers were going to be heavy. Most of my tenants are senior citizens. I'm not about to have one of them throw out their backs. Is this a senior's campground? An unhappy Molly questioned. Not really. However, most of my long-term renters do happen to be seniors. They have been here for years with my grandma, I shrugged. As long as they keep paying rent, I'm happy to have them. Molly nodded, finishing off her half of the chocolate bar. I tossed the wrappers into the garbage, and we headed out to the truck. Molly happily got in the driver's seat, and I jumped in the passenger seat to tell her where the clubhouse was. Grinding gears, Molly got to the clubhouse with fits and starts. It wasn't so bad. How did you drive all the way from the city in this thing, I wondered. Both of us set to opening the doors. I opened the clubhouse while Molly rolled up the back of the U-Haul. As long as I'm driving on a road with some speed, I can manage pretty good. The clutch gives me troubles when I can't go fast, shrugged an unconcerned Molly. Why didn't you get an automatic transmission? I asked as I went to unlock the storage room at the back of the clubhouse. It didn't hold much except dust and cobwebs. I saw some large boxes stacked to the side. Judging by the dust, it looked like they had been left in the storage room fairly recently. I resolved to look at them later when I had time. They have that option? questioned Molly as she followed me, eyeing the room. This is filthy. The storage room is available and cheap, I told her. Grab a broom from the kitchen while I get some rags. It will be clean enough to store our stuff once we are done. Molly rolled her eyes and we got to work. Once the room was deemed clean enough to store our items, we set about getting things off the truck. Need a hand? The wheezy voice of Bertie Sellers reached us. He tipped his fishing hat back, wearing hip waders and a shirt full of pockets. I poked my head out from the truck. Thanks, Bertie, but I think we have it. You can't be moving heavy furniture, complained Conrad Hubble as he adjusted his glasses. The little gnome of a man climbed up into the truck. Let us men get the job done. Just tell us where you want the furniture. With doubt, I eyed Conrad's tiny elderly frame. Don't worry about it, Conrad. It's just a few items to move. They can take boxes in, suggested Molly as she grabbed one. That way it would be less for us to carry. I'll take a box chimed Mabel, adjusting her glasses. Mabel was in much better shape than most of my elderly crew of campers. She liked to do yoga in the park and aerobic classes in the Oaks Crossing community pool. Mabel and a cluster of other tenants had gathered at the back of the truck, curious to see what was happening. What's with all the stuff? questioned Bee. Bee kept her arthritic and ample girth on the ground, which was far more sensible than what Conrad was doing. My friend Molly brought my furniture and her own from the city, I explained. She's going to be staying in Ethel's trailer for a while. Why is her hair blue? whispered Agatha to Mabel. It wasn't a very quiet whisper. The young ones like to experiment these days, assured Mabel. It's just a phase. Wow, said Molly underneath her breath to me. You weren't kidding. Nope, I smiled. Hey, everyone. We could make a line and just hand boxes to each other until they're all inside. Then Molly and I can get the heavy furniture to the storage room. Sounds like a plan. B started ordering the group into places. Let's get these girls unloaded. Molly raised an eyebrow but started handing out boxes. Conrad, I cried out. Please don't lift that. The furniture is too heavy for you. I'll be fine, he assured me, grabbing the end of a dresser as Bertie took the other side. The two of them heaved, struggled, and shoved it toward the back of the truck. This dresser isn't heavy at all. Grabbing the dresser from him, I helped to ease it toward the opening. Don't fall. You worry too much, grunted Conrad, his little muscle straining. You need to get married and have some children to mother. By the third one, the kids will knock the worry right out of you. Molly laughed. It's true. At least that's what my mother always said insisted Conrad as he backed up into thin air and nearly fell out of the end of the truck. I grabbed him, pulling him back as he kept a death grip on the dresser. Oh, my word! B quickly came to the back of the U-Haul. Is he okay? Conrad, are you okay? I'm fine, growled Conrad. Just dandy. That's it. 
I pointed to the ground. You and Bertie join the box and small items line. Molly and I will take care of the furniture. But it's not right to let a couple of girls move heavy furniture, protested Bertie. It's not right to let old fools move heavy furniture either, insisted B, hands on her ample hips. Now both of you start handing down those lamps and other little things. Let the girls handle it. They are younger than all of us. Conrad and Bertie grumbled, but set to handing boxes and smaller items out of the truck. Molly and I struggled with two sets of bedroom furniture, her living room set, and the kitchen set. Finally, everything was in the storage room. Molly would have to grab whatever she needed from the storage room later. I handed her a key. We had better get the truck back, a tired Molly said. Can anyone give us a lift back from town? Thelma can do it, decided B. She's at her jewelry crafting night at the Crafty Corner. She teaches a class at Ava's shop and should be done shortly. I'll give her a call so she will expect you. Thank you, B, I said. Thank you, everyone, for your help. We do appreciate it. Yes, thank you, echoed Molly to the group. As the crowd dispersed, we climbed back into the U-Haul. You can sleep with me overnight, and then we can give Ethel's trailer a good cleaning tomorrow and get you moved in, I offered. Sounds like a plan, agreed Molly as she grinded gears. Tell me why you didn't sell this dump. I looked at the office as we passed it. In the three weeks since I had inherited the Happy Camper Resort, I had fixed the missing C on the sign, painted the office, and replaced the glass in the window. I had also put my demolition skills to the test, pulling up the wooden boardwalk around the building, leaving it looking somehow worse than it had before. Tomorrow, Agatha Symes' grandson, Matthew, was going to start work on a new boardwalk around the building. It also needed a new roof. So did the clubhouse both of which were going to be very expensive, putting a large dent in the money which Ethel had left me. I'm not selling because I couldn't clear the mortgage, the line of credit, my credit cards, or what I owe Mike's garage for repairing Grandma's vehicle, I moaned. The only way I get to use the money left to me by Ethel is to use it to repair the campground. The Happy Camper Resort is going to take every last dollar and still need more to properly upgrade the place. I need to figure out how to make more money until I can get the Happy Camper Resort turning a profit. Any good paying jobs in the area? wondered Molly. You could work somewhere for a while. There are lots of jobs right now. It's the beginning of the tourist season. We've got tons of people coming through town right now, which is why I need to do as many repairs as I can to get this place in order so I can get more campers in, I pointed out. I don't have time to work. I need to be here to oversee repairs. Just last week alone, I spent four days pulling up grass and reeds out of the beach area so it looks more inviting and usable. I shuddered a little. The beach was a necessary selling point of the campground. It was also where I had found Ethel's body a few weeks ago, not something I wanted to remember. The good news is the dock appeared to be sound, even if it needed sanding and staining. It was next on my to-do list of things that I could tackle on my own. Then there was the leaning kayak shack. Something needed to be done about the little building as well. I had a never-ending list of repairs. What about opening a bakery? I thought being a baker was your dream, questioned Molly, taking the turn and entering the small town of Oaks Crossing. It was the nearest town to the campground, a mere five-minute drive. The place was quaint with a ton of small shops, situated beside the lake. It is my dream, I agreed. I'm thinking I might have to modify it a little. Maybe once everything is up to date at the campground, I can hold events and do catering. Let me help you, offered Molly. If we both work hard at it this summer, I bet by fall we can have a catering business going. Are you sure? I hadn't thought Molly would want to try catering. Why not? I don't have anything else to do, grinned Molly. It will be an adventure. Okay, I smiled back. I had missed my roommate. She was also my friend. Let's do it. Pulling into the Oaks Crossing car dealership, which also rented U-Hauls and other vehicles when necessary, Molly parked the truck. It didn't take us very long to leave the keys with them. So, where's this crafty corner place? asked Molly as we started walking. The old-style street lamps turned on as we passed shops with pretty window displays. The town had a comfortable, small-town feel. I pointed past Tawny's Tea House. Up there. The owner is Ava. She's a nice person. Tawny's Tea House. Luscious logs. Perfect pet store, snorted Molly. This place has a thing for names starting with the same letter. I think it's kind of cute, I shrugged, opening the door of the craft store I entered. Hi, Ivy, called out Ava as she slid a tote of craft supplies onto a shelf. 
It didn't help that Ava wore leggings, deck shoes, and a large, lightly knitted top which dwarfed her small frame, making her look even smaller and incapable of lifting the large item. Oh, good. You're right on time. Class just finished a few minutes ago and we were cleaning up, a happy Thelma told me. Now, who is this young lady with you? Ava, Thelma, this is Molly. Molly was my roommate in the city and she's a good friend of mine, I explained. She's going to be staying at the Happy Camper Resort for a little while. That's nice, exclaimed Thelma. I like your hair. Whatever made you think of going blue? I need a change, shrugged Molly. She looked around the store. Wow, you have some really nice stuff here. Thank you, beamed Ava, trying and failing to push her pixie cut behind her ears. I love this store. It originally belonged to my aunt, and I enjoy helping people find their artsy side. I'll just have to come back with my wallet sometime, mused Molly as she fingered a seashell necklace. If you'd like, you're more than welcome to take one of my business cards with you, offered Ava as she set a folding chair against the wall. They have the store hours. Perfect, said Molly as she wandered over to the till to take one. Thanks. Oh, Ivy, honey, Thelma grabbed a tote with perfectly manicured hands. Would you mind grabbing my other tote there? We'll get the media all loaded and then we can go. Sure, I took the second tote. Nice seeing you, Ava. Drop by sometime, she offered, even just for a chat. I will, I promised. Molly and I followed Thelma to her cream-colored 1963 Mercury Meteor. Cool wheels, admired Molly as she looked at the vintage vehicle. Why, thank you, preened Thelma as we stashed the totes in the large trunk. Ivy, I've been meaning to give this to you. I found this fly the other day at the food mart. The town council is looking for people to take over Jane Vanderwell's booth at the farmer's market. She's decided to retire. She had a booth designated for baked goods. You love to bake, and the market is only on Saturdays, which means you can still run the campground. I looked at the flyer. How much do you think it would cost to rent a booth there? A pretty penny, confided Thelma. She had a booth selling jewelry at the farmer's market. Thelma sported her own creations, which were very classy and befitted her sense of style. Yet with the tourists, we all make our money back. Say you will think about it. You'll have to let the council know pretty quickly. I don't want anyone else to get the booth. We could start our catering business there, inserted Molly with enthusiasm. All we need is to try and get people to try your baking, and they will be addicted. Then the orders will start pouring in. I suppose I could think about it, I murmured. It did make sense. Having the booth would be sort of advertising, and I could make sales right away. Think about it, exclaimed Molly in derision. Stop thinking and do. You're going to take the booth. First thing tomorrow, we're coming back into town. You can tell the council that Booth is ours. We're going to make a successful catering business. It's what you want. You're right, I nodded with a grin. It is what I want. I'm starting a baking business. This is so exciting, squealed Thelma in delight. I can't talk to the council tomorrow, I sobered. Matthew Symes is coming to start work on the boardwalk, and I've got a roofing company giving me a quote on the roofs. Something needs to be done before even more damage occurs from the rain. The roofs can wait, tutted Thelma. There is a bigger hole than Conrad in the clubhouse roof, I mentioned dryly. I'm sure someone from the campground can take care of getting the quote, an impatient Molly said. All they need to do is show off the roofs and get some paperwork from the company, right? You can tell the roofers later if they've got the job. I'll do it, offered Thelma. When are they coming? At seven in the morning, I warned. He wants to inspect it thoroughly since the roofs have been leaking so long. He warned it could be a long inspection because he suspects there's a lot of damage from all the leaking. Oh dear, Thelma was not impressed at the early hour, but rallied. I'll be ready at seven. I'll welcome the man with directions to the roof and a coffee in my hand. Then you and I go to the council to talk about the baked goods booth, smiled Molly as we got into Thelma's car. We can tell them what an amazing baker you are and how I've got loads of waitressing and catering experience. They'd be fools not to give us the booth. Okay, let's do it. I agreed to their plan. We might even get back to the campground before the roofing guy was done his inspection. I was hoping to meet him. He was the third guy I would let up on the roofs, and I needed to impress upon him he was competing for my business so I could get a cheap quote. The other two quotes were going to eat the majority of Ethel's money. However, I couldn't see a way around it. Having a hole in the clubhouse was not good for future campground events. Events which would hopefully see my income rise through rentals and catering. Income I desperately needed. Molly gave me a hug from the back seat, wrapping her arms around me and the passenger seat as best as she could. This is going to be so much fun.
Magic Brownies. Book two of the cozy mystery series Camping Girl. Written by Josephine Beintema. Narrated by Josephine Beintema. Chapter two. The Competition. The Oaks Crossing Town Hall didn't open until nine in the morning, so I did end up meeting the roofer, Don Miller, with Thelma. Don asked how long the roofs had been leaking. When he heard the answer, he shook his head, scowling. We trailed Don as he looked at the hole in the roof from the ground, then from the inside of the clubhouse. He clicked his tongue with an unhappy look before getting a ladder from his truck. I think the quote is going to be expensive, a worried Thelma whispered to me. I already knew it was going to be expensive. The first two quotes had been sticker shock when I had seen them. Now I was resigned to just getting the job done so I could get the pool seen to. As for my own leaking trailer, I was going to have to take care of it myself. I didn't have the money to waste having someone else do the job for me, not when I needed to make the place habitable enough to get new campers in. Don climbed the ladder and walked along the roof. He wrote a couple of things down on a notepad. You have insurance? Yes, I answered. Getting an insurance policy on the campground was one of the first things I had done. I could hardly believe Grandma had let it lapse. If someone had gotten hurt, she would have been liable. Then why didn't you get this fixed at the time the tree fell? Don eyed the offending half of the tree which remained standing, which was dead and large. It was still too close to the building. The tree needs to come down before it does more damage. I have someone coming, I mentioned. Good, grunted Don. What about the insurance? They paying for this? No, insurance isn't covering this, I told him. How bad do you think it is? The roof is spongy by the hole. A spongy roof means water has gotten in. You should have at least tarped it, complained Dom. Looks like this section needs to be replaced. The rest of the roof will be okay for a while. It is better than the other quotes, muttered Thelma to me. It was true. The other two roofing companies wanted to replace both roofs entirely. If I could get away with a patch job on this one, it would save me a lot of money. We watched Don make his way down the ladder. He picked it up, putting it back on the roof of his van. Where is the other building you wanted me to look at? The office, I answered. You had to drive past it to come in. Thelma and I elected to walk while Don drove to the office with his work van. Don has a reputation for good work, remarked Thelma. He grew up in Oaks Crossing. That's good. I filed the information away in my brain. I wanted someone who I could trust who would do a good job. Matthew is starting at the boardwalk today at the office. I've put some iced tea in the mini fridge there. He can have some if he would like. Matthew's a good boy, nodded Thelma. He will do a fine job. It helps that he's willing to give me a discount, I noted. Agatha set it all up since he is her grandson. I haven't even met him yet. Well, now is your chance, said Thelma as we approached the office. Someone was whistling a jaunty little tune as they unloaded a pile of lumber from a pickup truck onto the grass. He wore work boots, jeans, and a gray tee. His black hair was closely trimmed and he was deeply tanned from his time outdoors. Hello, Thelma. Matthew, gushed Thelma warmly as she accepted a hug. You are looking good. Tell me, how's your mother doing? She's currently traveling Brazil, responded Matthew with a smile. Mom sent me pictures yesterday. I guess she went on some sort of donkey ride up a mountain. She's going to put it in the next travel book. That sounds like fun, grinned Thelma. This here is Ivy Thurman. She's Jeannie's granddaughter and inherited the Happy Camper Resort. Nice to meet you, greeted Matthew. I shook his hand, noting the strong grip and friendly face. He was quite cute. It's good to meet you. I appreciate you doing the job for us. I'm glad I could help. Gee, my Agatha thinks you're great. When she called me up about the work, I couldn't refuse, grinned Matthew. Hey, Conrad. Matthew, greeted Conrad in return. The crossword from the local paper under his arm. Conrad had taken over running the office at some point, and I continued to let him do it. Fine weather today. Perfect for getting some work done, agreed Matthew. I'll have you a new boardwalk soon. Sounds good, grunted Conrad as he juggled the keys to the office, unlocking the door. Don came down his ladder to join us. Needs a new roof. Silver roof, too. I'll have to see if there's any damage to the trusses from the inside. The office is unlocked now, I gestured to the door, and I think the attic has an access door in the ceiling. 
I'll check, answered Don as he pulled his ladder away from the side of the building. This one's going to be costly. My heart sank. I had known it, but had hoped he might have a different verdict than the other two quotes that I had gotten. You better grab Molly and get going, mentioned Thelma as she gave me a pat on the shoulder. Town Hall should be open soon. I'll look after everything here. Thank you, Thelma, I replied. I'll see you later, Matthew. Looking forward to it. He gave me a wave and then set about to unload more lumber. Thelma went inside the office and I walked back to my camper to find Molly still in bed. Molly! I grabbed the covers, whisking them off her. Let's go! A complaining grumble happened as Molly blew a strand of blue hair out of her face. Too early! It's nearly nine, I protested. Get up, get dressed, get yourself fed. I'm taking Cookie and Cupcake for a short walk while I call the taxi. If you aren't ready to go by the time the cab gets here, I'm going alone. Drill, Sergeant, groused Molly. Reluctantly, she pulled herself out of bed and headed for the washroom. Come on, doggies. I clipped on Cookie and Cupcake's leashes, leading them out to have a quick walk while I called the taxi. Afterward, I dropped off the dogs to Herb, who was willing to dog sit this morning and return for some baked goods. Morning, Herb. There are the little rascals, crooned Herb as he gave Cupcake and Cookie a rub. Taking the leashes, Herb straightened up. Morning, Ivy. The dogs and I are going fishing. I'll drop them back off at their trailer around noon if that works for you. That would be perfect, I smiled. I've got some macaroons if you would like them. Great! I love a good macaroon, grinned Herb. He clicked his tongue and set off down the trail. Come on, little buddies. I've got everything at the fishing hole already. We are going to have a peaceful morning. With a smile and a wave, I headed back to my trailer to find Molly drinking coffee in one of the Muskoka chairs on my small plot of land. I settled into the other chair. I could get used to this, Molly tipped back her pale face in the morning sun. It's relaxing to live out here, like a permanent vacay. It was relaxing. I had loved coming here for the summers when I was a child. After living in the city for years, I found I preferred the quiet of the campground, where I could enjoy nature and had a small community of people here. I loved the happy camper resort. The taxi pulled up. We both slid into the back seat. I leaned forward. Mechanic Mike's garage, please. Sure thing, the taxi driver told me. I thought we were going straight to the town hall, remarked Molly as we both put on our seatbelts. I've got enough saved to pay for the repairs on Grandma's car, I replied. I've already had it transferred into my name and gotten insurance. I thought we could pick it up on the way. Mike gave me until the 15th before he was going to start charging storage, and I want to have the car out before I incur even more costs. The 15th is tomorrow, responded Molly with surprise. You're cutting it a little close. I know, I sighed. However, I also had to make sure I had enough money to pay Matthew. I'm juggling a lot of bills. Then, when we get the booth, we'll start making some money, nodded Molly. It will help. I truly hoped so. I needed to expand revenue to stay afloat. A few short minutes later, we had signed paperwork, paid the bill, and Mike had released my grandmother's orange Volkswagen Beetle. Smiling, I palmed the keys as Molly and I went to find the Beetle in the parking lot. Getting in, I happily put my purse in the back seat and did up my seatbelt. Putting the key in the ignition, I started up the bug. It was a manual. Not that I haven't driven manual before, but I wasn't exceptionally good at it. Better than Molly, but still not my favorite type of car. Putting my foot down to depress the clutch, I was surprised to find the space was empty. In fact, there was no clutch at all. What? I muttered, looking down at my feet in confusion. What's wrong? asked Molly in concern at my odd behavior. The car is a manual, but there's no clutch. I pointed to where the missing pedal should have been. How do you drive a manual transmission without a clutch? Beats me, shrugged Molly. I shut off the car. I am going to ask Mike. A few minutes later, a laughing Mike told me it was a three-speed semi-automatic, which meant I didn't need a clutch. All I had to do was lay off the gas when switching gears. He also cautioned it only had a 10-gallon gas tank, so I was going to be filling it up often. Thank you, Mike, I told him as I left the shop. Vintage cars were full of surprises. Getting back into the car, I was more confident, and we started down the road. What year is it? wondered Molly as she looked over the vehicle. Late 60s or early 70s? I shrugged. I don't remember. As long as it drives, that's what's important to me. 
pulling up in front of the town hall, I easily squeezed into a parking spot. Parking was going to be a breeze with this car. Soon enough, we were standing in a small lineup, waiting to talk to someone about the baking booth at the farmer's market. About ten minutes later, we were first in line. Next, a bored woman asked. Hi, I greeted her. My name is Ivy Thurman, and I saw this flyer for a baking booth at the farmer's market. I would like to apply for the booth. Ivy Thurman, who owns the Happy Camper Resort, she asked. Yes, I answered in agreement. She rolled her chair over to the desk behind her, grabbing a thick envelope. Pushing on the desk, she rolled back to me. I was going to mail this, but since you're here, you can take it with you. The applications for the farmer's market are to your left. Because we have so much interest in the booth, we have organized a bake-off. A what? questioned Molly as I dug through the thick envelope I had been given. A bake-off. The bored woman responded, You bring in a tray of goodies you baked, all in sample size. The mayor and town councillors are going to do a taste test. Whoever's baking they like the most will get the booth. All the details are on this paper. However, you need to fill out the form. Paperwork is due by lunch today, and the bake-off is tomorrow. Tomorrow? I looked up from the business license renewal permits and other paperwork she had handed me. It all looked awfully expensive. Yep. Bring in the goods at nine when we open. Tape your name to the bottom of the tray so no one will see it until the very end. We are having a blind taste test, she explained. Then we had better get baking, murmured Molly. Um, are all of these necessary? I pointed at the envelope full of forms and fees. If you want the Happy Camper Resort to continue as a business of Oaks Crossing, then yes, they are necessary. She gave me an unenthusiastic forced smile. You have until the end of the month to get those back to me. Thanks, I muttered. Next, she looked at the people behind us. Molly and I moved to a small waiting area to look over the application for the food booth. Taking out a pen from my purse, we filled in the necessary details. They want a deposit, noted Molly. I hope the deposit is refundable, I sighed, writing out a check. When did you become such a cheap person? Molly wrinkled her nose at me. I laughed. When the town council handed me about $5,000 worth of paperwork. Wow, a shocked Molly grabbed the envelope, sifting through the papers. It's expensive to run a business, I admitted. More expensive every time I turn around. I need to start making revenue if I'm going to keep the Happy Camper Resort afloat. Don't worry, Molly shoved the papers back in the envelope. I'm here to help, and we are going to make this happen. Let's just submit this first, then deal with the next steps. I stood up with the paperwork and got in line. Soon enough, we were back to the board clerk who called us over. Here it is, all filled out for the booth at the farmer's market, I told her. Is the deposit refundable if we don't win in the tasting contest? Yes, she put the paperwork in a file. We have over 50 entries. 50 entries? For a baking booth? I exclaimed. Doesn't it seem a little excessive? She shrugged. Apparently, some big food critic from the baking channel on television is going to visit our town next week to sample local cuisine. It's rumored she's going to the farmer's market as well. So people are lining up in a bid to get famous. And they're all going to fail, predicted a beefy voice from behind me. Molly and I turned to see a short man in a chef jacket which stretched over his doughy frame. How do you figure? asked Molly in a slightly edgy tone. I'm the owner of the Tasty Treats Bakery, he boasted. I'm going to win, wow Fergie, and win the cookbook deal with her. Fergie from Fergie's Fiery Kitchen? I asked in surprise. I heard she was doing a tour of America looking for a great baker to co-author a cookbook. It's going to be me co-authoring the book, he insisted. Bart Baker of the Tasty Treats Bakery. Baker? snorted Molly. You're a baker and your name is Baker? It was destiny, he stated as he shoved past us to give his application to the clerk. Ouch! Molly rubbed a rib where he had poked her with an elbow. We can outbake him, I told Molly. Let's get over to the food mart and pick up some ingredients. We spent a good hour at the food mart, debating the merits of what to bake. Finally, coming up with a game plan, 
Molly and I paid for our purchases and loaded up the car. Driving back, I found I was getting the hang of switching gears. Stopping at the office building, I switched off the car and admired the progress Matthew had made. Who is he? wondered Molly with interest. He is one sweet-looking piece of toffee. It didn't take her long to get over her breakups, I reflected with amusement. Molly had a habit of describing people as foods. Sometimes it can be quite amusing. We used to make a game of it when waitressing on the same shift. She might tell me to look at the hot fudge sundae at table three, while I would tell her to get a load of Rocky Road ice cream at the bar. His name is Matthew Symes. He's Agatha's grandson and a carpenter. I'll have to find something in Ethel's trailer for him to fix, mused Molly suggestively. Ethel's trailer, I moaned. We aren't going to have time to clean it up today if we are going to get all this baking done and ready for tomorrow. Molly shrugged. You'll just have to put up with me for another night. I love you to pieces, Molly, but you kick, I told her. Molly ignored my comment, focusing on Matthew. He's cute, not as cute as the hot toddy of a detective. I huffed out a breath of exasperation. Detective Armand is not cute or a hot toddy. He might be called wickedly handsome, but definitely not cute, I admitted to myself. The detective had given me a hard time when I first come to the Happy Camper Resort. To be fair, he thought I was a suspect of my grandmother and Ethel's deaths. Funnily enough, it was Tawny Tilbury's prize-winning purebred Persian Winifred who had helped solve the crime. After I found the missing cat, we had found photos on her cat cam collar, which had pointed right to the murderer. You are right, conceded Molly with a grin. The good detective is steamy, like a buttered rum latte. More like iced coffee. I shook my head and got out of the vehicle to inspect the boardwalk, which was taking shape. Matthew had done good work. It looked solid. After I've got it all done, I'll sand down what needs sanding. Then you can put a couple of coats of stain on it to keep the weather from rotting the wood, he advised, setting a cordless drill down. It looks good, I complimented him, ignoring the muscles bulging under his shirt as he wiped his brow with a handkerchief. Matthew smiled. As long as you're happy, then I'm happy. Hey, cool air. I'm Molly. Molly shoved her hand practically under his nose with a smile. Matthew, he shook her hand in greeting. Pleased to meet you. I knew I had to get Molly out of there fast. Otherwise, she would be flirting with Matthew all afternoon rather than helping me get ready for the taste test. We had better get going. Things to do. I grabbed Molly by the arm, dragging her back to the car. Bye, she waved at him with a flirty smile. After a short drive to the clubhouse, we unloaded the groceries into the building's kitchen. My trailer only had a small work surface, two burners, plus the tiniest oven I had ever seen, and I had one of those easy-bake ovens as a kid. We would have to use the clean but outdated appliances in the campground kitchen. Thankfully, it all worked, and since I had paid the majority of the gas bill last week, the gas company was no longer threatening to cut us off. We set to work baking. Getting back into the swing of maximizing our baking effort, I paired up recipes which required the same amount of baking time. I wanted the judges to have the best of my recipes, and so we might have gone a little wild at the food mart when we went grocery shopping. Looking at one of my best recipes, which everyone who had ever tried it loved, I realized we were missing an ingredient. Fresh raspberries, I groaned. Huh? Molly looked up from her mixing bowl and whisk. What's the matter? I'm missing fresh raspberries, I told her. Quickly, I grabbed out my phone, calling Grubbs Farm Fresh Food. Jackson Grubbs had given me his business card when I first came to Oaks Crossing, and he'd also had a booth at the farmer's market. Jackson was a very nice guy who sold fruit, vegetables, and honey that he produced directly on his small farm just outside of town. A short conversation later, and I had Jackson offering to deliver me some produce and honey I could use in my baking, including the much-needed fresh raspberries which had just come into season. Great, I sighed in relief and got back to work. The kitchen smelled heavenly with baking aromas. An hour later, and a cheerful Jackson delivered the required fresh produce and honey. Molly eyed him as I introduced her to the tall, dark-haired, smiling Jackson. Paying Jackson and giving him a sample of baking we had done so far, I managed to shoo him out before Molly could get too distracted. What is with all the guys around? Cutie Carpenter Matthew, Detective Hottie Armand, and now I need some honey Jackson. I blame the fresh country air, I said crisply. Get back to work. There is no time to be mooning over the boys. Molly sighed in a dramatic fashion, but went back to measuring ingredients. By the end of the night, we had created a perfect sampling of mouth-watering treats. 
putting them on a tray with our name taped underneath as directed by the instructions we had been given, I plastic wrapped the goodies into place. I put the large tray into the fridge to keep them cool overnight. There, I smiled in satisfaction. I think we have outdone ourselves. Molly took an Anaimo bar, biting into the chocolate and cream with relish, half closing her eyes as she enjoyed the treat. If the council doesn't choose us, they have something wrong with their taste buds. Let's wrap all this up and put it away. I started with the plastic wrap. We had cleaned as we baked, so the kitchen wasn't a total disaster. The fridge had more than enough room for all the baking we had done. I suppose I'll give some of it away to the campers. As long as you keep some for me. Molly grabbed a second Nanaimo bar and helped to put the baked goods away. In less than an hour, we had the kitchen clean, the food in the fridge, and had made it back to my trailer. Alarm set for the early morning, I gave the doggies a walk before bed. Exhausted, I wondered if Don the roofer had given Thelma a quote or not. I would have to check with her tomorrow, I thought drowsily as I crawled into bed. Next morning, I was greeted by sunlight, Molly kicking me, and two little wet noses telling me it was time for our morning walk. Sighing, I told Molly to get up. Taking cupcake and cookie for a quick walk, I grabbed a tray of sample baked treats from the clubhouse before going back to my trailer. I set them on the back seat of the car, ignoring two sets of large brown doggy eyes which stared at the food while pink tongues licked their lips. It's not for you, I told them. Maybe I could bake them up some organic dog treats sometime, I reflected. However, extra baking would not be today. Molly and I grabbed a quick toast for breakfast before heading to the town hall. There was a lineup of people dropping off trays of baked goods. Wow, it is a lot of competition, observed Molly. This is crazy, I commented as the line moved slowly forward. Once again, we were greeted by the board clerk who took our tray, noting it was labeled on the bottom with our name and application number. She set it in a boardroom where I could see a lot of other trays stacked full of goodies. Do you need anything more from us? I asked nervously when she returned. Nope. She dismissed us, turning the person after us in line. Next! Molly and I were just about to leave when we heard a commotion. Bart Baker pushed his girth forward through the crowd, carrying a tray. He pushed it into the hands of the clerk. Here's the best tray of baking. You might as well all go home now. I'm Bart Baker of the Tasty Treats Bakery, and I'm winning this competition. Molly and I looked at each other in disgust. Magic Brownies Book 2 of the Cozy Mystery Series Camping Girl Written by Josephine Bintema Narrated by Josephine Bintema Chapter 3 First Reservation There were grumblings from everyone about Bart cutting the line, but the clerk didn't seem to care. She just put his baking with the rest. Bart said something about having to get back to work and elbowed his way out of the building again. What a jerk, muttered Molly. I agreed, but didn't voice my displeasure. Let's go. I need to talk to Thelma and find out if Don left a quote. We made our way through the crowd and back to the Beetle. I reflected that it was nice to have a car of my own finally. It made it a lot easier for getting around and not having to pay for taxis or borrowing a vehicle all the time. Or taking the bus. I had never enjoyed traveling by bus. I preferred to go directly to my destination in as straight of a route as possible. Back at the campground, I pulled up to Thelma's trailer. Before I could knock on her door, Thelma swung it open. Good morning, she trilled happily, coffee cup in hand and a silk robe wrapped around her thin frame. Her short hair looked a little more red, and I wondered if she had gotten it touched up. I see you got your grandma's car from Mechanic Max Garage. I did, I nodded. Once I got used to the shifting, it has been easy to drive. They are cute little cars, smiled Thelma. Us vintage girls need to stick together. Thelma, I asked, changing the subject. Did Don Miller give you a quote for the roof yesterday? He did. She motioned for us to come into the trailer. Now where did I put the paper? Molly and I entered Thelma's camper. It was full of scarves, robes, clothes, and her crafting materials for the jewelry she made and sold at the farmer's market. Normally it was tidier than this, and I noticed the jewelry seemed to have been strewn everywhere. You're making a lot of jewelry, I realized as I saw a curtain rod full of bracelets stretched between a pair of cupboards. I spotted another one with all necklaces. I estimated there was probably a couple hundred per rod. 
I heard from Blakely Rivers, who does the glass booth, that Fergie from Fergie's Fiery Kitchen is going to be at the farmer's market this Saturday, an excited Thelma informed us. We were already having a charity weekend where the firefighters, police, and emergency responders were going to be doing games to raise funds for a toy drive. Plus, all sorts of extra activities have been planned as sort of a kickoff to the main tourist season. This is the weekend most people start flocking to the area. If Fergie's going to be there, then everyone from miles will come to the market. I'm expecting triple or more sales than normal. This means I have to have a lot more jewelry ready for buyers. It promises to be a busy Saturday. I thought it was next week. I looked at Molly in alarm. We had some baking done, which we could freeze, but it wouldn't be nearly enough for Saturday if Thelma was right about the amount of people coming to the Oaks Crossing Farmer's Market. Yet I didn't dare bake any more treats just in case we didn't get the booth. When did they say they were supposed to hear back about the booth? Molly dug in her bag, looking for the flyer. Did you get the booth? wondered Thelma. She handed me a paper. Here's the quote. Don said he could reduce it by a further ten percent if you hire his nephew to take care of the electricity upgrades you were thinking of doing for the vacant lots. I may have mentioned the electrical needs doing to Don. I looked at the figures on the page. They were more reasonable than the other two roofing companies, since he only wanted to do a section of the clubhouse rather than replace the entire roof. As it was, the job was still going to take an enormous chunk of money from Ethel's bequest. His nephew is an electrician? Thelma nodded. Even Miller. He's young, but he went to school and apprentice, so I would think he should know what he's doing. Great. I did the math, liking the 10% decrease. I guess the Millers have a job. He will need to tell Don quick, advised Thelma. He said he has another job starting in two weeks, and afterward he's booked solid for the summer. If you want the roofing done, now is the time. I'll call him today, I decided. Molly found the flyer. It says the taste testing is today. The council is to cast a deciding vote today, and we'll publish the results by five o'clock on the bulletin in the town square. Today is Thursday, I huffed. It doesn't give the winner much time to prepare. I'm sure you can ask some of the campers to help, mentioned Thelma with concern, like we did for your grandmother and Ethel's memorial. Unfortunately, I need to get my jewelry finished, so I'm unavailable, but maybe Agatha, B, or Mabel could help. I would have to ask. I nodded in agreement. We won't know until five, so I guess I should get some of the other things done. I have all this paperwork from town now, and I should check up on Matthew again. Maybe we should go to town earlier and get the stain for the boardwalk and the dock from the hardware store. How about I check on sweet Toffee Matthew and you can fill out all the boring paperwork, chirped Molly sweetly. He will never get any work done if you are around, I warned. I knew Molly would just stay under Matthew's nose all day if she could. I'm not paying him to flirt with you. Oh, Pooh, let the girl have a little fun, cheered Thelma. They're both young and he is handsome. Fine, I capitulated, feeling a little annoyed. Check up on Matthew and see if he needs a cold drink. Otherwise, let him work. Yes, boss, Molly saluted smartly with a wicked smile as she left the trailer. You know, if you took to flirting, you might erase those worry lines growing between your eyebrows, remarked Thelma casually. I'll lose the worry lines when I'm solvent, I sighed, looking at Don's quote again. Thank you, Thelma, for talking to Don for me. It wasn't hard, smiled Thelma in satisfaction. I talked him into the ten percent reduction, and if we hired Evan, all I had to do was stroke his vanity a little. Men are all alike. I tell you, Ivy, do a little flirting, and the prices will come down. Bye, Thelma. I shook my head as I left the trailer. Somehow, I didn't believe her method would work for me. I just wasn't that type of person. The last time I had tried to flutter my eyelashes at someone, they asked if I had something in my eye and proceeded to try to have me flush it with water. I ended up embarrassed, and my mascara making me look like a raccoon. Hours later, I had contracted Don and Evan, lining them up to get the work done. I would pay part of the money up front, and the rest when the jobs were complete to my satisfaction. I also finished the last of the paperwork for the town and wrote a check for the obscene amount of money it took to run a business here. Writing up the numbers in my checkbook, I was down a deep sum. I had yet to catch up on the water and electric. Also pressing was the updating of the electrical outlets for the lots. 
making sure the water lines worked, whiny golf carts to service, lighting in the campground, and the swampy pool to fix. It was just the start. Ethel's money was going to be gone well before this part of the list was done. I sighed. Hopefully Molly was right and I could make a go of this catering business. I certainly needed the money. There was a chirping from my phone. Pulling it out, I answered. Happy Camper Resort, Ivy speaking. Hi. I was wondering if you had any spaces open for the weekend. I would like an area for tent camping for some friends and I, a voice on the line asked. Yes, I said in surprise. This was the first customer to call for the season. I could definitely work with tent campers. They wouldn't want a site which had hydro. All I needed to do was make certain the sites they had used had the grass freshly mowed. Camp tenters should be a breeze. Absolutely, I have space at the Happy Camper Resort. Great. Relief was evident in his voice. Everyone else is booked up for the weekend and my friends are coming. We thought it would be fun to go camping. I took down his details and quoted him a price. He readily agreed to the terms of the deal. Smiling, I hung up my phone at the end of the call. My first reservation. I was so pleased, I did a little happy dance. Sure, it wouldn't put a dent in the money problems I had, but it was a start. Taking Cookie and Cupcake for a walk, I went to check on Matthew's progress. Sure enough, I found him leaning on the corner of the pickup, talking to Molly, who laughed at something he said. Great, she was flirting away the working hours. Hey, Molly, there you are. I put on a smile as I approached. It's almost time to get ready to go to town to get a few items. I'm sure you could go without me, hinted Molly as she flipped her long blue hair back. Not really. I need you there, I insisted politely. I should get to back to work, otherwise I won't get done, said Matthew sheepishly. It's been nice talking, Molly. Same, flirted Molly before she followed me with a pout. Was that necessary? If I would like to get the project done, it is necessary, I returned. Besides, it's almost time to go to town. I thought you would be excited to see if we got the booth or not. I do want the booth, Molly perked up. We are going to be fantastic. Who knows? Maybe we will even meet Fergie and get a cookbook deal. One step at a time, the pragmatic in me replied. Dropping the Bosties off at Bee's camper with a couple of treats, we headed out in the Beetle to Oaks Crossing. The handy hardware store was where everyone got supplies for DIY projects. It didn't take long to pick up a couple cans of stain, some brushes, and a mixing stick. I paid for the purchases before we went to the town hall. There was a crowd of people waiting. Finding parking was awful, since everyone was here. It took me two tries down the street before I could squeeze the bug in. We ended up walking a block to get back to where the waiting crowd was. "'Isn't this exciting?' asked Ava when she found Molly and I in the sea of people. "'Hi, Ava,' I greeted her with a little confusion. "'I thought you already had a booth at the farmer's market.' "'Oh, I do,' she nodded. "'However, I wanted to see who won the contest. "'A lot of people are showing up out of curiosity.' I hear the Oaks Crossing Weekly newspaper is going to do an article on it. Really? questioned Molly with interest. I like the idea of free advertising. Me too, I agreed, suddenly feeling nervous. The likelihood of us winning out of the fifty or more entrants was slim, but I still felt like we had a chance. Move over! Bart Baker elbowed his way between us, heading for the front of the crowd. Ow! exclaimed Ava as he passed by. How rude! Are you okay? I asked in concern. Bart stepped on my foot, she grimaced. He's not the lightest person. He's a jerk, muttered Molly, repeating her early assessment of Bart's character. That marshmallow thinks he's going to win this thing. I hope he doesn't, responded Ava. He's not the nicest individual. Molly gave me a look of disbelief before whispering in my ear. Isn't she just a little too wholesome? I gave Molly a look of warning. I liked Ava, and I hoped Molly would play nice around her. A murmur rippled through the crowd as Mayor Reuben Whipcomb descended the stairs holding a piece of paper. He made his way to the bulletin board, using a key to slide back the glass before tacking up the paper. Closing the glass and locking it, the mayor lifted his hands. Thank you all for coming. Your delectable desserts were wonderful. I congratulate our winner. After his small speech, Mayor Whitcomb left us to peruse the board to see if our name was on it. He could have just announced the winner, huffed Molly. 
We watched as disappointed people walked away, leaving space for others to come forward to read the announcement. Waiting our turn, we slowly crept forward with those remaining intent on learning who had won. Tawny Tilbury approached our little group. Ivy! Congratulations! Congratulations? I asked in surprise, not certain what she meant. You won! A beaming Tawny enveloped me in a hug, pulling me toward her plump elderly body. It couldn't have happened to a nicer person. I'm so glad. Thank you, I automatically replied, a little shocked. While I had been hopeful, I hadn't expected to win. I gave her a pat on the shoulder as she released me. Really? questioned Molly with glee. We won? We got the booth? Yay! Ava clapped her hands. This is going to be so much fun. Your booth is right nearby. I'll be able to get a snack from you every Saturday. A few more people congratulated me before Bart Baker elbowed his way into our group. His face was an alarming shade of red. You cheated! Excuse me? I couldn't believe what I was hearing. How can anyone possibly cheat a blind taste test? It would be impossible. I promise you, you're going to rue the day you ever won this contest. His jowl jiggled as he threatened. Cheater! Everyone knows my treats are the best. Rue the day? repeated a scoffing Molly. Who says that? Do you know how ridiculous you sound? You will regret it, he growled before abruptly stalking away. People quickly got out of Bart's way, not wanting to feel one of his elbows in their ribs. Oh dear, a concerned Tawny blinked behind her glasses. I think he means it. Magic Brownies Book Two of the Cozy Mystery Series Camping Girl Written by Josephine Beintema Narrated by Josephine Beintema Chapter Four An Unwelcome Visitor we managed to get to the announcement on the bulletin board to confirm Molly and I had indeed won. It was a great opportunity, one I didn't want to waste. We decided to head back to the campground and make a plan of what to bake. This way, we could make a proper run on the food mart. At the clubhouse, Molly and I took inventory of what we already had, freezing it for Saturday. It wouldn't be as good as fresh, but if we were coming to the end of the day and needed a few more items for sale, these were usable. After Saturday, whatever was left over, I would give away. Satisfied with our plan and list for groceries, I picked up Cupcake and Cookie from B. She was outside, enjoying a mystery in the fading light, while citronelle candles burned nearby to keep the bugs away. My dogs got up from the grass, little nubby tails wagging as they caught sight of me. What are you reading this time? I asked as I leaned down to give the boss these pats. B had a taste for murder mysteries. The Tragic Train Ride answered B, putting her book down. The book is a little boring at the beginning, but it is starting to pick up steam. I hear we're getting a new roof. I accepted Don Miller's quote, I nodded. He seemed the most reasonable. He's a good worker, replied B. He will do a decent job. I was glad. Everyone seemed to have confidence in Don, which made me feel better about all the money I was giving him to do the job. Did you have plans tomorrow? I could use a little help if you're not busy. Of course I'll help responded B with interest. There is nothing pressing for me to do tomorrow. What did you need? Help with baking. I explained winning the baking contest and the booth at the farmer's market. I'm going to need some assistance if Molly and I are to get everything baked in time. I'm more than happy to help, nodded B. I'm sure I can round up a few of the others and we can all lend a hand. That would be great, I said relieved. We will start around 11. I can grab groceries in the morning and whatever else we might need. B and I said a cheery good night to each other. Cookie and Cupcake happily trotted back to our camper where Molly was waiting. I really did need to get Ethel's trailer clean, I reflected. My shins would thank me once Molly was moved to her own trailer. However, right now, there didn't seem to be enough time to get the cleaning done. Getting ready for bed, I resolved to try to clean Ethel's trailer on Saturday after the farmer's market closed. We might not get it done, but perhaps we could get it started enough so Molly could move in. Promptly at eleven in the morning, B led a small group of elderly ladies into the clubhouse. Agatha, Mabel, Loretta, and B had all arrived to help out. I put them to work, and we set about to make as many baked goods as we could for tomorrow's farmer's market. "'You know what we should do?' suggested B as she whisked some egg whites. "'Your grandmother had a lot of great recipes. I know she had a little wooden box full of cue cards with her handwriting on them. 
A lot of people know her baking, and you should sell out with all those items, especially the brownies. The brownies, groaned Loretta with delight. I must have put on an extra twenty pounds because of those brownies. If you make some, I'll certainly buy them. I don't know what the secret ingredient was Jeanie used to put in them, but they were the best. She made good ginger snaps, too, reflected Agatha, melted right in my mouth. I love the little raspberry crumble bars, noted Mabel, sweet and zingy. Molly looked at me and I shrugged. I suppose we could see what is in the recipe box, I mentioned. It would be nice to have some more variety. The older ladies grinned in delight. Say you will make the brownies, insisted Loretta. Okay, I caved to their demands. Brownies were always a crowd pleaser anyways. We will make some brownies. Molly, could you go to the trailer and grab the recipe box? It's in the cupboard by the tea tin. I just need to get these turnovers out of the oven. Molly left to get the recipes while I waited impatiently for the right time to take the turnovers out. Listening to the ladies happily chat about their favorite recipes, I gently took out the trays from the oven, sliding it onto the stop of the stove. Taking a spatula, I transferred the hot golden turnovers onto a cooling rack. Good morning, ladies, came a man's deep voice. All the chatter stopped as we looked out of the kitchen door where a stranger stood, holding onto a small satchel. He wore a dark suit with a crisp white linen shirt. Can I help you? I asked in curiosity. I certainly hope so. He pulled out a clipboard from his satchel, setting it on the floor. Picking a pen out of his pocket, he looked at me. Are you Ivy Thurman? Yes, I answered. And you are? Tyrone Phillips, he supplied. I'm from the local health unit. We have had a complaint about your kitchen. A complaint? An indignant bee spoke in the shocked silence. How could anyone complain? We've hardly used this kitchen. Tyrone had a look around the out-of-date appliances and cracked linoleum on the floor. He didn't seem very impressed. Yet someone has complained. It appears you also don't have a commercial license for the kitchen. We do, I insisted. I remembered filling it out in the pile of paperwork the clerk at the town hall had given me. I just haven't renewed it. I was going to drop off the paperwork yesterday, but the town hall was closed after they made the announcement about the taste testing contest. In other words... You're preparing food for resale in an unlicensed kitchen, noted Tyrone as he wrote something on his clipboard full of papers. What is the complaint about? asked Molly as she came forward in a friendly manner, having returned from the trailer with the recipe box. We are doing everything to health unit codes, I assure you. Ivy and I have worked in the restaurant business for years. The complaint was food poisoning. He looked over the worn and scratched butcher's block the island we were working at. What do you use to disinfect? Food poisoning, harumped B with indignation. That's a lie and a half. Here's the disinfectant. I grabbed the bottle, showing him. It was industrial grade. So was the soap we were using. You can see for the dishes, we use a three-step method. Soapy water, rinse water, then disinfecting water before the items are set to drip dry on the tray. It's all stainless steel in the washing area. Molly cocked her head to the side, tapping a finger against her lips. Ivy and the girls only did one event, and it wasn't a paid job. It was for a memorial. What event did the complaint say it was? The individual stated they ordered a tray of baking from your company, reluctantly said Tyrone as he wrote down another note. Then it is a false complaint, grumbled Mabel. We haven't sold any baking. Did they provide a receipt? Ladies, I follow up all complaints, clarified Tyrone. Legitimate or not... You are more than welcome to look around, I said nervously. Everything is clean and working. I check the temperatures of the fridges and freezers myself on a daily basis. The kitchen might be old, but it is in perfect working order. Let me determine that. He began wandering through the kitchen, inspecting and marking off things on his list. You will need to dispose of whatever food you have already made. What? cried B. It's perfectly good food. It was made in an unlicensed kitchen, reiterated Tyrone. B scowled. I felt like scowling as well. This was a lot of work and money being thrown out. Let's just put it in the garbage right away. I chose not to argue with Tyrone. If he saw we were cooperating, maybe he would cut us a break somehow. Mr. Phillips, if I were to hand in all my forms today at Town Hall, 
would we be able to obtain our license in time to bake items for tomorrow? If we pass the inspection you're completing. If you pass the inspection and have Town Hall approve the license renewal today, then yes, confirmed Tyrone as he opened up the fridge, checking the temperature of the thermometer I had left inside. I'll need an hour to write my report. You might want to come up with a contingency plan for if your license renewal or inspection fails. I nodded, feeling a little desperate. I gathered the girls to the side. I'm going to town hall to get the paperwork filed. I need you ladies to clean out this kitchen, dump all food, mixes, batters, etc. Molly, you are in charge of looking after Mr. Phillips. If you and B could make up a list of items, B can go shopping for whatever we need to replace what we have lost, okay? While you're at the town hall... Ask about renting the community kitchen, or the Milton kitchen, advised Mabel, just in case we need a backup. Good idea, I agreed. Thank you, Mabel. With a last look at Tyrone, as he took out a white glove to see the cleanliness of the kitchen, I quickly jogged back to my camper. Grabbing the large envelope full of forms and the check I had already written out to cover the fees, I picked up my purse. Grabbing the keys, I got in the bug and floored it toward town. Finding a parking space proved to be easy enough. Thankfully, it wasn't as busy as it had been yesterday with the big announcement. With a few quick steps, I entered the town hall and came to find the board clerk busy at her desk. Excuse me, I started to say, but she held up a hand for silence before pointing to a sign on her desk. The sign stated she was on her break and would return in five minutes. You are already back at your desk. Can't you just talk to me? She pointed at the sign. Annoyed, I stayed standing in line. No way was I was going to give up the opportunity to be first in line. I checked my watch. It was nearing three in the afternoon. We were going to be baking all night just to have enough stock for tomorrow. Impatiently, I shifted from foot to foot as I waited for the clerk to be done her break. Finally, she put away the sign and asked, Next. Hi, I have some paperwork to be filed. I pulled the information out of the envelope and searched for the kitchen license renewal. This one needs to be taken care of right away. The clerk looked through the papers, setting them aside except for the kitchen license. Perusing the paper, she looked up at me. These take more than a day to go through. Is there any way to speed up the process? A bit of desperation crept into my voice. I'll see. She slowly rose from her chair. It might take a while, and I wouldn't hold out much hope for a quick resolution. We tend to wait. Until the check clears before issuing any business licenses. You should probably have a seat. Or, I quickly interjected before she could get too far away. Her words weren't exactly confidence-inspiring, and I wanted to know if Mabel's suggested backup plan would work. If I could rent a kitchen, then I could direct the girls to meet me so we could get started right away. If the community kitchen is available, or the Milton kitchen, they are licensed, right? Let me check. She sank back into her chair, typing with one finger in excruciating slowness on the keyboard of her computer. They are both rented by the Tasty Treats Bakery. What? I asked in surprise and a little bit of confusion. Why would the Tasty Treats Bakery need to rent those? They have their own licensed kitchen in the bakery. The clerk shrugged. They rented them for all of today. If you would have called this morning, they would have been available. He rented the town hall kitchen as well. I don't know why. Fury built up inside of me. Bart Baker had deliberately rented all the kitchens I could hire today. The only reason he would do such a thing was if he knew I was going to have problems with my own kitchen at the Happy Camper Resort. There was only one conclusion. Bart Baker had called in the complaint to the health department. That's sneaky, no good, louse of a man, I muttered under my breath. Pardon me? The clerk looked up in surprise. Could you please check to see if there's any way to hurry up the license renewal process? I asked sweetly. I'm in a bit of a bind. There was a particularly good chance I might have nothing available for the farmer's market booth tomorrow. Not the best way to advertise my baking skills and fledgling catering business. I'll see what I can do, murmured the clerk as she took my paper leaving me standing at the desk while she gradually meandered away. Magic Brownies Book 2 of the Cozy Mystery Series Camping Girl Written by Josephine Bintema 
narrated by Josephine Bintema. Chapter 5. Sabotage. I felt like I had been abandoned. The clerk had disappeared and was nowhere to be found. Once again, I was getting sore feet, just standing and waiting, refusing to give up my position in line. Someone else patiently waited behind me. It had been over thirty minutes since she had disappeared, I guessed as I checked my watch again. Someone walking by in the lobby area caught my attention, and I waved quickly. Hello, Mayor Whitcomb. Ivy, the mayor flashed a smile and came over to chat. How are you today? Have a little business with our staff? I'm good, I smiled and hoped he might be able to help me with my problems. However, I'm here for a kitchen license renewal. It's a bit of an emergency, and I was hoping to get it done today so I could bake for the food booth tomorrow at the farmer's market. I see, said Whitcomb as he nodded thoughtfully. Normally, license renewals take a little time. Have you thought about renting one of our other community kitchens? They all have been rented out already. I neglected to mention Bart Baker had been the one to do so. I am really in a bind. I can see how this might be a problem, he agreed. I would hate for you to miss your first Saturday at the market. We are going to have an incredibly special guest, and I was hoping to introduce the two of you. Can anything be done? I pleaded. At this rate, we won't be able to participate. Let me look into it, promised Whitcomb. Do you have your paperwork? All the forms are on the clerk's desk, except for the kitchen license renewal. I think she took it with her, I replied. Whitcomb nodded. Good. I'll just track her down and see if we can make this happen for you. As he left, I crossed my fingers, hoping he would be able to get me the license. My cell phone chirped, and I had a quick look at it. A text message from Molly was advising me to grab a fire extinguisher while I was in town. I quickly texted her back, asking if we had passed the inspection. I didn't receive a reply. Biting my lip, I put away the phone. There was nothing I could do. Either Molly would be able to convince Tyrone Phillips our kitchen was safe, or she couldn't. It didn't look like we had many options at this point. Mayor Whitcomb came forward, followed by the board clerk, who suddenly looked a little more chipper with her boss in the room. She sat down and began typing away as Whitcomb came to talk to me. We will file the paperwork today for your business and kitchen licenses, explained a jovial Whitcomb. As long as you have the payment, we can release them today. Now, you will have to pass an inspection with the health department. The inspector's name is Tyrone Phillips. Don't be put off by him. He's a bit serious, but a good man. Mr. Phillips is doing an inspection as we speak, I answered. I could only hope he hadn't failed the kitchen at the Happy Camper Resort. Good, nodded Whitcomb. Then, once he's completed his inspection, he will file the paperwork with us, and if you have passed, you should be good to go. Thank you, I gushed in relief. I very much appreciate this. The mayor took my hand. Just remember to vote for me next election year. I certainly will, I replied earnestly. I would do more than that. The mayor was going to receive a tray of treats from me as a thank you for all his help if this worked out. Wonderful, said Whitcomb. I'd better get back to work. The people need me. Thank you again, I reiterated as he left. Looking nervously at the clerk's every move, I waited while she typed and printed the business licenses. Here, said the clerk as she slipped them into an envelope, handing them over to me. Your business license... Your occupancy license, your kitchen license, and your events venue license. Note the time and occupancy limits so you don't exceed them. Once you have passed the health department's inspection, Mr. Phillips will upload the appropriate materials to us and you will receive your pass certification. Mr. Phillips provides the initial temporary pass sign but you will have to come in to replace it with annual permanent one. If the inspector recommends conditions which need to be met, you may still get a temporary pass sign, but will need to complete the improvements within the appropriate period and pass another inspection before receiving your annual permanent sign. Understood? Yes. I practically ripped the paperwork out of her hands. Thank you! Rushing out the door, I hit the hardware store for a fire extinguisher. Once I had the purchase I needed complete, I checked my messages, which were empty. 
Calling Molly, it went to voicemail. Call me back, I exclaimed into the phone before ending the call. Starting the car, I drove tensely, hunched over the wheel, back to the campground. Pulling up to the clubhouse, I noted Tyrone's vehicle was still there. Under other circumstances, I would have found the man sexy. He was a deep chocolate delight with a great physique in a suit. Unfortunately, he was also making life exceedingly difficult for me today, which was definitely not so sexy. Taking a couple of deep breaths to quell my anxiety, I walked into the clubhouse to find Molly leaning against the countertop and fluttering her lashes. So, what's it like to be a health inspector? She flirted outrageously, tossing her hair. I enjoy it, answered Tyrone, happily absorbing the attention. It's not like this is a job where you grow up thinking, this is what I want to do. However, being a health inspector means keeping the public safe. I like going on calls, investigating kitchens, and enjoy the human element of the position. Cool, replied Molly as she ran a hand down his sleeve. Sort of like a modern-day superhero. I thought Molly was laying it on a little thick and cleared my throat. Hey, a surprised Molly smiled at me. Did you get the paperwork? Yes, all the licenses are right here, I responded, waving the envelope the clerk had given me. I picked up a fire extinguisher, too. What a great idea, gushed Molly, as if she hadn't told me to get one. It's always good to be safety conscious. Wouldn't you agree, Tyro? It really shouldn't have surprised me that they were on a first-name basis by now. Good! Tyrone came forward, looking at the fire extinguisher to see what grade it was. I had made certain to pick the best I could afford. Seemingly satisfied, he picked up his clipboard and struck something off, making a note beside it. This will reduce your infractions, which means I can give you a temporary pass. You will need to make some improvements to achieve a full pass for the year. How long do we have to make the improvements? I asked. I also wondered what it was going to cost. Two weeks, smiled a more relaxed Tyrone. He ripped off a copy of the paperwork, giving it to me. I'll schedule with you a time and date for the next inspection to see the improvements. Looking forward to it. That last bit was said directly to Molly, who smiled back and gave him a little wink. I tried not to roll my eyes. Bye, Tyrone, breathed Molly as he left. Once he was gone, she latched onto the report and temporary pass permit. Took you long enough. Do you know how difficult it is to stall this guy? He is like hard chocolate. The kind that doesn't easily melt. We were so close to not passing. I looked at the paperwork in her hands, noting the fire extinguisher had indeed tipped us into the category of getting a temporary permit. The long list of improvements to bring the kitchen up to the standard that Tyrone wanted was daunting. I've worked in places which have worse kitchens than this one. How can they still be in business? This guy is a stickler for details, groaned Molly. Then she grinned. We passed, though. Now we can grab the girls and bake. With a shriek, I grabbed her in a hug. We were both rock stars today. We did the near impossible and are about to launch a baking business. Molly laughed and we took a moment to celebrate before Bee poked her nose in the door. I take it from all the ruckus that we have passed, questioned Bee. The inspector's car is gone. We passed, I shouted. Oh, good, a relieved Bee stated before opening the door wide, carrying two bags of groceries. Get in here, girls, and bring the food. Mabel, Agatha, and a bunch of other ladies from the campground filed in after, each carrying cardboard boxes from the local food mart. I conscripted a few people to help, acknowledged Bee briskly. I figured we could each follow a recipe and keep the ovens busy. You're wonderful. I quickly hugged her and set to helping. I'm going to pass around the recipes. Make them exactly as you see them, no substitutions. If an ingredient is missing, let me know and I'll troubleshoot. What's with the crock pots? asked Molly as a few of the women plugged them in. Supper is getting ready while we bake, explained Mabel. Then we just rotate off for a meal and come back to work. It's the simplest, agreed Agatha. Whoever invented slow cookers was a genius. Agreed, concurred Bee with a firm nod. Bee? asked a confused Agatha as she opened a box. What exactly did you buy? Why would we need five packages of diapers? Or ten floor cleaning solutions, questioned Mabel as she held up a bottle. What? exclaimed Bee. That's not my order. How did this happen? I opened a cardboard box to find it full of a dozen fish dinners. We can't use this stuff. 
I don't understand, muttered B as she stared into her own box. I phoned in the order so the store would put everything together and I could just pick it up. I do it all the time and it has never been wrong before. I must have gotten someone else's order. Well, we don't need hundreds of plastic cups, remarked Molly, closing her box back up. Let's put it back in the car. If someone will drive, then we can call the grocery store to get this straightened out. What will we do in the meanwhile? wondered a concerned Agatha. We still have other ingredients we can grab from our own kitchens. We will bake what we can until B returns with the grocery order. I shrugged. There was not much else we could do. The group organized itself, B heading to the store with one of the other ladies to get the appropriate groceries. Thank you, everyone, for doing this, I told the group as I passed around recipes. I can't begin to tell you how much it means to me. We enjoy the chance to help. Mabel waved away my gratitude. Now let me try baking that raspberry crumble. It looks delicious. I handed her the recipe. Are you sure there are no substitutions? Asked Molly doubtfully as she looked at her recipe. No substitutions, I reiterated firmly. These recipes are gold and are best made exactly as the directions say. Okay, shrugged Molly as she began to gather items. We were a little limited until Bee returned an hour later. This time, she had the right order. Do you know what happened? An indignant Bee pronounced. Some person called the store after I did and switched up our order. The nerve of people. The new girl was taking orders today, and she never even thought it might be a prank. What I want to know is who knew about us putting in a grocery order today. I had a fairly good idea who might have been behind the prank call, but I bit my tongue rather than voicing my thoughts out loud. I had no proof it was Bark Baker. We worked hard into the night. By ten in the evening, the elderly portion of the group packed it in and left for their campers. I couldn't blame them. They had been working for hours in a hot kitchen on a voluntary basis. The three stoves couldn't keep up anyway, so I had a lot of batter to get baked up yet and planned on staying up until the wee hours of the morning to get through it all. Fortunately, the fridges were filling up fast, which meant I had a lot of baked goods to sell tomorrow. At two in the morning, I remember putting in the oven a batch of something to bake before sitting on a stool someone had scrounged up at some point during our baking bonanza. Setting my head on my arms on the island counter, I promised myself I would stay awake. At six in the morning, Molly shook me out of sleep. Bleary-eyed, I looked at the clean kitchen and had a sniff. What is that smell? I asked doubtfully. I wasn't sure I had ever smelled it before. Did something happen to the ovens? Just your grandma's secret ingredient for the brownies, mentioned Molly as she walked past to the fridge. It doesn't smell very good, I wrinkled my nose. Don't worry about it. I tried a little of one and it was delicious. Molly grabbed a tray of baking. I'm loading the car. You had better get dressed and find some cash to make change. We have to get to the market and start setting up. Agatha told me the first customers start coming around seven. Okay, I'm on it, I mumbled, stumbling off the stool and out into the morning. Once at the camper, I quickly changed, ran a brush through my hair, and let the doggies out for the morning routine. Dropping them off at Herb's, I managed to grab two cups of coffee and travel mugs for Molly and I before heading back to the clubhouse. Molly was stuffing the car and giving it an happy look. There isn't much room here. Oh, coffee, thank you. We might have to make another trip. One of us can do that when we start running low on baked goods, I decided. This way, things stay refrigerated. I never even asked if the baking booth had a refrigeration or if we need to provide a cold place for the baking that isn't on display on the table. Live and learn, shrugged Molly. Let's go and scope out the farmer's market. At the farmer's market, we found the correct booth, which did have refrigeration and hydro. It was a huge bonus, in my opinion. It also had cute signage, which I would have to change to reflect our new business. A pair of stools were hidden under the counter. <laughs> Looks like the previous owner left us everything, I grinned. Under the counter, we found a lockbox for the cash, complete with a key. We unloaded the beetle and set up for the day. Molly went back for more baked goods, and sure enough, the early bird buyers started coming by, eager to see the new proprietors of our booth. We were one of six baked goods booths, as the market had a limit on space. I could see other people setting up games and events for the charity which was also taking place. Soon enough, we were crowded with all sorts of people. Tourists, seasonal dwellers, and regular townsfolks walked through the market, crowding the spaces. Orders kept me busy, and so did questions about who I was, my opinion on the best treats we had baked, and if I did any catering. 
After writing my number on a napkin for the fourth time, I realized I needed to make up some business cards with Molly for our business. It would save time and look more professional. When Molly returned, we took turns manning the booth and unloading more treats into the fridges. Getting through the crowd with containers of baked goods was a little difficult, and when I returned, I could see Molly smiling up at Detective Armand while fluttering her lashes yet again. I was surprised to see the detective in police sweats, as usually he was in a full suit. However, I supposed it wouldn't be practical in the June heat. "'Oh, hey, Ivy,' purred Molly. "'I was just telling Luca here how good the turnovers are. I just love something sweet and tart. These lemon raspberry ones are to die for.' I was hoping to get something for the whole crew, said Armand. We have half the police department here doing games for the fundraiser. The chief is hopeful we can raise the majority of the money needed for our Cops for Tots program where we buy toys for underprivileged kids. Handsome and a humanitarian, giggled Molly. Armand gave her a doubtful look before turning his attention to me. Do you have any baked goods that are going to be a sure favorite for the group? Maybe a couple dozen squares of something? How about the brownies, I suggested. It's my grandma's recipe, and everyone has been raving about how good they are. Chocolate is always a good choice. Sold, replied Armand as he dug out his wallet. Are you sure, Ivy? questioned Molly, suddenly serious. She leaned toward me, giving me a peculiar look. I thought someone else had ordered the brownies. We made six dozen, I shrugged. I certainly hadn't taken any orders, and this was a sale in hand. I'm sure we will have more than enough. If you say so, Molly pursed her lips and straightened a different part of the display. I bagged up the brownies, happily taking Armand's money. Thanks. Armand gave a smile, transforming him from rugged to handsome with his tan and athletic looks. Come by again, I murmured as he left. Come by again, chirped Molly in a high voice as she laughed at me. I meant come by again, as in purchasing some more baked goods. I quickly covered, trying not to blush at her teasing. "'Are you sure you know what you're doing?' asked Molly. I quickly straightened out some packages, trying not to get drawn into whatever strange notion was crossing Molly's mind. "'It's fine. It's cool. Now we have got customers.' The morning rolled into the afternoon, and a wave of people suddenly appeared, following a group of people, some with small cameras on their shoulders, and a boom mic in the air. "'Oh, my word! There's Fergie!' breathed Molly. She spotted the famous food television celebrity. It's her! I rose to my tippy toes to see through the bystanders. Sure enough, the slightly plump hostess with excessive makeup, a flair for dramatic hair, and wildly colorful dresses was laughing at something Mayor Reuben Whitcomb had said. I blinked in surprise. It's true. She came to Oaks Crossing. Did I tell you the mayor told me who he's hoping to introduce her to us? Really? squeaked Molly, darting me a look of disbelief before gluing her eyes back to Fergie. I've always wanted to go on Fergie's fiery kitchen. I've always wanted to be Fergie. Well, that was our chance to meet her. I gulped as Whitcomb gestured to our booth. We are so not prepared for this, muttered Molly. Smile, I elbowed her. Good afternoon, ladies. A smooth Mayor Whitcomb kept his election smile in place as he led Molly's idol over to us. This is Fergie, from Fergie's Fiery Kitchen. Fergie, this is Ivy Thurman and her friend... Molly! My name is Molly. It's an honor, breathed Molly, shaking the television host's proffered hand. Fergie looked amused at Molly's starstruck expression. Nice to meet you. Look at all these goodies. I think I might just gain a few pounds while I'm here. Everyone in the crowd laughed good-naturedly. "'Would you like to try something?' I offered. "'I definitely would,' chuckled Fergie as she looked over the table. "'Do you ladies have a favorite?' "'Raspberry crumble bars,' I suggested. "'They are a sweet yet tart treat, soft and crumbly with a healthy feel for a light snack. "'Then I need to try one of those,' her eyes lit up with excitement. "'I put a couple of granola bars on some napkins, giving one to Fergie and the next to the mare. "'Both of them chewed in delight.' Oh, this is a slice of goodness, mumbled Whitcomb as he daubed his lips with the napkin after finishing the square. Ivy, I need to talk to you about placing a weekly order if the rest of your baking matches the quality of these bars. If you're a fan of maple flavors, you should try the salted maple pecan pie bars. 
I quickly took a couple, placing them on napkins. They're made with maple syrup. Indeed. Fergie's fingers happily took the treat. Do you often cook with substitute ingredients? Only if it works with the recipe, I replied sagely. It doesn't do to make something so fancy that the baking is spoiled by conflicting flavors. I love old recipes, which are simple, but there is always room to improve when one can. Delicious! A buttery pie crust drenched in maple syrup with a salty zing, moaned Fergie delicately. Is that sea salt I taste? It is, I grinned at her appreciation. You have a penchant for flavor. That's why I'm on the cooking channel, bragged Fergie. Now, who taught you how to bake? My grandmother, I smiled happily. Each summer I would come here as a child. Grandma taught me everything I know about baking. When to stick to the tried and true and when to experiment. She was the expert baker. I'm just glad to have been taught by her. My fondest memories are of her in the kitchen smelling cinnamon and chocolate. She taught you well. Fergie tapped her lips with a finger, looking at me shrewdly. Have you ever thought about doing a cookbook? I have thought about it, I admitted. Perhaps some day I'll be able to. Right now, Molly and I are just trying to get our new baking business off the ground. We are hoping to do a little catering along with the farmer's market on Saturdays. Starting off small, but perhaps some day we can work our way larger. A sound business strategy, approved Fergie as she looked at the cameras. Watch out for Ivy and Molly. They are smart and talented. The mare eyed another set of sweets. How are the lemon snaps? I've always loved those. Here, I said impulsively, picking up a package. Have a dozen for you both to share with the television crew. Isn't that nice, beamed Fergie. You write down your details and give it to one of my people. You are in the running. In the running? croaked Molly, grabbing my arm in a death grip so hard I was certain it was going to bruise. To be a guest on my show, Fergie fluffed her hair. To have a chance at co-authoring a cookbook with me. Molly's jaw dropped and she managed to squeak out a thank you to Fergie. I was glad she had because I wasn't sure. You are making a big mistake, yelled Bart Baker as he elbowed his way through the crowd and into the limelight. If anyone should be on your show and making a cookbook, it should be me. Magic Brownies Book Two of the Cozy Mystery Series Camping Girl Written by Josephine Bintema Narrated by Josephine Bintema Chapter Six Magic Brownies Just who are you? frowned Fergie, looking like she had spotted a particularly ugly toad. Bart Baker, from the Tasty Treats Bakery, supplied Whitcomb. Bart, I told you we would be heading to your bakery directly after the tour of the farmer's market. There is nothing and no one here at the market worth Fergie's time, declared Bart. He glared at me, sweating and puffing from the exertion of fighting through the crowd. You cheated on the taste testing contest. I know it. I should have your booth. I did not cheat. I don't have to lower myself to that degree, unlike you, I retorted with some steam. Ooh, I sense a story behind this, Fergie leaned forward in excitement. What happened? I played perfectly fair, sniffed Bart. It's not my fault you aren't a competent baker. Calling in a fake claim to the health department is playing fair? I raised an eyebrow in disbelief. You have an unlicensed kitchen, he accused through gritted teeth, shaking a finger in my face. It is licensed, I said coldly. I neglected to mention we had just managed to get the license by the skin of our teeth. The drama, grasped Fergie with delight. I want both of you on my show, pitted against each other. It will draw on viewers. You can tell everyone your stories and gain stardom. I would rather just let the baking speak for itself. I grabbed a random package of baked treats, shoving them at Mara Whitcomb. Why don't you try the brownies as well? They will be a foil for the lemon snaps. Bribing them? growled Bart as he breathed heavily. He snatched a second package of brownies off my table. You should be ashamed of yourself. I'm not ashamed of myself, I said calmly. Looking Bart in the eye, I said in as firm a voice as I could manage, cognizant of the cameras which were recording every second of our spat. I'm ashamed of your behavior. 
coming here, throwing accusations around, being rude, and just generally not a nice person. The mayor has said Fergie intends to stop by your bakery. You should be there, preparing for her arrival. I would appreciate it if you would please leave. There was some scattered applause in the crowd. Growling, a sweaty Bart shook the package of brownies at me. You haven't heard the last of this. The cookbook is going to be mine. He spun on his heel, stiffly marching back through the crowd and elbowing any unfortunate individual who got in his way. Well, that was some excitement, Fergie told the cameras. Seriously, I need to put the two of you on a show together. I would rather not, I said dryly. The less time I spend around Bart Baker, the better. I'll do it, volunteered Molly. Fergie laughed. She and her entourage continued on, looking at booths and remarking on life in a small town. Molly and I watched until she was out of sight. Then we were mobbed by people paying for treats while gossiping about what they had just seen. Just from my confrontation with Bart, I received several standing orders from people who weren't particularly enamored with the baker. Ivy, we need to talk. The male voice sent a shiver up my spine. Now. I winced slightly. From my previous encounters with Detective Armand, I knew this was his no-nonsense voice, which made people feel like they had done something wrong, even if they hadn't. Turning around, I saw a stern detective staring down at me. Can I help you? I asked as I wondered what had happened to the nicer version of Armand who had bought treats from me this morning. You can, replied Armand. Taking me by the arm, he propelled me out of the booth. Where are we going? I wondered uncertainly. I need to be helping Molly. You need to explain your actions, responded a terse Armand as we jostled through the crowded area. Arriving where the police and firefighters were running games for the carnival, Armand stopped. What were you thinking? I don't understand, I protested, annoyed by his manhandling and accusatory tone. What are you talking about? The brownies, he hissed at me in a loud whisper. Now I was confused. Hey, Luca, shouted a blonde, boyish-looking cop as he tried to throw bean bags into the holes to gain points at one of the games. Do you think this game is too hard? I've been trying, and I think the game is super hard. It's not fair to expect little kids to do okay at a game like this when I can't even score any points. That is just mean. Maybe we should give out refunds or let the kids play free. He tossed a bag right over the board. Putting his hands up in the air, he shrugged in amazement. See what I mean? It's so difficult. Are these microwavable? Asked the cop beside him, holding up the bean bags. I had a sore knee once and used a heated bean bag. Or if we microwave the beans, will they be cooked? Is he high? I hesitantly questioned the men's odd behavior. Ramon grabbed my shoulders, turning me to face him. He leaned forward, speaking with a sense of urgency. Every single person I gave your brownies to is high. Ivy, we have drug tests that we are supposed to pass. These are police officers and firefighters here. We are all on call and now impaired. That's not good, I ventured, a little shocked by the revelation, but wondering what my brownies had to do with it. No, it is not good, Armand told me before he was distracted by something behind me. He has a really red shirt. Like, ultra bright red. What? I tried to look, but didn't see anything in particular. A sudden suspicion came over me, and I looked at him carefully. Are you high? You make me want to tear my hair out, muttered Armand before abruptly letting go of me. You are a complete disaster, Ivy Thurman. What were you thinking? Serving emergency service personnel, brownies laced with marijuana. Whoa! Stop it right there! I stuck a finger under his arrogant nose. I did not make marijuana brownies. The brownies are from my grandmother's recipe. They are not magic brownies. Ivy, I remember exactly what it was like to be high in college from smoking weed, admitted Armand. The only thing I ate this morning since breakfast was one of your brownies. Are you certain? I asked as a sinking feeling came over me. Who knew how many other people had bought the brownies? I couldn't remember who had all purchased the packages of them. Very certain, an emphatic Armand told me. He looked over at one of the firefighters who was laughing uproariously over something someone had said. Dude, it is not that funny. Well, 
It would be if I wasn't a detective. If the chief finds out, we are all suspended. Can you imagine the papers? Half the police force suspended for eating magic brownies. This could make national news. It can't be my brownies, I insisted. Grabbing Armand by the arm, it was my turn to push my way through the crowd, pulling him along behind me. Molly! Molly! What's up? Molly turned from giving change to a customer. She smiled and her eyes lit up as she caught sight of Armand with me. Hello, lemon custard, sweet and sour. What? The confused Armand said, staring down at her like she was speaking a different language, which she kind of was. Molly, I admonished before looking around to see if anyone would overhear what I had to say next. Fortunately, I looked like there was a lull in the crowd and we had no customers at the moment. Did you put marijuana in the brownies of my grandmother's recipe? No, answered Molly. I sighed in relief before turning to Armand. See? I used the cannabis butter your grandmother listed in the recipe, an innocent Molly told us. You said absolutely no substitutions, and I found a jar of the stuff hiding in the back of the fridge of in your camper. I stared at her in shock. You let me sell magic brownies? I did kind of say I didn't think it was a good idea to sell them to Mr. Detective here, but you did it anyways, shrugged Molly. I don't know what kind of town this is. Maybe this is the normal here. You did not say that, I squeaked. Did I not hint someone else had hoarded the brownies? Laughed Molly as she rolled her eyes. I was giving you an out, but you blissfully sold them to policemen here anyways. Because I didn't know you made magic brownies, I practically yelled at her. Armand shushed me. Oh my word, breathed Molly, cluing in. Is he high? You don't need to say it quite so loudly, muttered Armand. Molly dissolved into giggles. Great, I murmured. Just great. How are we going to babysit half the police force and firefighters? Who else got the brownies? Um, only the mayor and Fergie's whole entourage, crowed Molly as she laughed hysterically. Herb bought a batch after making certain I followed your Jima's directions to a T. One day in, and our catering business is ruined, I moaned, covering my face with my hands. I peeked out at Armand, dreading the possible answer to the question I was about to ask. Is cannabis legal? Are the edibles legal here? There have to be permits. He frowned at us both. Is anything else in your booth contaminated? Molly? I looked at my friend pointedly. Just the brownies, confirmed a mirthful Molly. That's it. Thank goodness, I sighed in relief. Armand picked up a package of peanut butter brittle, ripping it open and breaking off a chunk before popping it into his mouth. Are you going to pay for that? A pert Molly asked. We drugged him, I chided her. If he has the munchies, he is welcome to eat. This is good, mentioned Armand as he crunched through the brittle. If there are any more brownies, they need to be thrown out, I advised. I looked at Armand, who seemed to have relaxed a little. What are we going to do about the other high people? Nothing, suggested Molly. It will wear off after a couple of hours. A couple of hours? I exclaimed. Usually it wears off in a half an hour, frowned Armand, from what I remember. It is if you smoke it, explained the patient Molly. Edibles are a slightly different thing. The high takes longer to come on, but when it does, it can be more extreme and last longer. What are we going to do? I moaned. Trick the cops out of the keys and let them play carnival games with the kids, shrugged an unconcerned Molly. By the time the farmer's market is over, they'll be sober and our mom can return the keys. It is not a plan, my voice was tinged with disapproval. What happens if they got a call for a fire or something? I need to tell the chief, said Armand as he crunched through the last of the brittle. He nodded decisively. We will just have to take whatever punishment he gives us. Wait, Molly held out a hand, putting brakes on the idea. Could Ivy and I go to jail for this? I am not going to jail, I huffed. I didn't bake these. You sold them, Molly pointed out. I bought them, noted Armand. We are all screwed. We don't need to tell the police chief, wheedled Molly as she handed Armand a piece of cheesecake and a fork. Not if we call in a bunch of Ivy senior citizens to babysit the boys in bloom. No one needs to know. Again, we can't babysit people if they need to go on an active crime scene, I remarked. 
This is really tasty cake, mentioned Armand. You two are excellent bakers. Thank you, dimpled Molly as she fluttered her eyelashes. Stop it, I hissed at her. You are not flirting your way out of this situation. Molly pouted. Give me your phone, I demanded of Armand. He easily complied, unlocking the screen with my prompting. Where is the chief of police's phone number? We don't exactly call him, explained Armand around a mouthful of cake. He's not in my contacts. Okay, then who do I call? I asked. Molly, go and fetch those keys from all the other officers and firefighters. Who will watch the booth? questioned Molly. Just go, I told her. I knew she could flirt the keys right out of the men's inebriated pockets. Hopefully, no female police or firefighters met up with my friend. Molly didn't have as good a luck with the fairer sex. She tended to be a bit abrasive around women. Grumbling, she took off and I pulled Armand into our booth. Who should I call? I asked him again. Armand finished off the cake. Try dispatch. They'll know what to do. Do you have a garbage? Here. I grabbed his garbage and threw it in the trash. Pushing the phone at him, I tapped the screen. Where is dispatch? There. Armand leaned over, touching the screen to the appropriate number, his fingers brushing over mine. Moving a little away from him to get some space, I spent the next while explaining to the policewoman on the phone the mishap of accidentally drugging Oaks Crossing's finest with magic brownies which weren't meant for resale. First, the dispatcher laughed at me. Then, once she realized I was serious, she got her supervisor, who laughed at me some more. Finally, they assured me the sober portion of the police force would come to investigate the matter. I cringed a little. They won't charge me with anything, will they? I questioned Armand. I honestly have no idea. Armand eyed the last of the fudge. There were only two packages left. Go ahead, I gestured to the treat. Thanks, he replied before opening the package. Armand paused as he slowly chews the fudge. I don't know if it's the pot or your baking, but this is the best fudge. I swear I can taste the colors. You're welcome. I grabbed the last package, opening it for myself. I deserved the sweet, buttery, chocolatey goodness, I decided. The last few days had been difficult. If this had happened at any other police department and I heard about the incident, I would be laughing, mentioned Armand. It is kind of funny when you think about it. I gave Armand a sideways glance. Somehow, I hadn't pictured the grim detective having a sense of humor. It didn't fit with the history I knew about him from our previous encounters. Armand shrugged. If I weren't worried about what the police chief is going to do about this whole situation, it would be funny. The crowd was thinning out at the farmer's market as we edged closer to the end of the day. It was a good thing because we had nearly sold out of baked goods. As I arranged the last couple of packages for display, Molly returned. She was followed by an unamused, middle-aged policeman who looked particularly important. Armand quickly swallowed the last of his fudge and straightened. Sir? My homicide detective, my forensic team, and three rookies all impaired, glowered the chief, plus some members of the fire department and one of our paramedics. Do you know what will happen if this gets into the press? It will go national. And the Oaks Crossing Emergency Services will be the laughing stock of the country. Yes, sir, quietly agreed a subdued Armand. It is the only reason no one will be suspended for this. The chief fixed his unyielding gaze on me. I hear you and the blue-haired wonder are responsible for drugging my men. Ivy didn't know, confessed Molly. It was all my fault. The brownies weren't meant to be sold to unsuspecting customers. I sold the brownies, I admitted. It is true, I didn't know what was in them. I'm deeply sorry. Selling cannabis at bulls without a license carries a heavy fine, warned the chief. Yes, sir. I bet my lip. We would probably lose the kitchen license I had just acquired. None of this was good. My stomach bottomed out in anxiety. Sir, she didn't know, began Armand before he was cut off by the chief. I will talk to you in a minute growled the chief as he glared at Armand. Yes, sir, came Armand's quietly chastened reply. The police chief let out a heavy sigh. What I don't need is this getting into the press. If I charge you with anything, it would be seen in the crime scene section in the newspaper. 
and I would have to answer questions from the public about this fiasco. Questions I don't want to answer. Does it mean that you're not charging us? questioned a hopeful Molly. If this happens again, you can be certain I will come down doubly hard on you, warned the chief. No more sales of edibles without a permit. No unlawful activity at all. Yes, sir, absolutely, I nodded readily, happy to agree to whatever he wanted. Good, stated the chief with a small measure of grim satisfaction. Detective, you can fill me in on the details of exactly how this happened while we walk to the car. Yes, sir, replied a gloomy Armand. After they were both gone, I sat down abruptly on a stool. That was so bad. It could have been so much worse. It was kind of funny, remarked Molly, opening a package of triple chocolate chip cookies. She handed me two and took the others for herself. It's going to be a great story to tell people. No, I shook my head and a finger at her. No telling anyone about this. You heard the police chief. He doesn't want anyone to know. It means we don't say a word about it, so he doesn't decide to press charges after all. Fine, huffed Molly as she chewed a cookie. If you think about it, we are giving up our bragging rights. How many other people can say they got the cops high? Half the cops, and by accident, I clarified. Still, it's worth bragging about, remarked Molly, finishing off a cookie. Not if you only get to brag from the inside of a jail cell, I reprimanded, sinking my teeth into a buttery, sweet, chocolatey goodness. Soft and moist, these cookies were perfect. Molly grimaced. You are such a spoil sport. I'm practical, I mentioned dryly. The day was winding down. Vendors began packing up their booths, so we did too. As we were putting the last items away, Ava approached. Oh, wow, what a busy day, she smiled at us. I hope you guys did well. I was meaning to come over earlier, but I was so busy with all the foot traffic, I've never had so many sales in one sitting. We were pretty busy, I admitted, not expanding on what had happened with the brownies. I think we maybe have a dozen packages of baked goods left. Great, Ava pulled out some money. I was hoping to pick up something to tide me over until supper. I showed her what was left, and she picked out some strawberry rhubarb tarts. Thelma came bustling to her booth, eyes wide. Did you hear what happened? No, I questioned cautiously, hoping word hadn't gotten out about the magic brownie mishap. What happened? An interested Molly leaned in, encouraging Thelma. Magic Brownies Book Two of the Cozy Mystery Series Camping Girl Written by Josephine Beintema. Narrated by Josephine Beintema. Chapter 7. A Murder Bart Baker was found dead at the Tasty Treats Bakery, Thelma dramatically announced. She ignored our shocked silence and continued. Mayor Wickham and the food celebrity, whatever her name is, went into the bakery after their tour of the farmer's market. The front of the shop was deserted, so they went to the back and found Bart dead on the floor. Her name is Fergie, from Fergie's Fiery Kitchen, I corrected faintly. Maybe he had a heart attack, remarked Molly. All of us looked at her and she shrugged a little. What? He's not exactly a small guy, and he has serious anger issues. All that's got to put stress on the ticker. That's not all, Thelma leaned in and whispered. I have it from Mitsby Bitsby, but had a brownie in his hand. It had one bite out of it. She thinks Bob was poisoned. Just how would Mitsy Bitsby know, scoffed Ava. She saw the commotion from the odds and ends shop. Mitsy said the city folk had a big to-do. I guess they were pretty startled to find Bob dead at the bakery. The police confiscated some of their film. The cameraman didn't like that, answered Thelma. Mitsby went to the bakery to investigate for herself and saw everything. Mitzi is one of the biggest gossips there is, noted Ava with disdain. I wouldn't necessarily believe her. Did Bart take a package of her brownies? frowned Molly as she tried to remember. I groaned. He did. He swiped a package off the table while arguing with us and never paid for it. You don't think he was allergic to the secret ingredient? You need to stop harping on about it, commented a slightly defensive Molly. I've never heard of anyone being allergic to a little sweet MJ. 
Did you just say what I think you did? questioned Ava in alarm. You made your grandmother's brownies, smiled Thelma in satisfaction. Did you save me any? No, I said firmly. There are no more brownies. There will be no more magic brownies. I am running a baking business, not an edibles business. Oh, Thelma's face fell in disappointment. There are a lot of folk around here, especially at the campground, who would pay a premium for proper baked goods with a little kick to them, if you know what I mean. We could make a lot of money, suggested Molly with a sideways look at me, measuring my reaction. We could go to jail, I reiterated. Someone is dead with one of our brownies in his hand. Again, I wouldn't believe Mitzi. She's known to make stuff up, inserted Ava. It's highly unlikely what she said is true. I felt a little better after Ava's assurances. Hopefully, Mitzi was exaggerating. If it was true, Bart had died at his own bakery, which would have all sorts of treats in it. It didn't necessarily mean he had been eating my brownies when he died. I dragged my attention back to the conversation. What a way to go, a dreamy Thelma smiled, dying with a bit of heaven in your hand. I've never understood why anyone would want to get high, mused Ava. I mean, you could totally lose control over whatever you do. I don't think the plain Jane sponge cake and I can be friends, muttered Molly to me as she eyed Ava with distrust. I elbowed Molly, reminding her to be polite. Did you ladies hear what happened? Tawny Tilbury rushed up to meet us, huffing with exertion. Bart Baker? Dead Baker, answered Molly, raising an arched eyebrow. Oh, a deflated Tawny said. It's very exciting, replied Thelma as she patted Tawny on the shoulder. Most exciting thing to happen in town since Ethel was found in the lake. Well, I was listening to the police scanner when I heard, spoke Tawny, regaining some of her enthusiasm. They think it might be poison. The forensics team was called in. Then it was an allergic reaction, I questioned. No, not at all, confirmed Tawny. It was poison. They are taking samples from everything in the shop. It's going to take them hours, since the business is a bakery just full of all sorts of ingredients. Well, that's a relief, said Molly. At least we'll know it wasn't the brownie, then. The brownie? wondered Tawny. Mitzi Bitsby said Bob was found with a partly eaten brownie in his hand, mentioned Thelma smartly, proud to be in possession of this little fact. I really wish Thelma would stop talking about the brownies. Was it the brownie that killed him? asked Tawny with morbid curiosity. No, both Molly and I said in unison. Is there anything I should know about in these? Ava held up her half-eaten tart in suspicion. They're fine, I assured her. It was only the brownies. So, are we going to investigate? inquired Thelma, eyes sparkling. Why would you investigate? a confused Ava asked. Ivy's a great investigator, vouched Tawny. She found my Winifred in only one day. Winnie is my prized purebred Persian cat. With Winnie's help, Ivy solved Ethel's murder. No, I shook my head. There is no need for us to investigate anything. The police have it under control. The same police who are higher than kites right now, murmured Molly beside me. I gave her a dark look, then reassured everyone. I'm sure Oaks Crossing's finest can handle it. A disappointed Tawny nodded. Where did you get a police scanner? wondered Thelma. Oh, tittered Tawny. The scanner is an app on my phone. My granddaughter got it for me, and it is the most entertaining thing. Just this afternoon, half the police force had to return to the department because of a gas leak. A gas leak? I repeated uncertainly. Well, it must have been, shrugged Tawny. There was quite the commotion about it. The scanner said something about being high, so I thought they might have breathed in some sort of fumes. The firefighters were involved, too. Molly burst out laughing as I looked at Tawny with a bit of horror. Ava choked on her tarp. Thelma wrapped an arm around Tawny's shoulders, walking away with her. Why don't you show me about this app of yours? Is everyone in this town so innocent and naive? wondered mirthful Molly, wiping her eyes. Not really, I sighed, remembering my experience with some of the other members of the town. I think I should get going, decided Ava. It was nice talking to you both. We said our farewells and loaded up the bug, which was a lot easier than unloading it this morning. 
Barely any of our baked goods were left. Molly and I returned to the campground to find the boardwalk around the office was completely finished. Too bad, pouted Molly. Matthew was such a good-looking piece of caramel cream pie. Maybe if you become friends with his grandma, she will mention you to him, I teased. Maybe I'll just call him since he gave me his phone number, a smug Molly replied. Deciding to clean out Ethel's trailer so Molly could finally have a place of her own, we grabbed some cleaners and attacked the small space. It was dark when we finally emerged, dirty but victorious in our cleaning spree. I was overtired from barely sleeping the night before. Nearly sleepwalking, I picked up cupcake and cookie from Herb, giving him a couple of packages of baking in return for the dog-sitting services he had provided today. They were good, little rascals, Herb told me, giving the Boston Terriers a last pat each. That was nice to know, I murmured, patting the pair as they snuffled my dirty clothes. Did you hear what happened to Bart Baker? he asked as he handed over the leashes. Dead, I replied, yawning. I was nearly dead on my feet. Some people think it was the landlord, Horace Retz, confided Herb. Retz owns a lot of businesses and property in the area. Why would the landlord want to kill his own tenant? I questioned doubtfully. Apparently Baker was so behind on the rent, Retz was going to take him to court over the whole thing. They had a big argument right on the street just a couple of days ago, replied a sage Herb. People thought it might come to blows. Retz knows the Tasty Treats Bakery is prime property, and he can get another high-paying tenant pretty quickly. The problem is evicting Baker, which isn't easy. The legal costs would be mounting up while the opportunity to earn rent money is slipping away. Yet to kill a man over it, I wondered. People have killed over less, replied Herb. He yawned as well. Well, it's past my bedtime. Have a good night, Ivy. Walking back to my trailer with the doggies, I reflected that Bart Baker wasn't a well-liked man. No doubt, there were multiple people glad he was gone. The police were certainly going to have their hands full investigating, and I did not envy them. In fact, I resolved not to worry about the matter whatsoever. At the trailer, I gave Cupcake and Cookie a quick bedtime snack. After a shower, I crawled into bed with them, ignoring the rumbling of thunder in the distance since I was just so tired. I woke to the steady sound of rain outside the camper and the steady dripping of leaks inside. Groaning, I hauled myself out of bed to pull the pots and pans out from the cabinet, placing them under the leaking areas to catch the errant water coming in from outside. While I had bought the repair kits for the roof, I hadn't managed to scale the camper to fix the leaks as of yet. Resolving to do it as soon as possible, I snuggled back in with Cupcake, who lay against me. Cookie was still a little standoffish, preferring my feet or a pillow all to herself. It was taking her longer to warm up to me since I had inherited them, along with the campground upon Grandma's death. The good news is Cookie and I were making progress. She would now let me pet her. Soon enough, both Bosties were snoring noisily, lost in their little dream worlds. I wasn't far behind. I took Sunday off as a day of rest. After a quick walk in the pre-dawn morning for Cupcake and Cookie to do their business, all three of us elected to sleep in until noon. Then I made a satisfying brunch of eggs, toast, and bacon for all three of us, since I had decided the bossies had earned a treat for being so quiet. The afternoon we spent lounging on a towel at the beach. Correction, I lounged and the two doggies sniffed the beach, dug in the sand at the beach, and occasionally dipped their toes in the lake. Cookie got my attention as she gave a low growl. Hey, is this the Happy Camper Resort? A guy's voice cut through my suntanning. Yes. I raised my head and shaded my eyes. I shushed the dogs before they could start an onslaught of barking at the stranger. Cool. Painstakingly pale with sandy hair, he had a seat on the sand beside me. We didn't know. Roger got lost trying to get here and it took us forever to find the place. No one was at the office to check us in. So we just found a lot and put up the tents. I hope it is okay. It is more than okay, I agreed, a little concerned. What time did you get here? Oh, about ten last night, nodded the guy, looking over the lake. Wow, this is a prime spot. I'm surprised it was so cheap and everything was open. We are a little run down and working on improvements, I mentioned dryly. For instance, the clubhouse and pool are currently closed. Who needs a pool with a lake like this? He gestured to the water. 
I sat up, looking at all my hours of manual labor, pulling out grass and reeds to make the lake accessible from the beach again. I had done a good job, I congratulated myself. I'm Ivy. I own the campground. He shook my hand with a grin. Topher. I guess I should get you all checked in, I decided. Better to have them sign the waiver sooner rather than later. Plus, I hoped they would pay up right away for the lot that they had rented. Sure thing, agreed Topher, quickly standing as I did. I threw my towel over my shoulder and put on my flip-flops. Together we walked to the office. How are you enjoying it so far? The place is great, responded Topher easily. We went kayaking this morning and plan on a hike this afternoon. Someone said the Oaks Crossing Forest Reserve has great trails. I heard there might be a waterfall. If you find it, let me know, I told him. It was the first I had heard of such a feature, but I wasn't exactly a hiking enthusiast. At the office, we found Conrad doing the crossword puzzle. Hi, Conrad, I greeted the retired coroner as I dug out the appropriate paperwork for Topher to sign. Hey, Ivy, grunted Conrad. You're the baker. What's another word for cream puff? Profiterole or croquembouche, I said absently, laying the forms on the counter and scrounging up a pen. Here are the liability waivers and the rules of the campground. We have a lot of senior citizens here, so if you could keep the noise level down after ten at night, it would be much appreciated. I'm sure we can manage it, agreed Topher good-naturedly. He signed the forms with a flourish, then pulled out his wallet. Happily, I took the cash for his stay, putting it in the lockbox. Bart Baker died, mentioned Conrad. I sighed. I heard. Who is Bart Baker? wondered Topher. He owned the Tasty Treats Bakery in town, I supplied. He was a mean one, snorted Conrad. Word has it, Baker was blackmailing the chef at the White Oaks Golf Club. What? Why? I frowned. The citizens of the campground were starting to wear off on me with their gossipy tendencies. Forget it, I don't need to know. I want to know, Topher leaned on the counter, all ears. I guess the chef from the White Oaks was stealing recipes and calling them his own creations. He doesn't have a creative bone in his body, grumbled Conrad. He's trying to publish a cookbook, and Bart found out some of the recipes were his. Mabel's niece Wanda works at the White Oaks and said she overheard a full-on argument between the two about the whole thing. I guess the chef told Bart he would regret messing with him. Wow, blinked Topher. That's crazy. It is none of our business, I said firmly. I hope you enjoy your stay, Topher. Pulling Cookie and Cupcake along, I departed from the office to take a relaxing walk. I didn't want to think about murder and motives right now. I was just hoping to have a nice day before I scaled the camper to see if I could fix the leaks in the roof tomorrow. Hopefully I wouldn't fall off the thing. I wasn't particularly confident in my patching abilities as I had never done anything remotely like it before. Yet I couldn't afford to have someone else do it. Not when so many things at the Happy Camper Resort needed the money more. I waved to Bee and, at her insistence, had a seat in her little lot under her awning. She grabbed another glass and poured me an iced tea. Crazy things happening in this town, remarked Bee as she had a seat again. She set aside her latest crime novel mystery, The Tragic Train Ride. Do we have to talk about Bart Baker? I asked. Bee blinked. I would have thought you would like to talk about his murder. You helped to solve Ethel's murder. Only because I was a suspect, I reminded her. It's going to be the only thing people talk about for the next while, advised B. At least until they make an arrest. I had nightmares last night. In my dreams, the police had come from Molly, all because she had baked those magic brownies. Hopefully, the police can make an arrest soon. There will have been all sorts of rumors floating around. I hear his brother Tristan might be behind it shrugged B as she sipped her tea. However, the evidence seems flimsy at best. Just because they have never liked each other, and now Bart got the lead role in the yearly Oaks Crossing Theatrics production, doesn't mean Tristan up and killed his brother. Bart acted? I asked in surprise. Every year he was in the production in some sort of role, explained B. Tristan is the real theater buff, though. He loves the stage and has even been on Broadway. The show was a failure, and he came home, but he made it that far. Bart never let him forget he had messed up his big chance to become famous. Nice brother, I remarked with a bit of sarcasm. Bart has always been a bully, admitted B. 
I think this murder is going to be difficult to solve. There are so many suspects. Like the landlord and the pastry chef from the White Oaks Golf Club, I mentioned dryly. I heard about the landlord, but the pastry chef? Question B. Something about blackmail over the chef using Bart's recipes, I explained. If you want the full scoop, talk to Conrad. I just might, mused B. Isn't it interesting one man can have so many enemies? He wasn't the most likable person, I replied. A police car came cruising up the lane. I wonder what they want, said a curious B. The car stopped in front of us. I recognized the police officer as the boy's blonde who had been struggling with the beanbag toss game. Ivy Thurman? Yes, I stood up, hushing cookie and cupcake. I'm Ivy. Ma'am, if you will come with me. He looked a little uncomfortable, but determined. Where? I asked. What's going on? We would like you to answer some questions at the police station, he said. I'll need you to get in the car. Questions? About what? I was confused. About the death of Bart Baker, the officer told me. Please cooperate and get in the car. I handed the leashes of my doggies to B, who took it with a trembling hand. Don't worry, Ivy, B assured me. I'll get you a good lawyer. Jepson Gray might be retired, but he's still got spunk. I didn't have much faith in that. Am I under arrest? No, ma'am, he repeated. We just need you to answer some questions. Okay, I nodded nervously. B, I might need a ride later. I gave Cookie and Cupcake a pat before walking to the police car. The officer opened the back door for me and I slid in. He got inside and turned to look at me. Where is Molly Pembroke? he asked. She is at Lot 21, I replied, now feeling very worried. Why? Instead of talking to me, he toured the campground looking for the Cret Lot. Once he had found it, he went to the front of Ethel's trailer, knocking on the door. Molly answered. I could see, but couldn't hear, a short conversation between the cop and Molly. Then an alarmed Molly saw me in the back of the police car. After another discussion between the officer and my friend, Molly joined me in the back seat. Officer straight-up vanilla ice cream without any trimmings or cone won't tell me anything, Molly whispered as she grabbed my hand in hers. Do you know what this is about? He said something about questioning us about Bart Baker's death, I replied, trying to stay calm. I'm not saying I'm sorry the guy is gone, but what do we have to do with Bart's death, wondered Molly. I hushed her, hoping the police officer hadn't heard what Molly had said. Maybe we should wait until we get to the police station to find out exactly what is going on. It didn't take long to reach the Oaks Crossing Police Department. The officer escorted us inside, where we were greeted by the chief of police. You two just can't seem to stay out of trouble. He stared down at us, folding his arms across his large chest. I swallowed hard. Chapter 8 The Sit-In Molly and I were split up into different rooms. It was bare and cold, with only two chairs and a table. The sickly green walls made me feel worse somehow. I shivered, wishing I had been able to wear a sweater. My sports tank and shorts with flip-flops weren't cutting it in here. They left me alone for what felt like a long time. I didn't have my phone on me, I had left it at my trailer, and I didn't have a watch either, so I had no concept of time. Finally, someone came in. Ivy, greeted a grim Armand as he took a seat at the table. He had two cups of coffee with some creamer and a sugar packets. He offered one to me. Why am I here? I asked him, relieved it was just him who was here. I might not always like Armand, but he was a familiar face. I wrapped my cold fingers around the styrofoam cup. Just to answer a few questions, replied Armand. The chief has made this a lot more intimidating than it needs to be. You aren't going to be charged with anything. I sagged in relief. Thank you. I will definitely cooperate. When was the last time you saw Bart Baker? The detective questioned. He opened a notepad and took out a pencil to take notes. Yesterday at the farmer's market, I told him. He showed up at my booth. Why would he do that? asked Armand. He was angry at the attention the celebrity chef was giving me. Fergie, from Fergie's Fiery Kitchen, was touring the market with Mayor Whitcomb, I explained. 
Bart got a little ugly, but he ended up leaving when the mayor promised after the market they would go to the Tasty Treats Bakery to see Bart's food. Was there any strong language? Did Baker make any threats? inquired Armand as he slipped his black coffee. Not really, I shrugged. We might have exchanged a few uncivil words, but I didn't want to be drawn into the drama. I finally asked him to just leave. Yet Bart made a purchase of your brownies, Armand raised an eyebrow. He didn't buy them, I replied in a dry voice. Bart grabbed the package off my table and took it with him. I don't know why. He was found with one of your brownies in his hand, admitted Armand. It had a bite out of it. I stared at him in shock. After Ava's assurances Mitzi Bitby liked to enhance the truth, I had discounted the brownie in Bart's dead hand rumor. You're not serious. It was your package with one brownie missing from the pack. We found it right in his hand, sighed Armand. The brownie is currently being tested at the lab. There is nothing wrong with those brownies, I insisted, then hesitated. Well, except, well, you know, they were all from the same batch of batter and no one else was hurt. It's very suspicious to find out Bart was competing in the same booth at the farmer's market, then ends up dead with one of your brownies in his hand, noted Armand. You know I didn't do anything, I told him firmly. I do know that, Armand acknowledged, because Molly already admitted to me earlier she was the one to bake the brownies, not you. She didn't poison anyone either, I cried in frustration. Otherwise, half the police force would be dead too. I told you, the brownie batter was all one batch. If it were contaminated, everyone who ate brownies yesterday would have been affected. Can you confirm, for the record, Molly was the one to bake the brownies? asked Armand. I stared at him, appalled at what he was asking. You want me to make it so you can arrest my friend, who is innocent of doing anything wrong except making magic brownies? Once the lab reports come back, they will show the brownies weren't the cause of death, reasoned a calm Armand. We're just going to hold her until the labs come back. It would be a couple of days at most. I'm not going to throw my friend under the proverbial bus, I narrowed my eyes. Ramon gave a long-suffering sigh, muttering something which suspiciously sounded like he wasn't surprised at my response. I want a lawyer, I said smugly. I didn't have to talk. I knew my rights. You are not under arrest, pointed out Armand in a dry voice. Then I'm free to go, I guessed. Standing up, I set down the coffee. I can put you in a holding cell for twenty-four hours without charging you, came Armand's mild reply. Are you threatening me? I gasped in indignation. I'm just informing you of what can occur, replied Armand. Why do you need me to say Molly baked the brownies? I wondered in confusion. You said she admitted it right in front of you at the baking booth. My mental state might be in question, muttered Armand. You mean you were high, I stated baldly, annoyed at him. I wonder why, he gave me a sharp look. Who's baking might be to blame. I'm not pointing the finger at Molly, I stoutly declared. Then you get to stay overnight, shrugged an unrepentant Armand. He flipped his notebook closed, putting it in the pencil in his suit jacket pocket. I snapped my mouth shut. He was the most infuriating man. Draining his coffee, Armand headed to the door, opening it, and waited for me with a raised eyebrow. I'll show you the accommodations. You can change your mind at any time. I'm not changing my mind, I asserted as I swept past him out into the hall. Standing as tall as my meager five-foot-two inches in flip-flops would let me, I lifted my chin and gave him a frigid look. I was not going to let him intimidate me. It gets cold in here at night said Armand in an offhand manner as he led me back into the building. We keep the air conditioning on, so we don't have to smell any of the drunk sweat. You're not exactly dressed for this. I tried to ignore him as best as I could, knowing he was probably right, but I wasn't going to give him the satisfaction of an answer. I followed Armand down a corridor. He waved to a police officer who buzzed him through a door, and suddenly we were in an aisle surrounded by four cells, two on each side. Who do we have here? A grungy-looking man who had been sitting on a bench stood up, coming to the bars. 
His beefy hands took hold of the metal. Pretty lady. Be nice, Carl, warned Armand as he opened the cell door. He looked at me expectantly. Twenty-four hours, Ivy. In here. Most of them spent across from Carl. Or you can just admit what both of us already know. Molly baked the brownies. If you sign a statement of what we talked about, you could be home tonight. I stiffened. Then I guess I'm an overnight guest. Armand grimaced. He held the door open a little wider, and I obligingly went in. Behind me, the door shut with a sense of finality. You don't need to do this, he gently reminded me. Yes, I do. I wandered over to the bench. It was worn, but looked clean. The place smelled of strong cleaners. Loyalty is admirable, but not when it could put you in a bad position as well, noted Armand grimly. With that enigmatic thought, he strode down the corridor and out of the jail cell area. I shivered, wrapping my arms around myself and sat on the bench. It was going to be a long, cold, and lonely night. I wondered what was happening to Molly. What did you do? asked Carl as he threaded his arms through the bar, leaning on them. Nothing, I muttered. And that's what they all say, laughed Carl uproariously. I decided not to talk to Carl any more. The door at the end of the corridor opened again, Armand striding in with something dark blue in his hand. He stopped in front of my cell, hanging that something on the bars. It does get cold in here. You're going to want this, he said, eyeing my tank and shorts. Without waiting for a response, he walked away, the door banging loudly behind him. I was cold. The air was blasting out of the air conditioning, and I thought I might even feel a breeze. Getting up, I went to see what he had left me. It was a dark navy hoodie from the police department, the logo emblazoned on the breast and Armand's name on the sleeve. I suppressed a shiver and decided to wear it, even if it was from Armand, with whom I was mad at. Shrugging into the hoodie, I did up the zipper to find it hung halfway in my thighs. Pushing up my sleeves, I went back to the bench. I didn't get any hoodie, came a slightly accusatory statement from Carl as he watched me. I ignored him. I hoped B wasn't too worried about me. Likely, she would be talking to whomever Jepson Gray was and trying to bail me out. The good news is I wasn't technically under arrest. I could only be kept here for a maximum of 24 hours, then the police would have to let me loose. Perhaps I should start investigating Bart's murder. If the police couldn't figure out Molly and I had nothing to do with this, then I needed to get involved and figure out what happened. Reviewing what I already knew, I decided a lot of people probably didn't like Bart Baker. What I needed to figure out was who had a viable motive for wanting Bart dead. Bart's landlord, Horace Retz, wanted to evict Bart for non-payment of rent. They had argued in front of witnesses. Bart was fighting the eviction, drawing it out, and Retz was losing money on his property with Bart still there. Tristan, Bart's brother, was jealous of Bart's role in a play. It didn't seem like something to kill over, but perhaps it wasn't just the only contentious sibling rivalry bit between the pair. I would have to ask more questions to determine if Tristan could have been involved in his brother's murder. The pastry chef from the White Oaks Resort was being blackmailed by Bart. At least, the blackmail rumor was what was currently being told throughout the gossip chain. I would have to make certain the rumor was true. While I wasn't sure how to do that, I figured Thelma and B might have a few theories. I wondered if more people we didn't even know about were displeased with Bart's entitled and bullying attitude. Likely, there would be a long list of suspects. In the middle of my musings, Carl let out a big belch. I wondered what time it was. My stomach let out a rumble, letting me know it had missed supper. I didn't have a watch, nor my phone. I looked around, but did not see any clocks on the walls here. The door at the end of the corridor opened again. This time, a visibly irritated Molly was led down the aisle to the cell past me. I jumped up from the bench, going to the edge of my cell, watching as the police officer put her in the cell next to mine. We waited until he left, before grabbing each other's hands through the bars. This is so scary, I whispered. I had never been arrested or seen the inside of a jail before. While I had taken a couple of rides in cop cars, this was not the same thing at all. There are a lot of bark and no bite here, smiled Molly, but her eyes remained worried. When the lab reports come back stating the brownie doesn't contain any poison, 
then they will have no reason to keep us, I said, trying to reassure both of us. We don't know Bart died of poisoning, remarked Molly. Did they tell you he died of poisoning? I don't know. I tried to remember. Maybe I assumed, from what Armand told me, it was poison. Molly had a huffing laugh. Why is it you get the handsome detective, and all I got was some middle-aged angry cop? I would have traded, I shuddered, remembering Armand's steely gaze boring into mine during the interview. Armand wasn't exactly impressed when I told him I wouldn't turn you in. He wanted you to snitch on me? For what? demanded Molly in consternation. He wanted me to verify you had baked the brownies and signed a statement, I replied. I didn't do it, so now Armand is holding me for twenty-four hours. Afterward, he has either got to press charges or let me go. And then they really do believe the brownie killed Bart, murmured Molly. The brownie didn't kill Bart, so there's nothing to worry about, I responded firmly, squeezing her hands. It's going to be okay. Ivy, Molly looked at me in disbelief, we are in jail. I've been in jail a few times. I have a record for not doing so great of things. Sure, they are all petty stuff. Mostly I paid it back, or did community service, and it was years ago, but it still looks bad to have a record. You didn't have anything to do with Bart's murder, I repeated calmly. Molly, being upset, was making me even more distraught, but I did my best not to show it. Having both of us being overly emotional wouldn't help our situation. The police will figure it out and let us go. I might not always like Armand, but he does a good job at investigating things. Armand isn't the lead investigator, revealed Molly, dropping the bombshell badly. What? I couldn't believe it. As far as I knew, Armand was the only homicide investigator in town. Oaks Crossing was not a very big place. It did not need a huge crime unit to police the population. Since Detective Armand was indisposed at the time the murder was discovered, the chief of police took over the investigation, confided a concerned Molly. I overheard a couple of officers talking. Apparently, everyone here is walking on eggshells since the police chief is still angry about the magic brownies. I looked at her in trepidation. He isn't exactly a fan of ours at the moment. I think he might try to pin this on me, gulped Molly, tears coming to her eyes. Suddenly, I didn't feel as confident in our chances. What is the noise? an irritated Carl suddenly said from where he was lying on his bench in his own cell. He lifted his head, then bellowed, Shut up! Can a person sleep? I listened and could hear a commotion coming from outside. It was getting slowly louder. Molly looked at me in confusion, and I shrugged. The yelling and banging drew even closer. It sounded like it might be a riot outside. Suddenly, a bang sounded against the window of my cell. The window was high up, covered in mesh and of bars. It looked like the end of a ladder had been set against it. Then, a head popped into view, hands cupping around the eyes to see into the building better. Conrad? I spoke in pure disbelief. Conrad's face lit up when he saw me. Don't worry! We will get you out! I could faintly hear him amongst all the clamoring going on outside. Are those Grandma and Grandpas you live with about to break us out of jail? questioned an incredulous Molly. You live with them, too, I mildly pointed out. I hoped they weren't going to try to stage a jail break. I didn't need anyone breaking the law on my behalf. Conrad, what are you doing? I yelled as loud as I could, knowing Conrad was hard of hearing at the best of times. What? hollered Conrad, cupping a hand around his ear. We're having a protest. A sit-in at the police station. They're going to get so sick of us, they'll just let you out to get us to leave. A sit-in, nodded Molly, because that makes total sense. It's better than a jailbreak, I noted, knowing that my seniors were prone to get into trouble. I would have preferred the jailbreak, Riley stated Molly. Jepson Gray is working on the legal side, shouted Conrad. I have to go. We're storming the entry. His head disappeared from view, and I could only hope I wouldn't be seeing my elderly friends become my cellmates here in the jail. Hours later, the singing and banging was still going on outside, and perhaps even inside the building. It was hard to tell. In the meanwhile, we had all retreated to our benches, waiting. Carl was snoring deeply from his cell. I wrapped my hoodie around myself a bit more securely, thankful for its warmth, and curled up on the hard bench. I wished I was back at the campground in bed with Cookie and Cupcake. Leaking roof or not, the camper had become my home. I sighed. 
Tomorrow morning, I was supposed to be meeting with Chaz Bison. Chad owned the Mighty Oaks Christian Campground. When he had heard that I wanted a tree cut down, he had offered to do it for free if he could haul away the firewood for his campground. I had been more than willing to agree to the deal. The tree was the same huge monstrosity which had dropped a branch on the clubhouse, creating the hole in the roof Don Miller was supposed to fix. I hoped Chaz would be able to find the tree without me. It looked like I was staying in jail overnight. Shifting on the hard surface, I closed my eyes and tried to get some sleep. Instead, I had nightmares of moving my stuff into the jail cell because it was my new home, but the bed wouldn't fit through the cell door. Carl and Bart Baker had the cell across from mine. They laughed uproariously at me while I tried to drag the bed inside the cell. Molly was nowhere to be seen. Armand just handed me hoodie after hoodie, saying I would need it. I kept putting them on, even though I was already wearing nearly a dozen of the things making me look like a kid in a puffy snowsuit jacket, which was too large for my body. It was horrible. After a nearly sleepless night, I blearily sat up. My body ached from being on the bench. I was hungry, thirsty, and beyond tired. Carl woke up looking refreshed and ready to start his day. At some point, the noise had died down from the rallying group outside. I realized this was because suddenly the yelling, singing, and clanging began again, as loud as ever. Molly groaned, flinging a hand over her head. A few moments later, Armand came in. He stopped in front of my cell, unlocking the door. When is breakfast around here? asked Carl as Armand ignored him. I quickly got up, coming forward, wondering what was happening. I was wrong, admitted Armand with a wry twist of his lips. Loyalty can sometimes pay off. You are free to go, Ivy. What about Molly? I questioned, my heart in my throat. She is to be released as well, he confirmed. I'm still not going to sign any statement which says I saw Molly bake those brownies, I warned him. Understood, grimaced Armand as he opened my cell door. No signed statements. Now, don't make a big deal out of the release. The chief is not a happy man right now. He wouldn't be releasing either of you if it weren't for the crowd outside making a nuisance. And your lawyer. My lawyer? I asked, a little worried about B's friend. I followed him as he went to unlock Molly's door. Armand had a wry smile. Apparently, he's been doing your case pro bono. He's retired, but the mind is still sharp. I had the feeling that secretly, deep down, Armand kind of liked the old folks in this town. What was all the noise about last night and this morning? As if you didn't know, scoffed Armand as he gave me a disbelieving look. I don't know, I insisted. I just heard a lot of hollering, singing, and banging. Well, get ready to hear it again. Armand waited for Molly to come out, and we walked toward the lobby of the police station. The sound was deafening. Dozens of senior citizens were stuffed into small space, banging lids, metal scoops, with pots and pans. They hollered and sang. They marched around in tiny pressed-together circles. Some had taken out camp chairs, sitting calmly, sharing coffee from thermoses with their neighbors. I spied Agatha knitting and singing as she sat in one of the chairs. "'Ivy!' Bee cried, coming forward to envelop me in a hug. "'I knew we could free you. We staged a sit-in.' We have been here since supper last night, protesting the arrest of you and Molly. Thank you, I said in surprise, patting her lightly on the back. I'm grateful. They're going to let Molly and I go. Success! B let go of me, waving her hands at the crowd. We win! Ivy and Molly are coming back. Don't you dare think you can take our girls again, threatened a bird like Agatha as she got up from the camp chair. She poked a tiny bony finger in Armand's chest. We seniors have voting power. Agatha, I was aghast. I quickly grabbed her hand. You can't assault police officers. Quiet, everyone, a bullhorn bellowed. The chief of police continued to address the crowd. I want all of you out of the building. Miss Thurman is going to sign some paperwork. Then she and her friend will be released. I was hugged by nearly everyone on their way out of the building. This meant it took even longer to get the crowd moving outside. The chief of police was turning an even deeper shade of red, and I wondered if he was going to have a mini meltdown right there. 
This was so much fun, squealed Thelma in my ear as she hugged me. We should do it again sometime. I would prefer not to repeat the experience, I managed as she squeezed me. Thelma trilled a laugh and moved on, chatting with other people from the Happy Camper Resort. It was a swell time, glowed Bertie. He shook my hand and patted my shoulder. Glad you're free again, Ivy. Thank you. Now promise me you will make Conrad stay off ladders, I replied. Can't say that, Bertie responded merrily. Never know when it might come in handy. Here, Ivy, I saved you a cup of morning java, Herb handed me a mug. Coffee, I sighed in delight, taking a zip. Bold flavor hit my tongue and taste buds, nearly making me choke as the whiskey fumes hit my nose. I swallowed my zip down quickly, handing the mug back. Drinking and the police station? What was Herb thinking? Um, the coffee is a little too strong for me. Thank you for offering, Herb. Finally, the group of protesters had exited the building. I turned to find Armand waiting with the paperwork. Don't think you are getting off lightly, Miss Thurman, warned the chief of police. These little stunts of yours are getting out of hand. I might be bowing to public pressure right now, but when I find evidence to put your friend away, I'll personally be making the arrest. She didn't do anything, I protested. Threatening a person isn't very smart, a mild voice reprimanded. In fact, it could prejudice the case should it ever go to court. Get out of my precinct, Jessam, thundered the police chief. Ladies, the items we took from you are right here in this bag, if you will just sign for them, Armand inserted before the two men could argue further. Molly signed, retrieving her phone and some money. I signed for my keys. Chief, you need to see this. A young cop with a round face came hustling forward, waving a set of papers in the air. The lab results are back from the autopsy. It was poison, just as you suspected. Aha! The chief's beady eyes gleamed in satisfaction as they fixed on Molly. He had a wolfish grin as he anticipated arresting her. Chapter 9 an arrest is made. Armand quickly took the paperwork from the rookie cop, scanning it. His lips twitched and his shoulders relaxed. It wasn't the brownie. What? growled the police chief. He snatched the paperwork out of Armand's hand, reading it. He grunted. This doesn't make any sense. Look at page three, suggested Armand. The brownie from the lab test negative for the poison. While it was laced with cannabis, it wasn't deadly. If you go down the list, you'll see there was another food item at the bakery which tested positive. The food item also matches the stomach contents found in the autopsy. The brownie wasn't even consumed by Bart. Molly and Ivy aren't your killers. About time you figured it out, muttered Molly. I gave her an elbow to the ribs, hoping to quiet her. While I was relieved we had been cleared as suspects, I wanted to know what the food item was which had been poisoned, and who might have had access to it. The food might just determine who had killed Bart. Perhaps, if we were quiet enough, they would forget we were here, and say something important to the case. It has been a while since you have handled a homicide, noted Armand quietly. Are you certain you don't want me to at least assist? You are on foot patrol for traffic tickets until further notice, after the stunt at the farmer's market, growled the police chief. See if you can handle it without screwing it up. Armand clenched his teeth. Yes, sir. For a moment I felt a little sorry for Armand. Then I remembered he had locked me in a cell overnight, and the feeling passed. Get these two out of my station. Warren... Get Judge Orr on the phone. I need an arrest warrant made out, barked the police chief before striding away. Who is he going to arrest? I asked Armand a little worriedly. You know I can't tell you, remarked a gloomy Armand, reaching into a pocket to pull out a pack of nicotine gum. However, I doubt you are going to like it. The important part is the two of you are free. We should get going, noted Jepson. He looked at his watch. Marathon of Detective Hemlock is about to start, and I hate to miss any of it. My daughter is picking me up, so she should be outside right now. Thank you, Mr. Gray, for all your help. I shook his hand in appreciation. It was fun, grinned Jepson. 
Not often I get to argue with the police anymore. Molly and I escorted Jepson to his car, making certain he got there safely. After the greys left, Thelma pulled up in her meteor. I thought you could use a ride, suggested a pert Thelma. B was already in the passenger seat, so Molly and I climbed into the back of the vehicle. It was the most fun I've had in ages. It even beats breaking into the White Oaks Golf Course rental shop. You broke into a golf rental shop? questioned Molly in surprise. And I was almost arrested, I sighed, remembering. Armand caught us looking for the murder weapon which had killed Ethel Merle. Thankfully, Al Fricks, the owner of the White Oaks Resort and Golf Club, refused to press charges, and I was let go. You never told me, an indignant Molly said. Not exactly my proudest moment, I retorted mildly. Thank you, Selma and B, for the sit-in. It really helped. I think we could have been there for hours more if you hadn't protested. It was Mabel's idea, confessed B. She's always a bit of a hippie, but it worked. The police chief bowed to public pressure. Why did they keep you over that? questioned Thelma. The police thought my baking had killed Bart, muttered Molly in disgust. It was a magic brownie, not a deadly one. Since it was found in his hand at the crime scene with a bite out of it, they automatically assumed I had murdered the fat doughboy. My eyebrows furrowed as I thought over what Armand had said about the murder. Didn't the lab report say it wasn't any brownie in Bart's stomach? Yeah, so? shrugged Molly. They let you read the lab report? B perked up with interest. We overheard Amon and the chief talking about it, I informed her. So, if Bart didn't eat any of our brownie, why did someone take a bite out of it? It wasn't Bart who bit into it unless he immediately spit it out. That is a great question, mused B. Perhaps someone was trying to frame you. The murderer knew that all the food would have to be tested for poison, if it was the method for how Bart died, objected Thelma. Even I know that much, and I don't watch those crime shows B loves. It would be really silly to try to frame Ivy and Molly with an unpoisoned brownie. Not if they were going to try to make an escape, insisted B. The confusion would give them enough time to leave town. Or maybe Marshmallow just grabbed it out of someone's hand just to be rude, right before he died, muttered Molly. Bart Baker is like a dough which has too much yeast. Useless, and it just keeps expanding and flowing in the heat. Do you think Bart saw his killer before he died? Maybe the killer bit into the brownie, an excited Thelma exclaimed. I wonder what the poison was in. I contemplated the odd case. Whatever it was in is key to the investigation. Armand said I wasn't going to like it when the police arrested their next suspect. They have a suspect? Question B. Who? Armand wouldn't tell us, I replied. The police are getting an arrest warrant as we left. Maybe we should hang out in front of the police station and see who they arrest, suggested B. Please, I begged them. I would love a hot shower, some food, and a real bed. Can we just wait for the rumor mill to bring us the news of who is being arrested for the murder of Bart? I promise, after I've had some sleep, I will be more in the mood for discussing this. I second the motion, agreed Molly tiredly. This has been a roller coaster. I seriously thought the cops were going to be lazy and just pin the whole thing on me. We had Jepson, so that wouldn't happen, explained Thelma. We knew he could get you out with all the legal mumbo-jumbo he knows. I thought he was doing it pro bono, I frowned in confusion. I really couldn't afford to pay lawyer fees on top of everything else. We bribed him with your baking, informed B. He you owe him treats for the month. He's partial to anything a little spicy, or rum cake in particular. You make a good rum cake, nodded Molly with a yawn. Sure, I readily conceded. Baking seemed a much safer way to pay the debt I owed him. Thelma and B dropped Molly off at her camper and then me at mine. I was informed Herb had been taking care of Cookie and Cupcake between his shifts at the police station for the protest. During Herb's shift, Conrad had looked after the pair of doggies. I don't know what I would do without everyone here, I said truthfully, feeling a little emotional. Everyone at the Happy Camper Resort had become my family, taking care of me and helping me. I couldn't do this without all of you. Oh, pooh, exclaimed B. Don't you get all emotional. Then Thelma will start to cry and ruin her makeup. It takes days for her to make herself look perfect. Don't undo her hard work. Look, Conrad is coming with the dogs, pointed out Thelma as she wiped a tear. You had better go say hi to them. The little creatures must have missed you. I got out of the car and hugged my two little Boston Terriers. Cupcake happily danced and licked me while Cookie tolerated the attention. 
I missed you so much. Thank you for taking care of them, Conrad. It's too bad I didn't get to see them free you at the station, said Conrad as he handed over the leashes. However, someone had to take care of our mascots. Between Herb, Mabel, and I, we did okay. Thank you again, I reiterated, giving the surprised tiny man a hug. Conrad patted my shoulder uncomfortably. You had better have a nap. When women get tired, they get overly emotional. Go on with you. I figured it was Conrad's way of saying you're welcome. With a watery smile, I unlocked my camper and set about to having a shower, new clean clothes, then fell into bed with my cuddly mascots. An insistent knocking awoke me. Cookie immediately sat up straight, trying to stare out the window with a low growl in her voice. Cupcake jumped off the bed, then bounced onto the seat of the dinette set so she could see outside and bark joyously at the commotion. Groaning, I looked at my phone for the time, but found the battery was dead. Rolling out of bed, I pushed back my hair, and after shushing the dogs, I opened the door. A tearful Ava looked up at me. Ivy, I need your help. Ava, what's wrong? I asked, motioning for her to come into my camper. Come inside. She sniffed, pressing a wet tissue to her eyes as she sat down at my dinette. The police have arrested Jackson. I stared at her in shock. What? You know Jackson Grubbs, she explained. The guy who runs the produce and honey stand at the farmer's booth? He also owns Grubbs Fresh Farm Produce. It's a small farm just outside of town. I've met Jackson, yes, I nodded. I couldn't imagine the nice, friendly guy who had defended me against Tom Frick just last month being arrested. What happened? They charged him with the murder of Bart Baker. Ava shook her head in consternation. I just don't understand. Jackson wouldn't hurt anyone. He's the nicest guy I know. We've been friends since preschool, and I know him. There has to be some mistake. No wonder Armand had warned me I wouldn't like it when the police made the arrest of their newest suspect. Jackson Grubbs wasn't a murderer. I agree, I told her. It can't be Jackson. Ava had a watery sigh. I want to hire you to investigate. You can prove Jackson is innocent. Ava, I warned her, I'm not a professional investigator. You solved Ethel Murley's murder, she insisted. You can do this. Jackson needs you. I was entirely by accident, I told Ava. Tawny's cat Winifred should get the credit. I found the cat, but without Winnie, we wouldn't have known for certain what happened to Ethel. Please, Ivy, begged Ava, starting to cry in earnest. I don't know what else to do. Jackson will have a lawyer, but the police must have some sort of proof, even if the evidence is wrong. I need you to dig around and find out who really killed Bart. I took her hand, giving it a squeeze. I'll try, but you're not paying me since I don't know how much help I will be. Thank you, Ivy. I knew I could count on you, replied a relieved Ava. I offered her a box of tissues. Now, I'm going to make you a cup of tea. Gather your thoughts, and once we have the tea, you can tell me everything you know about what happened with Jackson's arrest, okay? Ava nodded, trying to rein in her emotions. She blew her nose while I set the water on to boil and put out a couple of mugs. I chose chamomile tea, hoping it would calm Ava down a little. After pouring the tea, I put out a package of lemon snaps left over from the market. Here. Taking a seat across from her, I waited for Ava to gather her thoughts. I was painting at the farm, Ava cleared her throat, taking a sip of tea. I do that sometimes. Just go and paint outside the, the Grubbs farm. The place is peaceful, and I can find my creative center there. My shop is closed on Mondays, so I can get extra commission jobs and projects like this done. She paused, and I waited patiently for her to continue. Jackson was spraying the lettuce for bugs. The farm is all organic, and he had a special mix he makes himself from non-harmful products like soap and spices, Ava assured me. She took a tissue and began shredding it to pieces. The police came. They had a search warrant. They looked all over the farm. Then there was commotion in the shed. Afterward, the police arrested Jackson and took him away. Do you know what the police found in the shed? I asked gently. Ava nodded in distress. I didn't see it, but I could hear Jackson say something about a pesticide. He was objecting, saying he had never seen it before. Jackson's farm is organic. He doesn't use harsh chemicals. If the pesticides were sprayed on his property, he could lose his organic standing. The police thought Bart had been poisoned, and pesticides contained poisons. I hesitated. Did Jackson ever fill orders for the Tasty Treats Bakery? I would presume so, shrugged Ava helplessly. 
He does a lot of deliveries for businesses around Oaks Crossing. It meant Jackson would have the opportunity and the murder weapon. However, did he have any motive? I privately wondered. Why would the police think Jackson would want to murder Bart Baker? I mused, cupping my chin in my hand as I thought about it. Did they argue? No, I, I don't think so, responded Ava uncertainly. Jackson doesn't like to argue with people. Bart isn't the nicest of persons, but not liking someone isn't a reason to kill them. Did Bart owe Jackson money? I pressed gently. If the rumors were true, Bart had a lot of money issues. I'm not sure, again Ava shrugged. If the orders aren't paid after a certain amount of time, Jackson just stops delivering new food items until the customer's paid back up to date. I'm sure money wasn't an issue. It didn't make sense. I personally couldn't think why Jackson Grubbs would want to kill Bart Baker. Unless the police knew something we didn't, there was no motive for this murder. Ava, I'm going to need you to visit Jackson. We need to know everything he knows, what his lawyer is saying, what the official charges are, and what evidence the police have against him. In the meanwhile, I'm going to find out as much as I can about Bart Baker. Thank you, a reassured Ava said. I feel so much better with you helping. Jackson means the world to me, and I know he's innocent. There was a knocking at my door. Cupcake and Cookie barked a welcome, so I knew it was someone from the campground. I opened the door to find Thelma, Bee, and Conrad outside. Did you hear? asked Thelma in concern. I just can't quite believe it. The police in this town have certainly lost their common sense. It's an outrage, that's what it is. Ava's car is outside, a practical bee stated. I'm sure Ivy knows Jackson Grubbs has been arrested. Ridiculous, sniffed Conrad. Anyone who knows Jackson knows the boy never uses pesticides. Once he had slugs on Grubbs' farm. He called up old Carmichael and borrowed the man's flocks of ducks to eat the slugs. Afterwards, Jackson returned the ducks fatter for the experience. No, he would never use a pesticide. How did you know it was a pesticide used in the murder method? I asked in surprise. I had it from Mrs. Hemble, declared B. She was picking up her weekly grocery order at the farm. I looked at Ava to confirm this. She might have been there, replied Ava uncertainly. Truth be told, I'm not sure. I know someone was picking up produce, but I was so upset over the police and Jackson, I just didn't pay attention. It's understandable, honey, said Thelma as she entered my camper. She took a seat beside Ava, wrapping an arm around her shoulders. Conrad, would a pesticide kill Bart so quickly, I wondered. Conrad and B took over the other seat in my dinette, and I made more tea for everyone. A lot of pesticides contain strychnine. Typically, it takes 15 minutes to an hour for symptoms to appear. Then death is a slow process as the body's muscles spasm uncontrollably. Conrad scratched his chin, putting his experience as a former coroner to good use. However, Bart wasn't exactly in the best of shape. If he had any heart troubles, he might have died quicker. What sort of symptoms? I wondered, thinking back to the farmer's market when Bart had confronted me in front of Fergie. Would sweating a lot be one of the symptoms? Sure, agreed Conrad, taking the symptoms off his fingertips. Sweating, agitation, jaw tightness, difficulty breathing, muscle soreness, rigidity in the arms and legs, and arching of the back and neck. Then the muscle spasms set in. If the dose ingested is high enough, the victim could have respiratory failure or brain death. Strychnine poisoning is not a nice way to die. I shuddered. As much as I hadn't liked Bart, I would never want anyone to die in such a way. That's awful. Why do you ask about the sweating? questioned B with curiosity. When Bart was at the farmer's market in the morning of his death, he was sweating a lot, I explained. I know he was agitated about the whole baking contest for the booth. The agitation might be explained away, but the sweating can't. I think Bart was also a little stiff-legged as he left, but that might be my imagination. Then we have got a possible timeline, a satisfied Conrad concluded. Within the hour before Bart came to your booth, he may have been poisoned. It was in a food item, I recalled from the lab reports. Something Bart had eaten was laced with the poison. Whatever he had eaten would have to be pretty sweet to counteract the bitter taste of strychnine, revealed B. At our looks of surprise, she elaborated. In the poisoned pedestrian, the killer used strychnine. He was giving out samples of candy to random people, and the detectives in the book had a ridiculously hard time figuring out who the killer was. 
You should read it. I would rather not, a subdued Ava sipped her tea. B patted her hand. I'm sorry, dear. I sometimes get a little carried away. Who all has access to pesticides, I asked. Almost everyone, explained Conrad. You can pick up a container at the local hardware store. It was not encouraging information, I decided. Look, trying to find the poison itself is a lost cause, responded Conrad. It probably was from the container they found at Grubb's farm. Jackson said the container wasn't his, insisted Ava. It isn't his, agreed Conrad. It doesn't mean it wasn't planted by our killer. In fact, I doubt the police will find any fingerprints on the container. No, we can't focus on the poison. So we focus on the food the poison was in and finding out who would want Bart Baker dead, I concluded. It could be a long list, warned Thelma. I grabbed a pen and paper. Then let's get started. Chapter 10. Investigating. We all divided up with our duties. Conrad was going to see if he could find out from the newest coroner what might be the food that was used to carry the poison which had killed Bart Baker. Ava was going to visit Jackson and find out what she could from him to help us in the investigation. We all agreed she would be there for Jackson's emotional support. Thelma was going to revive the sit-in at the police station. It was a start to raise awareness to the police that the community did not believe Jackson was responsible for the death of Bart. Once the protest was organized and in motion, Thelma would hand it over to Mabel and help in the investigation again. B was going to investigate around and see if she could come up with a complete list of suspects. I was going to interview the suspects we already had. First on my list was the landlord, Horace Retz. Horace owned several buildings in the downtown area of Oaks Crossing. He was known to maintain his properties to a high degree and expected tenants to pay in full and on time. I tried to schedule an appointment under the guise of looking for a building to rent, but all Horace had were a couple of apartments available at this time. I dragged Molly along, saying she was looking for a place to stay. While Molly was commenting on closet space, I was commenting on how terrible it was Bart Baker had died in the Tasty Treats Bakery. Do you think you will have any trouble renting the space because of the incident? Horace gave me a sour look. I have a renter for the business lined up for months. There's a shortage of good space in the downtown core, so I'm not worried at all about renting the shop. Will it still be a bakery? I tried to be subtle in my questions, but was afraid I wasn't doing the best job of it. I'm opening a catering business and would like to know how much competition is in Oaks Crossing. It will still be the Tasty Treats Bakery, grunted Horace. Bart's business partner, Maurice Lalonde, will be continuing the operations. Maurice is a pastry chef. I didn't know Bart had a business partner, I mentioned, deciding I would have to talk to Maurice as well. You're new to in Oaks Crossing, remarked Horace. I expect you don't know a lot of things. The water pressure's very good here, acknowledged Molly as she rummaged around the kitchen. I decided to be a bit more blunt. It worked for Armand. Why couldn't it work for me? I heard you had an argument with Bart in the street recently. Was it about all the money he owed you? I heard you are a wannabe amateur sleuth, he retorted coldly. If you and your friend are done wasting my time, I have better things to do. Obviously, Horace wasn't going to respond to a simple question. I decided on a different tactic. Jackson Grubbs is a friend of mine. I don't believe he killed Bart Baker. If you know anything which might lead to the real killer, I would appreciate it if you told us or the police. Bart owed me money. But the last thing I would do is kill him in my building. That sort of thing gets tenants and locals apprehensive about ghosts and such. It can make a property difficult to rent out, grimaced Horace. It would make more sense for his business partner or someone else to kill Bart. Not many people liked the fellow. Besides, how would I get what he owed me if I killed him? The plan was to sue him for all the equipment inside and charge Maurice a higher rent for including the equipment when he took over the business. Now I have to wait to find out what happens to the estate to see if I can buy the stuff. Bart's making me poorer for his death. I thanked Horace for his time, apologizing for the fake apartment hunt. I believed him when he said he hadn't killed Bart. Molly and I headed for the Tasty Treats Bakery, but the scene was still taped off by the police. I wish I could have a look at the area where Bart had died. Perhaps a clue had been overlooked. However, I knew the police weren't about to give me access. 
"'I just wish they could be done,' groused a voice beside me as a man came to stand nearby. He folded his arms, frowning at the building. "'The longer the tape is up, the worse it will be to restart the business.' "'Maurice? Maurice Lalonde?' I questioned. He had a slight French accent, was short with curly black hair and a large nose. "'Maurice would be me,' he nodded. "'Tell me, you wouldn't happen to be Ivy, the one who won against Bart for the farmer's market baking booth?' "'I am,' I confirmed. Bart wasn't too impressed with me. "'Ha! That is putting it lightly,' exclaimed Maurice. "'He was, how do you say, hopping mad.' The man is not easy to get along with at the best of times, but you made Bart terribly angry. I'm sorry. It must have been difficult for you being his business partner, I gently pried. Bah! Maurice shrugged and shook his head. We were barely partners any more. Bart wanted different things. He was chasing fame and fortune. I am happy here with my little shop. Now Bart is dead, I can continue in peace. I gave him a sharp look of surprise. "'Did you have anything to do with Bart's death?' asked a blunt Molly. Maurice looked at her in astonishment. "'Moi? No, no, child. I was already in the process of legally removing Bart from the business. It was only a matter of time before he was out of my life anyways. Why should I kill? And in my store, where I hope to have customers, bad for business it is. No, I did not kill Bart.' While it appeared no love had been lost between the former business partners, I had to agree it made no practical sense for Maurice to kill Bart if he was telling the truth. It would be very unlikely Maurice was going to kill Bart when he had already taken steps to legally remove Bart from the business. "'Poison is a woman's weapon,' murmured Maurice, his eyes on the Tasty Treats bakery. "'You think a woman killed Bart?' questioned Molly. "'We didn't have a single woman on our suspect list.' I looked at Maurice with interest. "'I am hesitant to say,' responded Maurice with a sigh. "'I would not like to get anyone into trouble if they have done nothing wrong.' "'Jackson Grubbs is in jail, and he shouldn't be. We know he's innocent. "'Any information you might have might help to free Jackson,' I replied, gently pleading Jackson's case. Maurice thought about it before he reluctantly nodded. He pulled a framed photo out of his satchel, handing it to me. I took it off the bakery wall. I didn't want the police to see it, but perhaps I was wrong to do so. Molly and I studied the picture. It was a class picture, everyone wearing chef's coats. A much younger Bart could be easily spotted front and center. What are we looking for? Fergie. Maurice pointed to an overweight braces wearing it with orange frizzy hair girl. Molly Francesca Colander. They were in the same culinary school class. When they were at the farmer's market, Fergie acted like she had never met Bart before, I mentioned, surprised by the revelation. I suspect she would prefer to give her previous life under wraps, shrugged Maurice. Fergie was worked very hard to get the image she has today. She also did not graduate culinary school as she claims. Shortly after this photo, she was kicked out of the program. I was told Bart might have something to do with her expulsion. If this were revealed to the public, Fergie could lose everything. It would be a shame if it were to happen. She is exceptionally talented. Why was she kicked out, I wondered. Murray shrugged again, lifting a shoulder. I am not certain. Perhaps you should ask her. The police have questioned she and her camera crew remain in the Oaks Crossing for a few days. I think she is staying at the Bluebells Revered and Breakfast. Molly pulled out her phone. Would you mind if we took a picture of this photo? Then you can give it to the police. Maurice allowed us to take a picture of the framed photograph before putting it back in his satchel. Sighing again, he waved a hand in the air. What a waste. Bart was extraordinarily talented, but let greed get the best of him. It is shameful. With that said, Maurice walked away, leaving Molly and I on the sidewalk. What do you think? I asked Molly. I think we should find out how the legal battle between Bart, Maurice, and Horace is doing. Molly cocked her head to the side, twirling a piece of blue hair around her finger as she thought. If Bart was winning, it could be a reason for either or even both of them to kill him. Plus, Maurice would have known Bart's routine and where to place the poison in the most likely spot where Bart would eat it. I wish we knew exactly what had been the poison food Bart ate, I said in frustration. I hope Ava can find out the information from Jackson. 
How is it going to help us? wondered Molly. What difference does it make to know how he was poisoned? I think it does help us to know, I insisted. If we knew for certain someone had planted the poison in Jackson's food, we would be able to figure out when and where the poisoning took place. Once we know that information, we can find out if our suspects have alibis which would prove their innocence. Molly nodded, convinced by my argument. How do we find out? The only way I can think of is if Jackson knows, then he can tell Ava, I shrugged. In the meanwhile, all we can keep doing is asking questions. Shall we visit Fergie? asked Molly, raising an eyebrow. I think we should, I agreed. I didn't know where the Bluebell bed and breakfast was. The Oaks Crossing Weekly newspaper office was nearby, so we decided to ask for directions from there. We entered the office and waited patiently for a thin young man with a pencil behind his ear to come over and greet us. Oaks Crossing Weekly, he smiled in greeting, his Adam's apple bobbing in his long neck. My name is Gordon. How can I help you? Hi, I politely responded. We were wondering how to get to the Bluebell's bed and breakfast. Would you be able to give us directions? Gordon grabbed a small map of the town, which was printed out on the back of a paper. Using his pencil, he set a mark on the map. Right now, you are here. If you go down the street and turn left at Pleasant Avenue, the Bluebell's is right here. Thank you, I said gratefully. Can I keep this paper? Absolutely, he affirmed. There are coupons from the local businesses on the back. While you are in town, you should check some of them out. The Sunken Oaks Diner is having a lunch special this week. Personally, I love the diner soups and sandwiches. I'm aware of the Sunken Oak, I replied as I took the map. I own the Happy Camper Resort just outside of town. You must be Ivy Thurman, Gordon said in delight. Can I get a quote from you? Excuse me? I asked in confusion. Why would you need a quote? I had a person put in a complaint to the editorial section about your campground, explained Gordon. I was wondering what your response would be. Since I don't know what the complaint is, I can hardly respond, I noted dryly. Here, Gordon grabbed a tablet, bringing up letters to the editor file. Selecting the right file, he showed me the letter in question. I read the complaint, frowning over the letter. Dear Editor, Never again will I try to book a family vacation at the Happy Camper Resort. I called because there was no other campground that had an opening for my large family reunion which was going to take place this week. I had heard the Happy Camper Resort was under new management, but imagine my disappointment when a cranky old man took my call. He informed me they had no suitable sites for our large RVs unless we wanted to cut the grass ourselves. The pool was closed and so was the clubhouse. Even with all that, I was still willing to book because we had nowhere else to go for our event. Then the old man told me the owner was in jail. How awful! What is the town of Oaks Crossing coming to? Sincerely, won't be visiting again. My jaw clenched, and I thought of all the bad press this letter was going to give my little resort. Is it true you were in jail? inquired Gordon with bated breath as he grabbed a notepad, his pencil hovering over the paper. Molly grabbed the tablet, quickly skimming the letter. Yes, I managed. I was an overnight guest at the Oaks Crossing Police Station. Why were you there? asked Gordon. You aren't going to print this, questioned a direct Molly, putting the tablet back on the counter. This letter is anonymous. Anyone could make a complaint, including false ones. Gordon blinked at her. We verify the person's personal details, but take them out before printing. The letters to the editor are an immensely popular section. I can imagine, I remarked darkly especially when people don't have their names attached to their complaints. Personally, I don't know of anyone who tried to book at my resort for a family reunion. Why were you in jail? repeated Gordon as he scribbled a note. Oaks Crossing's finest are incompetent and tend to accuse people of crimes without credible evidence, inserted annoyed Molly. The police kept both of us overnight without charging us for anything. Then we were let go the next morning. If you were a proper news person, you would know all about the protests that happened at the police station to set Ivy free. I thought it was a sit-in for Jackson Grubbs, responded Gordon. They have made t-shirts would say, Free Grub! I guess the printer accidentally left off the S in the last name. Makes it a bit confusing for the tourists. You see, the police have arrested an innocent man, asserted an indignant Molly. This is your story. First they detained us for no legitimate reason. Now they have arrested Jackson while the real murderer is at large in the town. Why would you waste valuable space in your newspaper on a silly complaint when there is a dead body and a murder to solve? 
I follow up on everything, proudly declared Gordon. Even silly complaints, as you call them. Here is my response for your paper. I leaned in a little. Yes, I was in jail. I was detained by the police and kept overnight without any charges being brought against me. I was released the next morning. I am unaware of this booking. However, if the author of this letter wishes to rebook the reunion, I am willing to do so at a discounted rate. Also, I can assure you the grass will be cut. Repairs are currently being made to the clubhouse, and yes, the pool is closed, but we have a lovely beach access to the lake. The Happy Camper Resort is open for business. With that said, I swept out of the newspaper office, head held high. Oh, growled Molly as she kept up to my quick strides. What an annoying little celery stick he is. All crunchy, but not satisfying the least. Wasn't he supposed to do an article on who won the baking booth? I didn't see any mention of it. I don't want to talk about it. I groused, irritated. Someone had maligned my poor little campground in the local paper. Sure, the Happy Camper Resort was not up to standards and desperately needed repairs. However, it was my home, and I had come to love the place, despite its deficiencies. A bad review could mean less business, something I needed so I could continue the repair process. I know, exclaimed Molly. We'll get other people to write a ton of great reviews for your park. Then it will outweigh the one bad review. I sighed. The person who wrote the letter might have a point. Conrad isn't exactly the greatest at customer service, but he's been volunteering time at the office, so I let him continue. Plus, I need to get things repaired and updated. There's a whole list of improvements which need to be done, but not enough time. Camping season has started, and I'm behind. Maybe all the rest of the resort can help, suggested Molly. How? I had a little laugh. Well, I know Conrad would volunteer to go fix a roof. I can't let him. So many of the jobs are physical, and as you've pointed out, I do live with a bunch of grandmas and grandpas. I love my senior citizens, and I know they would help, but it's too much for them. Maybe not the painting, or the planting, or watering, Molly listed off some ideas. If you have a riding lawnmower, they could take turns. What if we made up a chore chart, like parents do with little kids? We could rotate them through the office. In return, they would get a small portion off their rent, or you could give them a rent freeze, since the improvements you ought to be charging more. A chore chart isn't a bad idea, I mused, if they will agree to it. They want to help you, Ivy, interjected Molly. These old people have adopted you. Why don't you see what skills everyone actually has, and then try to tap into those skills? It does make sense, I decided. I would enlist the crew at the Happy Camper Resort to come up with usable suggestions. We walked to the Bluebell's bed and breakfast, since it was such nice weather. On the way, we passed the police station, and sure enough, I could see a crowd of senior citizens all sporting t-shirts saying, Free Grub! Someone had set up a small stage, complete with karaoke equipment, set as loud as the equipment could handle. The noise was deafening as people clapped, cheered, and sang along. Many had lawn chairs and were eating lunch while visiting. People were going in and out of the police station in a line, holding placards or banging pots and pans. Vehicles honked their horns as they drove past the parade of protesters. It was organized chaos. Thelma cheerily waved at me before rejoining the line. <laughs> Molly snickered. Never mess with the G-Maws and G-Paws. Soon enough, we were at the Bluebell's bed and breakfast. A pretty wooden sign declared the large blue house a historical treasure and inn for travelers. A variety of flowers, all blue, graced the immaculate landscaping. A large wooden porch wrapped round the large Victorian. The house is very pretty, I noted. Sure, if you like that sort of thing, shrugged an unimpressed Molly. The inside was as immaculate as the outside. Wooden surfaces shone with care, and even the doilies on the tables were starched. A teenager in a crisp blue apron appeared behind the desk. Can I help you? Hi, I greeted her. I was told Fergie was staying here. I would like to talk to her if I could. I'm sorry, we don't divulge guest information, she sweetly replied. I really can't help you. Okay, inserted Molly. How about instead we give you a message, and you can take it to Fergie if she is here? Then you can decide if she would like to talk to us. I'm sorry, she told us. As I said, I can't help you. You wouldn't even give her a note? questioned a surprised Molly. A lot of people have come by, believing the rumor Fergie might be staying here. With regret, she spoke, shrugging her shoulders. If I accepted notes from everyone, we would have hundreds. Molly huffed, and I was stumped. 
How were we going to talk to Fergie if we couldn't contact the culinary star? Thanks for your help, I said to the girl before turning away from the desk. Or lack thereof, muttered Molly. Don't be rude, I admonished in a hushed voice. We might still need her help. Molly rolled her eyes, and we walked out to the large veranda. It was a nice place, I reflected, trying to think of a solution to our problem. What are we going to do? complained Molly. If Fergie hides in her room, we might never see her before she leaves town. Then we'll never get to question her about Bart's death. Thankfully, no one was on the porch to hear her. A pizza delivery guy walked past us holding four boxes and a bag full of various cans of soda. A slip of paper fell off the top of his boxes and I quickly picked it up, handing it to the guy so he wouldn't have to bend with his arms full. Thanks, he grunted. I need the room number, else the inn won't let me deliver. Celebrity guests are the worst. Before I could just drop off the food at the desk, now I have to bring it to the room and they don't even tip well. My mind formed an idea as he went inside to deliver his food. They have to eat, right? I smiled. What if we come back with a bunch of baking? We would get to deliver it right to Fergie's room. You heard pizza guy, responded Molly. Delivery only if you have the room number. It was on the slip of paper, I smugly replied. The only celebrity I know of in town is Fergie, which means she has to be in room 4B. Well, then we'd better get some baking done, enthused Molly. Chapter 11 Questioning a Celebrity I was in the kitchen putting the final touches on a tray of baked goods for Fergie and her camera crew, when Molly had an unexpected call from our previous employer. The diner called to say she could pick up her last paycheck. Molly borrowed my car and would be gone to the city for the rest of the day. Conrad came to join me in the kitchen. "'There you are!' exclaimed Conrad. "'I have been looking all over for you.' "'You could have called,' I mentioned, plastic wrapping the tray. "'I need one of those tracking apps they have these days,' grumbled Conrad. "'Then I wouldn't know where everyone is.' You could still use the phone, I remarked, or text. I prefer to talk in person. That's what's wrong with today's culture. They need to rebuild the human connection, complained Conrad as he snatched an extra square, popping it into his mouth. This is good. Now, I went and had lunch with the new coroner. Nice old school type of guy. He just travels in from the city as needed. He wouldn't give out too many details, but I was able to confirm it is strychnine poisoning and a bad heart which killed Bart. He was a ripe candidate for a heart attack, and it was brought on by the contractions of the muscles from the poison. The poison was in the pesticide, I asked. For sure, nodded Conrad. The lab is analyzing the pesticide found on Grubb's farm. It contains the poison. I doubt there will be any fingerprints on the container, but if it had any happened to be there, the lab will find them. Did you find out what type of food the poison was in? I questioned. Nope, shrugged Conrad. The coroner wouldn't tell me that. I gather it was a fruit of some sort. Also, funny thing, Bart hadn't eaten the bite from the brownie which was found in his hand. Police are trying to get a dental workup from the brownie, but I doubt it will work. A brownie is too soft of a material to get a good imprint from. It just seems weird someone would take a bite of my brownie and place it in Bart's hand, I mused. People do strange things, noted Conrad as he finished off the baked good. I've seen a lot of strangeness over the years of my profession. Who is the tray for? For Fergie, I explained. I'm hoping to use it as an excuse to get to her room so I can question her. Who is Fergie? wondered Conrad, his brow lowered in confusion. She's the television chef who was in town for the farmer's market. She and Mayor Whitcomb found Bart's body, I answered as I wrote out a fake receipt for the baked goods. I have heard she's staying at the Bluebells, and I would like to know what she saw when they found Bart. Also, she might just be a suspect. Apparently, Bart and Fergie had some past history. The plot thickens, nodded Conrad before he winced. Now I sound like B in her mystery novels. I had a little laugh. I'm sure B would take it as a compliment. Speaking of B, have you seen her around? Nope. Conrad shook his head. I expect she's still talking to the gossips in town, trying to see who they think might have killed Bart. Did you say it was Mabel's niece who worked with the chef at the White Oaks Resort? I inquired. 
Her name is Wanda, affirmed Conrad. She's the one who overheard the argument between the chef and Bart. I should talk to her as well, I decided. First, though, I need to get to Fergie before she leaves town. Good luck with that, Conrad snatched an extra square before I put them away in the fridge. I'm heading over to the protest. I heard Will Knapp is taking requests for karaoke, and I do like to hear the man sing. Karaoke? I asked in surprise. Sure, gotta keep the people entertained so they will stay, noted Conrad. Keeps the sit-ins alive. <laughs> That's a good plan, I conceded. Thalma and Mabel are pros at organizing these sorts of things, nodded Conrad. Can you give me a lift to town? I requested, picking up the tray of baking. I lent the bug to Molly. Of course, replied Conrad. Soon enough, we were in his old Lincoln town car, arriving in Oaks Crossing. Conrad dropped me off at the Bluebell's bed and breakfast. I went directly to the front counter, holding my tray of baked goods. Hi, I have a delivery for room 4B. The teenage girl remembered me and gave a doubtful look, picking the receipt up off the tray. Excuse me a moment. She picked up the phone, waiting before quietly talking to someone on the other end. A couple of seconds later, she hung up and handed the receipt back to me. Four B is down the hall and to your left, she told me. Thank you, I replied evenly, hoping to keep the satisfaction out of my voice. Obviously, she had called the room to confirm the order, and whoever picked it up had simply been pleased with the thought of more food, not questioning no one had actually put the order in. I quickly made my way down the hall, hoping my little gamble would pay off, and I wasn't giving away free food to a complete stranger. Just in case, I took the receipt, crumpling it up and putting it into one of my jean pockets. Knocking on the door, I waited in suspense. A guy opened the door. I recognized him as one of the people who had followed Fergie around the farmer's market. I thought he was the one who had been holding the boom mic. His eyes lit up as he saw the tray. Hi, I'm Ivy, I introduced myself. Here are some complimentary baked goods. Nice! I'm Connor, he told me, practically salivating over the tray. You can set it on the table right there. I came into the room, which looked like a tornado of clothes and equipment had been through. I could see empty pizza boxes, empty cans of soda, filming equipment, and a bunch of clothing strewn about. I nudged the boxes of pizza aside to make way for the tray of baked goods. What's this? Fergie came out of a side room, looking at the baked goods, then at me. Are you the girl from the farmer's market? The one who got in an argument with Baker from the Tasty Treats Bakery? Ivy Thurman, I reminded her. I brought a tray of baked goods for you and the crew. That was nice of you, she murmured. Fergie didn't look quite the same without a full face of makeup. She seemed more vulnerable and younger. Fergie wore a short silk robe and a dark floral print. Pushing some clothes aside, she sat at the sofa. The mic guy tore off the plastic wrap, helping himself to a square. Did you bake any more brownies? Like the ones you had at the farmer's market? I didn't know edibles were legal in this state. I sighed. They are illegal, but I'm not selling them. It was a mistake. Too bad. They were excellent, he mentioned, mouthful as he grabbed another treat. I heard you discovered the body, I mildly remarked. If I hadn't been watching for Fergie's reaction, I wouldn't have seen the slight shudder roll through her body at the mention of death. It was horrible, she whispered. I couldn't believe it. It was like filming an episode of Cops, another film crew member came in, taking from the baked goods tray. Highlight of my career. Connor looked like he had a hard time swallowing the rest of what was in his mouth. He quickly grabbed a half-empty soda can, sipping from it, pale under his tan. I wonder if he had choked, yet he seemed to be okay. Someone told me Bart was found with one of my brownies in his hand, I revealed with just a touch of worry in my voice, trying to be believable. I hope it's not true. It would be bad for my business. It was a brownie in his hand, confirmed Connor in a voice a little above a coarse whisper. I would show you the film, but the police confiscated it, offered filming guy, flipping his long blonde locks out of his face. Too bad. I think our producer would have loved it. Fergie shuddered again. I feel sorry for the man. All he wanted was to get on a baking show and have a little fame. Now he's dead and no one really knows why. I think you might know why, I said cautiously. What do you mean? She gave me a sharp look. I pulled out my phone. Molly had sent me the picture she had taken of class photo with Bart and Fergie in it. I showed it to Fergie. She gasped. He's the Bart Baker I went to school with? 
I didn't even recognize him. He has put on so much weight. It was true Bart had gained some girth since the class photo, but he wasn't unrecognizable in my opinion. You both have a, had a history together. It's true, shrugged Fergie. We went to culinary school together. Bart was very talented, but he couldn't get past how not everyone shared the same palate as him. He kept trying to put vegetables like asparagus in his baking. It was awful. His brash attitude didn't win him any favors either. We weren't friends, nor were we enemies. We just happened to be in the same class. I was told you didn't graduate, I revealed. I was told it was because of something Bart did. I graduated, growled Fergie in exasperation. Not at this particular school, but at another. Yes, I was kicked out of the program, along with several other students. It was a harmless prank on the teacher. How was I supposed to know he's allergic to turmeric? It's not like turmeric is a common allergy. How we were to know he would end up in the hospital? Why doesn't anyone know about this? Filming guy asked with interest. It could add a whole new layer to your persona. There are some things the public doesn't need to know, retorted Fergie before she sighed in exhaustion. Rather like I'm sure Miss Thurman doesn't want the public to know she got me and my filming crew high on magic brownies. There was a brief gap in the conversation before I admitted, You're right. I would prefer it wasn't public knowledge. See, softly said Fergie, people might think the wrong thing. I was in the running for first in class. After I was kicked out, Bart naturally got the honor of first in class. However, I don't have any ill will toward him. I should actually thank him. If he hadn't gone to my next culinary school, I would never have gone down the path that I have and become the star that I am. Strangely enough, I believed her when she said she had no animosity toward Bart. You should go, inserted Connor quietly. You have upset her. He opened the door to the hall, waiting for me to exit. Those were some superb brownies, film guy mentioned. Fergie's eyes were clouded as she turned away from me. I'm sorry for upsetting you, I apologize. The individual the police have arrested as a suspect in Bart's death is a friend of mine. I don't believe he killed Bart. Fergie turned back to me, her eyes filled with tears. I didn't kill Bart, if that's what you're thinking. I don't believe you did, I told her. Yet I had to ask questions, just to be certain. Please, just leave, Connor said. There seemed to be nothing more I could say. I exited the room and shut the door behind me with a firm click. I could hear the locks turn behind me. I felt awful, certain Fergie was innocent. I would take her off of my list of suspects, I decided. Once outside, I took in a deep breath of refreshing clean air. I planned on talking to Tristan next. I had been told by Thelma that Tristan was most likely to be found at the Oaks Crossing Community Theater. On my way there, I had to pass through the center of town. The quickest way would be cut through the park. As I was walking, I noticed Detective Armand sitting top of a picnic table. I shouldn't have recognized him without his usual neat business suit, but for some reason I had known exactly who he was, even though Armand was wearing a regular police uniform. Somehow, it seemed to highlight his tan face and brown hair with the golden highlights. I wasn't about to say the uniform made the man, but it certainly helped show off his trim physique. Armand was reading from a sheaf of papers, a file on the table beside him, while he sipped from a takeout cup of coffee. A half-eaten sub was nearby in its wrapper. A breeze picked up one of the photographs, sending it twirling through the air before it landed on the grass. I picked it up, looking at the image in confusion. It was a bunch of apricots. Armand promptly took the photo out of my hand. Thank you. I cocked my head at him, quickly looking as he gathered up the paperwork, putting it into the file. I could see the inside of a bakery, baker's name on a report, and a report of apricots before it was quickly put out of my sight. You are investigating Bart's death, I accused in delight. I thought you were off the case. I am off the case, frowned a grumpy Armand. Until the next incident comes, which requires my attention, the chief has me writing parking tickets. Can I look at the file? I wheedled a little, hoping you might just bend the rules this one time. This is official police business, Ivy, a disapproving Armand told me. I can't show you confidential information. You're looking at it, I mentioned. Last I heard, you aren't even doing detective duties. See the uniform? Part of the police department, he motioned to his name tag. It means I still have some privileges. 
You don't think you owe me for throwing Molly and I in jail for a night when we did nothing wrong? I remarked, one eyebrow delicately arched. Your friend Molly got half the department high, which is why I'm on foot patrol, grimaced Armand. I honestly don't think it's a fair trade. Exactly, I chirped, knowing we weren't remotely on the same page when it came to who was getting the unfair portion of the deal. Jail overnight was super scary. Did you know Carl snores and talks in his sleep? The benches aren't very comfortable either. Ivy, you are not going to guilt trip me into showing you confidential information, reprimanded Armand lightly, his lips twitching a little before he sipped his coffee. Okay, what about if we just discussed it? I suggested. I could tell you about what I've learned, and you could tell me about all those apricots and whatever else is in the file. What did you learn? questioned Armand before my words registered fully. Wait a minute, you are not investigating this. Ivy, this is a murder, not finding a cat. Jackson Grubbs is a friend, and he's innocent. I folded my arms, readying myself for a battle of wills. Half the town is protesting at the police station because they know he didn't do anything. Ava asked for my help. Armand groaned. The chief is blaming me for these protests of yours. If you value my job, you will stop this nonsense. I shrugged, pretending to be unconcerned about his job. I'm afraid the protest has taken on a life of its own. The only way to stop the protesters is to free Jackson by proving someone else committed the murder. I still can't discuss investigations with you, Ivy, admonished Armand a bit impatiently. You should stop trying to look into this murder. Someone wanted Bart dead bad enough to kill. The last thing you want is to attract a killer's attention. Ha! I pointed a finger at him in triumph. You think the killer's still on the loose? I didn't say that. Quickly, Armand backtracked. I grinned happily. You're investigating because you don't think Jackson murdered Bart either. Armand ran a hand over his face. He reached into a pocket, taking out a pack of nicotine gum and popping a piece into his mouth. He thought for a moment. If you continue what you're doing, you can be charged with impeding an investigation. Funny, I remarked with some sarcasm. I'm serious, replied Armand, his steely blue eyes fixed firmly on my face. So is the chief of police. I don't believe you're favorable terms with him. Neither are you, I sweetly responded. If you don't think the chief is enjoying the protest now, wait till I put it into phase two. Phase two? What is phase two? Armand's voice lowered as he glowered at me. I honestly had no idea what phase two might be. However, I was sure Thelma and the gang could come up with something dramatic. I just smiled at Armand. Armand stood up from the picnic table, towering over me. No phase two. No investigating. No getting involved in this in any way. Do I make myself clear? I didn't like the way he was trying to intimidate me by using his height to his advantage. Narrowing my eyes, I enunciated deliberately. No. Excuse me? A disbelieving Armand said. No, I repeated smugly. I had the distinct impression very few people had ever told Armand no. Plus, I was still irked over the whole jail episode and the fact that I had lost business due to my unexpected overnight stay. An entire week's worth of business for a family reunion who could have rented multiple sites. Let Armand do his worst. I had an army of senior citizens at my back. He didn't look like he quite knew what to say. A muscle ticked in his clenched jaw. Ivy? Whatever might have come up next was forgotten as Thelma yelled from the distance, swiftly walking toward us. Yoo-hoo! Ivy! We need to talk! We waited as an out-of-breath Thelma approached. Ava needs you. The poor girl is just blubbering away and none of us can get a straight word out of her. I thought you should try to talk to her. After all, she trusts you with everything that is going on with Jackson. You see? I leveled an accusatory look at the detective. You made Ava cry. With that parting remark, I linked my arm in Thelma's and marched across the grass back the way Thelma had come. Chapter 12. Liar, Liar. She just won't stop sobbing, Thelma murmured to me. Poor girl has had a crush on Jackson Grubbs forever and is too shy to admit it. He's too dense to notice, believing they are just friends. 
Now he's in jail, and she's a fountain of tears. We need to know if she found anything out from her visit with Jackson, I remarked. What were you and the detective talking about? wondered Thelma as we crossed the street, making our way back to the police station. He doesn't want me to investigate Bart's death, I said blithely. He was just trying to intimidate me. I refused. Good for you, nodded Thelma in agreement. A lady should know when to put her foot down. Otherwise, her man will just use her like a doormat. He's not my man, I gave her an odd look. Thelma raised an eyebrow. I think he could be if you tried a little harder to flirt with him. I rolled my eyes. I have a campground to run. I don't have time for dating. Besides, Armand and I are always at odds. We rub each other the wrong way. You could rub each other the right way, suggested Thelma in a saucy voice. Thelma! I was shocked by her flirty suggestion. Thankfully, we came to find Ava sitting with Agatha at her side in a pair of camp chairs on the lawn of the town library, so I didn't have to respond further to Thelma's remark. Agatha was rubbing Ava's back and letting her cry on her. When she spotted me, Agatha smiled. Ivy! Good! You will know what to do! The poor child is terribly upset. Ivy! sniffed Ava, blowing her nose delicately in a tissue. It was terrible! I crouched on the grass in front of Ava and took her hand. Why don't you tell me what happened? They've charged him with murder, a distraught Ava said. He has to go for some hearing to plead not guilty, then maybe he will get bail? I'm not sure. Did Jackson know anything about the evidence they have against him? I gently asked. No, she sighed. Just about the poisonous pesticides the police found, which isn't his. I nodded. Did Bart have an order of food with Jackson recently? Did Jackson remember what that food order was? He writes down all of his orders, but the police took his record books, responded Ava. However, he did remember most of the order he delivered to Bart on Saturday morning before the farmer's market. Bart wanted everything to be especially fresh with Fergie coming. What was in the order? I inquired, hopeful that we might be able to trace the poisoned food. "'Strawberries, raspberries, the last of the season's rhubarb, honey, apricots?' Ava shrugged helplessly. "'I can't remember the rest.' "'Apricots?' I questioned. "'Are you certain?' "'Yes,' nodded Ava firmly. "'The season has just started for them. They are the first of Jackson's crop. Soon the peaches will be ready, too.' I thought back to the picture of apricots which was in Armand's file. Had he taken pictures of all the fruits Jackson had provided to Bart? Or was there a special significance to the apricots? Something about the picture bothered me, but I couldn't think of what it might be. Why are you asking about apricots? Are they significant? asked a hopeful Thelma. I don't know, I murmured. There might be some connection. Ava, did Jackson say anything else which might help us solve the murder and get him out of jail? I don't think so, admitted a sad Ava. I'm sorry I wasn't more a help. I'm just so terrified Jackson is going to go to prison for a crime he didn't commit. We are going to find out who did this and free Jackson, promised Thelma. Don't you worry about it. Ivy knows what she's doing. Well, I appreciated Thelma's faith in me. It was a lot of pressure she was putting on me. I'll do everything I can. Ava leaned forward, giving me a tight hug. Thank you, Ivy. I returned the hug. How about you take the rest of the today just to relax a little and recover from your visit with Jackson? I'm going to talk to Tristan, Bart's brother. Maybe we can all meet up for dinner and discuss our progress. That sounds like a sensible idea, voted Thelma. We can go to the Sunken Oak Diner. I'll make sure the others know. Ava and I will stay right here, volunteered Agatha, or we can go back to the crafty corner for a while. The protest has gotten a little loud for me. We all knew it was Agatha's way of saying she would take care of Ava without directly voicing it. "'Why don't we get a cup of tea at Tawny's Tea House?' asked Ava to Agatha, who promptly agreed. Thelma and I promised to return the camp chairs to the protest. We watched as Ava helped the frail Agatha across the street toward the tea house. Thelma sighed. "'They are such lovely people, Ava and Jackson. I certainly hope the two of them can finally realize they have feelings for each other.' First, we should concentrate on getting Jackson out of jail, I murmured. Then you can match make all that you would like. Thelma and I brought the chairs back to the owner. I admired Thelma's efforts on the protest, then excused myself to go speak to Tristan. 
If I was going to catch him before the dinner hour at the theater, I need to get there quickly. The Oaks Crossing Community Theater was a great old building which had been made during the town's most prosperous period. It was nearly a hundred years old and made a yellow brick with the huge windows, reminding me a little of a church. Plush carpets, cream walls, and polished oak greeted me inside. I stopped at the box office, inquiring whether I might find Tristan Baker. Oh, he doesn't go by Baker, the clerk advised me. His stage name is Tristan Towns. He thinks it gives him flair. Plus, he doesn't much like his brother. Excuse me, I mean, he didn't much like his brother. You can find Tristan in the main auditorium. The amateur group is rehearsing right now. I thanked him and followed his directions to reach the main auditorium. It was large, with a sloping floor leading to a large stage, professionally lit and decorated as a living room might be, with a few props. A slim man was talking about his woes, describing how life had got him down, and he didn't know how he was going to tell his family what had happened. Stop! A man called from behind the front row. For a moment I didn't know if he was speaking to the man on stage or to me. Walking down the aisle, I hesitated. It's a comedy, Tristan, grumbled the man from the front row. Not a tragedy. Try not to be so glum. Tristan, who looked nothing like his brother, put his hands on his hips. It seems very tragic to me. The man is supposed to be the breadwinner, and now he's out of work. The man in the front row looked at his watch. Let's call it a day and come back to it tomorrow. Good work, everyone. I swiftly approached the stage. Tristan, may I speak with you? Ah, an adoring fan, he said condescendingly, hopping off the stage. Did you bring a pen and paper? Pardon? I asked, confused. For my autograph, explained conceited Tristan. No, I softened my response with a smile. I came to talk to you about your brother. An annoyed look flitted over Tristan's face. I would rather not. If you'll excuse me, I have better things to do. Maybe the brothers weren't very different, I thought. Both of them were difficult people. It will only take a few minutes of your time. I just have a few questions. Why? He cocked an eyebrow. Why would you possibly have questions? Bart was a rude, selfish man. He made someone angry enough to kill him, and now he's dead. There is nothing to question. Who do you think killed him? I asked bluntly. I haven't the faintest idea, nor do I care, he retorted. If I knew, I would send the person a gift basket of thanks. You really don't like your brother, I m murmured in surprise. As I already stated, Bart was selfish and rude, nodded Tristan firmly. I'm glad he's gone, and I'm not afraid to say it. I was told Bart had the lead in the play, I remarked, gauging his reaction. He didn't deserve it, spat Tristan. That hack couldn't act his way out of a box. Bart just intimidated the director into giving him the part, all because Bart knew I wanted it. Bart was always like that, taking my toys, taking my rolls, my stuff, whatever he could get his grimy hands on. Do you have the role now? I asked. Of course I do, puffed up Tristan proudly. I deserve it. I'm the best actor here. I've been on Broadway. Bart and Tristan were definitely alike, both boasting they deserved everything they wanted. I cocked my head to the side, narrowing my eyes. Did you kill Bart to get the part? Tristan blinked in shock. Of course not. I didn't kill my brother. Like I said, if I ever find out who did... I'll send them a gift for a thank you. I might not have loved my brother, but I certainly didn't murder him. Did you see anything suspicious on the days leading up to his death? I asked, persisting. Did anyone make any threats? I'm not my brother's keeper, a haughty Tristan said. I don't know, nor do I care. I couldn't help but overhear you, a man interjected. I realized he was the same man who had been in the front row earlier. I supposed he was the director. The police have a suspect in custody. Please leave my actors alone. The theater is closing. I sighed in defeat. I wasn't sure I believed Tristan, but the lights were dimming and everyone was leaving. I followed people out. Hey, a woman caught up to me, laying a hand on my arm. I saw you talking to Tristan about Bart. Yes, I said curious. I was. Look, Bart and Tristan aren't the easiest of people, she stated. However, even as much as I don't like Tristan, he didn't kill his brother. How do you know? I asked. Tristan was in the city last weekend for an audition, she said. 
He left Friday night and didn't return until Sunday morning. I went with him, hoping to get a part as well. Oh, then he has an alibi, I mused. I wonder why he didn't just say so. He's a bit thick, she pointed to her head and rolled her eyes. Not bad to look at, but not the brightest. <laughs> Thank you for telling me, I responded. It meant one less person on my suspect list. You're very welcome. Good luck finding the real killer, she said, walking away. I walked to the sunken oak diner. By now I felt I had walked most of the town and was tired from the day's activities. I found B, Thelma, Ava, Conrad, and Herb already waiting at the table. Ivy, waved Thelma. We're over here. I gratefully sank into a chair. What's a special tonight? Hot beef dinner with mashed potatoes and peas. The dinner is very good, advised Herb. They also have chicken if you would prefer it. Who cares about food? B leaned forward eagerly. Did you find out who killed Bart? I have been narrowing down the suspect list. I took a sip of water. My stomach growled, reminding me lunch had been a long time ago. The chicken dinner was sounding wonderful. We all put in our orders before I continued to explain what I had been able to find out. Tristan has an alibi. It doesn't make financial sense for the landlord Horace Retz to kill Bart. The same could be said for Maurice, Bart's business partner. They were already in the process of removing Bart from the business legally. I would like to follow up on what they said about their lawyer, but I'm not sure who their lawyer would be or if they would even speak to me. It's likely all confidential information. Why don't we ask Jepson? asked Conrad. He might be able to dig around and find out for us. That's a good idea, nodded B. I also don't believe Fergie killed Bart, I stated. She seemed too upset and was very forthcoming about their previous history. Fergie? questioned Thelma. From the Food Channel? I explained everything I had learned about Fergie and Bart, how he had gotten her kicked out of culinary school, and how she didn't seem bothered by that fact at all. If anything, she was grateful with the way things had turned out. Who could blame her? She was now a television star while Bart was being sued by his landlord and soon-to-be ex-business partner. Then who are we left with? asked Herb. Just the chef at the White Oaks Resort, I shrugged, unless anyone can think of someone else as a suspect. I tried to find out as much as I could, but everyone seems to dislike Bart Baker. Yet no one appears to have hated him enough to kill him, admitted a frustrated bee. My day was a total waste. No, it wasn't, I assured her. You made certain our suspect pool was correct, and we hadn't forgotten anyone. Either Bart was killed by someone on our list, or by someone we know nothing about. When are you going to talk to the chef at the White Oaks? inquired Thelma. I think I'll talk to Wanda first, since she was the one who overheard the argument between Bart and the chef. Then I'll talk to the chef, I decided. What if the chef didn't do it? asked a quiet Ava. What if we can't prove anyone did it? What will happen to Jackson then? Nothing like that is going to happen, honey, Thelma patted Ava's hand. We will find out who did this, don't you worry. I'm sorry, Ava apologized. I know all you all are trying your best, and I do believe if anyone can figure this out, it will be you. We have a plan, I said soothingly. All we need to do is slowly gather clues, and eventually we will figure out who the killer is. At least, it was what I hoped would happen. Ava nodded, mollified by my response. We ordered dinner, discussing what we would do for Jackson and the next steps of the plan. I would talk to Wanda before approaching the chef from the White Oaks Resort. We would also talk to Jepson to see if he could find out any information about the lawsuits between Bart, Horace, and Maurice. The chicken was delicious, perhaps because I was so hungry. I managed to put away most of the main course and even a slice of blueberry pie for dessert. Full, I leaned back, enjoying the conversation. A thought occurred to me. We should check Tristan's alibi. This got B's attention. Definitely. Otherwise, it could just be a lie. How? questioned Conrad. Do you even know what play Tristan auditioned for? Someone will need to ask one of the amateur acting group if they can confirm the name of the play and where the audition took place. Someone different than the woman who volunteered the information on Tristan's behalf, I sighed. It probably shouldn't be me who asks around again at the theater. Tristan made a bit of a scene. I don't think the director would want me back. Was the woman who vouched for Tristan tall with fake blonde hair and too much makeup? asked Ava suddenly. Yes, I said in surprise. Do you know her? Ava had a grimace. She's Melinda Stratton, a former beauty queen who thinks the whole world rests on everything Tristan says or does. 
Melinda might lie to protect Tristan. I was a little confused. By her remarks, I got the impression that Melinda didn't like Tristan. Melinda is really good at figuring out what people want to hear, grimaced Ava. She's a master manipulator. Then it's even more important the alibi is checked, I murmured. We need to find out for certain, nodded Thelma. I'll go to the next rehearsal and ask around. I believe it's scheduled for tomorrow. Thank you, Thelma. I appreciated her helping. Soon enough, the group began to leave. I asked Thelma for a ride back to the Happy Camper Resort. B, Thelma, and I went in the Mercury back to the campground. On the way past the clubhouse, B noted, Oh, look, the tree is down. Thelma stopped the car, and we could all see the tree, which had caused the hole in the roof of the clubhouse, was now in pieces on the ground. A pickup truck with wood partially loaded in the bed was parked beside it. Chaz Bison, owner of the Mighty Oaks Christian Campground, was talking to Molly in the fading light. Oh dear, I murmured. She's flirting with Chaz. B had a snort. Does she know that he's a Christian? Thelma giggled. This ought to be fun. Grabbing my purse, I got out of the car and walked toward the pair. Hi, Chaz. Thanks for taking down the tree. No problem, Chaz said as he wiped his sweating face with the bottom of his shirt, revealing a six-pack worthy of anyone who took fitness seriously, before dropping the garment back into place. We are glad to have the wood for campfires at the campground. I was just going to offer Chaz a drink, mentioned Molly as she gazed in admiration at the tall, ginger-haired man. I brought some water, replied an apologetic Chaz, but thank you for offering. I had better get this finished before dark. I think I can fit it all in one load. Even if you have to come back tomorrow to finish, it's fine, I smiled as I hooked my arm in Molly's. Have a good night. Good night, breathed Molly as I led her away. Chaz was barely out of earshot as she sighed. Just who is the Irish cream dream? Chaz Bison is the owner of the Mighty Oaks Christian Campground. I put some emphasis on the Christian, hoping it might sink in how unsuitable he was for her. He's an all-around nice guy, and I would prefer it if you didn't get any ideas. I have ideas, she admitted, a predatory look in her eyes. Are you willing to reform your ways? I asked bluntly. The guy is a dedicated Christian. I don't want you to be his downfall. Hey, a defensive Molly replied. Who says I have to be his downfall? Maybe I could become a good woman because of him. I had my doubts that would happen. It must have showed on my face because Molly huffed, taking her arm out of mine. It could happen, you know, pouted Molly. I sighed. Play nice. I always do, she retorted sweetly before heading to her camper. Good night. I hoped Chaz Bison knew what he was in for and could handle Molly. I knew once she had that particular look in her eye, she would try to pursue the poor man, no matter how inappropriate the relationship. Debating whether or not to give Chaz a warning about Molly, I headed for my camper. On the way, I met Topher, who had a beach chair and a telescope under his arm. "'Hey, Ivy,' he greeted me. "'Just thought I would get up by the lake to do a little stargazing. Would you like to join me?' Thank you, but I'll pass. I smiled an apology. It has been a long day, and I would like to get some rest. Have fun looking at the stars. Topher gave a happy nod, pulling out an apple. He grimaced before pulling off a sticker. I wish they would stop putting stickers on fruit and vegetables at the stores. It's kind of a waste and just ends up in the garbage. I agree, I murmured. An idea lit in my mind, and suddenly I knew exactly what had been wrong with the picture of apricots Detective Armand had tried to hide from me. They had stickers. Excuse me? A voice a confused Topher. I grinned in excitement and without thought gave Topher a kiss on the cheek. Thank you. You're welcome, came Topher's befuddled, blushing reply. I just smiled and headed toward my camper, my steps quick and sure. Chapter 13 Tea and Gossip we need to talk, I smugly said into the phone. Call me. I left my details and ended the call. Armand must be busy because I had gotten his voicemail. It was a beautiful day, promising to warm up under the July sun. I had parked the car in front of Tawny's tea house where I was supposed to meet Mabel's niece Wanda for lunch. A bell tinkled as I entered the tea shop. The aroma of baked goods, various types of tea, and beeswax from polished antiques greeted me. It was a clean, tidy, and slightly cluttered place, which reminded me exactly of the tea house's owner. Ivy, how nice to see you, greeted Tawny as I came to the counter. 
What can I get for you? Perusing her delicious menu, I chose. I would like to try a berry sensation tea with a ham and cheese croissant. Coming right up, Tawny assured me. Why don't you have a seat and I'll bring it to you? That would be nice, I replied. Have you seen Mabel's niece, Wanda? I'm supposed to be meeting her here today, but I don't know what she looks like. She looks a great deal like Mabel, except with brown hair, nodded Tawny. Just have a seat, and when she comes in, I'll let her know who you are. Thank you, Tawny, I smiled. I chose a small round table near the window. A light cream tablecloth covered the table, and a small vase with a pretty rose was in the center. I touched the petal, surprised it was real. I like to bring flowers from my garden, boasted Tawny as she set down my tea. It adds a nice touch. It does, I readily agreed. The rose is lovely. Thank you, she beamed before heading back to the counter. The tea came in a little pot. I had a delicate china teacup and saucer which I poured the tea into. It was hot and had a nice fruity flavor. I might have to come more often to Tawny's tea house, I reflected. I glanced around as I heard a group of giggling girls near the back of the small shop. A couple of mothers had four young girls who were enjoying tea and cake. It was a cute tea party. Ivy? A breathless woman questioned. I looked up to see a woman who resembled Mabel a great deal. Her fit frame was younger, her hair not gray, but chestnut instead. Hello, you must be Wanda. Yes, she smiled and had a seat at my table. Aunt Mabel said you wished to speak to me. I nodded. I'm looking into Bart Baker's death. I was hoping to ask you a few questions. I don't know if I could help, replied Wanda as she shrugged in confusion. I didn't know Bart. In fact, I don't believe I've ever been in the Tasty Treats Bakery. Someone told me you might have overheard a conversation between Bart and the chef at the White Oaks Resort, I mentioned. An argument about recipes? A flicker of understanding crossed Wanda's face. I remember that. It wasn't a conversation. It was a full-blown argument. Chef Taki Young is our dessert chef. Bart Baker was accusing him of stealing recipes for Taki's new cookbook. The cookbook is due to be released in a couple of months. Somehow, Bart had gotten an advanced copy, and he was convinced almost a third of the recipes came directly from his shop. This is terrible if it's true, I ventured, hoping she would say more. Tawny came to our table, interrupting the conversation. She gave Wanda her tea and a set of shortbread biscuits and I my sandwich. I hope everything is to your liking. Yes, it is, I replied. Thank you. If you need a refill of hot water, just let me know said Tawny, before she turned her attention to her other customers. Wanda leaned in. Bart was suing Tacky. I accidentally saw the envelopes from the lawyers. Tacky wasn't very happy that I seen it, but he was the one who left it lying around in the kitchen. Then Mr. Frick, the owner of the White Oaks Resort and Golf Club, he came in later in the afternoon, demanding to see Tacky. I think he knows Tacky is being sued and doesn't want any bad press for the resort. It would be quite the scandal if it were found out his dessert chef had been stealing recipes. Tacky might even get fired over the matter if anyone can prove it. Is Tacky still working at the resort? I questioned. For now he is, nodded Wanda, sipping her tea. He's on the afternoon shift, taking care of the lunch and dinner desserts. I suppose you would like to talk to him about the whole matter? I would, I confirmed. However, I'm not certain I should be at the White Oaks right now. Last time I was at the resort, I might have done a few things I shouldn't have. I suspect the owner isn't very fond of me right now. Wanda thought for a moment. Today is the second Wednesday in the month. Usually, Taki goes to the spice rack for supplies. He's at the shop between two and three in the afternoon to pick up anything extra for his baking. Taki could just get his order delivered, but he refuses to, saying his special ingredients are a secret. If you wait for him there, I'm sure you can catch him for a talk. Thank you, Wanda. I smiled in relief. I fully intend to be at the spice rack waiting for him. Good, nodded Wanda firmly as she munched on a biscuit. I don't know if he has anything to do with Bart's death, but it's not nice to think I may have been working with a liar and a plagiarizer. Do you think he did steal the recipes? I wondered. Wanda dusted off her hands and drank the last of her tea. Tacky Young hasn't had an original thought in years. He followed his recipes meticulously and never deviates. I don't think he's capable of creating a new recipe, so yes, I suppose I do think he stole them. It was a rather blunt assessment of her co-worker, I thought wryly. 
I thanked Wanda for her time, dallying at the table after she had left to get my thoughts together and to finish my lunch. Sipping on the last of my cooling tea, I was surprised when Tawny sat down across from me. Ivy, I've heard you were investigating Bart's murder, began Tawny, and I had this little idea I want to run past you. Sure, I patiently replied. Tawny might be a bit of a gossip, but she was a nice lady who had been very happy when I returned her prize-winning Persian cat Winifred just a few weeks earlier. What is your idea? I think you need to look at people who found Bart, she nodded emphatically. They were acting so strange the day Bart was found. Even the mayor was. I don't like to cast doubts on the integrity of Mayor Whitcomb. He is a very good upstanding member of this community. However, the group of people were very odd. You mean the film crew with Fergie, I questioned? Yes, those people, Tawny confirmed. How strange were they acting? I had the sinking feeling I knew what the cause of their odd behavior might be. Perhaps they consumed some of Molly's magic brownies we had sold at the farmer's market. I vaguely remembered giving them a package in the heat of my argument with Bart Baker. Where did you see them? They came into my tea shop a few hours after the murder revealed Tawny. After I did my shopping at the market, I came back to relieve my part-time helper. She had a family event, so I was going to stay until close on Saturday. What happened? I prodded gently. Tawny sometimes took a bit to get to the point of a conversation. I remembered her at the market and was surprised she was open on Saturdays. Quite a few shops in the area closed during farmer's market days because most of the shopping traffic was at the market and not in the downtown. What did the group with Fergie say? Fergie appeared to be quite shaken over the whole ordeal, confided Tawny. However, two of those gentlemen she was with, they were very upset their recordings had been confiscated by the police. They went on and on in gory detail all about the murder scene. It was very difficult to hear. The third gentleman, he kept asking if anyone had known what he'd had done. Once he even pointed a finger at me and declared if I was such a mind reader then I should turn him in. A mind reader? I echoed in slight disbelief. I had a friend who, when he smoked pot years ago, he had become quite paranoid and hid under the bed until the effects wore off. Perhaps it was similar to what had happened to this person. I hardly think you are clairvoyant. He was very disturbing, sniffed Tawny. They ate a lot and drank a great deal of tea. Finally, they paid the bill and moved on. I was very relieved to see them go. I frowned. What about the mare? I thought you said he had been a little odd as well. Oh, he was, exclaimed Tawny, leaning forward and dropping her voice a little, even though no one was nearby enough to overhear our conversation. Mayor Whitcomb came in shortly after Fergie and her companions left. He and the chief of police were sitting in one of my corner tables. The chief wanted some really strong black tea for the mayor and kept making him eat and drink. Mayor Whitcomb was, well, he was... He was what? I asked gently, wondering what had happened. He was giggling, disclosed Tawny in a whisper. He was giggling so much, as though he'd found Bart Baker's murder to be funny. I could hardly believe my eyes and ears. The chief of police was quite angry, furious even, and who can blame him? If I hadn't been in such shock, I might have been angry too. It was not appropriate to laugh at murder. Oh, Tawny. I murmured, searching my brain for a way to explain the mayor's odd behavior. Then an idea came to me. It wasn't exactly appropriate, but it would restore Tawny's faith in the politician. I almost felt guilty for saying it. Perhaps he and the others were in the gas leak. The one at the police station? You remember mentioning it on Saturday. Tawny's eyes cleared with an understanding. Oh, yes. That would explain it. It could very well be the cause of all the silliness. I gave a serious nod, agreeing with her. Did they mention anything about Bart's murder? Not that I could overhear, sighed a disappointed Tawny. I did try to hear what they were saying, but the chief kept giving me dark looks, so every time I came near. I tried not to smile at her blatant eavesdropping tactics. Tawny was a fount of information. The police chief isn't the most approachable man. True, agreed Tawny. I don't particularly like him. He has arrested Jackson Grubbs. Anyone who knows anyone in this town knows Jackson isn't capable of hurting someone. He is far too nice of a person. I'm trying to figure out who killed Bart, I confessed to her. I don't believe Jackson would kill anyone either. Good. I'm glad you are investigating, she remarked. Your lunch is free today. 
Tawny, you don't have to, I protested. I'm happy to, stated Tawny as she got up from the table. The least I can do is give you a free lunch for trying to clear Jackson's name. He may have been a rascal as a youngster and gotten into some trouble, but Jackson is a good man. What sort of trouble? I wondered. This was the first I had heard Jackson might have had a bit of troubled past. He fell in with the wrong crowd as a child, clucked Tawny. She picked up Wanda's dishes, heading for the counter. It happens to teenagers. He got cocked doing a few things he shouldn't have. Nothing harmful, just silliness boys get up to. What sort of silliness? If Jackson has a record, it isn't going to look good in court. I grabbed my dishes following her. They think they stole a boat, shrugged Tawny. Underage drinking, maybe a little vandalism. You know the things boys do when they're bored and young. Jackson has grown up now. He's a gentle soul who takes care of his part of the world. Surely his past won't be held against him. I wouldn't guarantee it, I warned. Judges and courts don't know the people they are putting on trial. Having a record, even if just a juvenile offenses, isn't helpful in court. Tawny looked at me with pleading eyes. Then you'll have to find out the true killer before any trial. Jackson doesn't deserve to go to prison for something he didn't do. I'll do my best, Tawny, I said, leaving my dishes with her. I checked my watch and found to my surprise it was nearing two in the afternoon. Walking to the spice rack, a store for food enthusiasts who wanted specialty items, kitchen gadgets, or spices. An aisle full of different forms and molds for shaping baked goods drew my attention. I could spend a lot of time and money here, I thought to myself as I inspected one of the molds. Perhaps fifteen minutes into my perusing the store, I overheard the salesperson call a man by the name of Tacky. Looking over, I could see a man with sharp features, a slim build, and jet black hair. He paid for his purchase and headed out the door. Shoving a set of cookie cutters back on the shelf, I quickly followed him outside. Excuse me? Hello? Tacky stopped, waiting for me to catch up with a curious expression on his face. Can I help you? Ivy Thurman. I held out my hand in greeting. I'm the new owner of the Happy Camper Resort. He blanched. The recipes are mine. I don't know what your grandmother told you, but I paid for them. What? I couldn't quite believe my ears. You bought Grandma's recipes? Yes, Tacky nodded emphatically. I certainly did. Are you sure about that? I was confused. I was certain my grandmother would never have sold her recipes, even if she were in a tight situation, which I now knew she had been. Jeannie Thurman had kept pride in maintaining years of family recipes by handing them down generation to generation, their secrets remaining hidden from all but family. Sometimes I thought it might be why my mother and grandmother had had such a rift. Mom thought Grandma should put together a cookbook and lived off the proceeds. Grandma had been adamant the recipes were for family only. I can't see my grandmother as having sold any recipes. I paid in full, sniffed Tacky. I have receipts. Besides, recipes can't be copyrighted. Actually, they can, I pointed out. I remember Mom arguing about it. While the ingredient list can't be copyrighted, the wording of the directions and descriptions can be attributed solely to the author of the work. Tacky straightened. I still paid for them. They are mine to do with as I wish. I wondered who else Tacky had taken recipes from. Perhaps Bart's claim had been entirely legitimate. Yet, was it a reason for murder? Wait! I cried out as Tacky turned to leave. This wasn't what I wanted to talk to you about. It wasn't? He echoed in surprise, giving me his full attention. I might want to discuss it later, but right now I wanted to talk about Bart Baker, I hastily explained. It's been said you and he weren't exactly friends. Friends! exploded the little man in anger. Bart Baker was a rude bully of a man and deserved exactly what he got. I jumped back, a little afraid of this small man who suddenly seemed very menacing. You argued about recipes with him as well. There were witnesses. Wait a minute, Tacky shook a finger at me. You are the one who thinks they are a Miss Marble, the female amateur sleuth. Well, I'll tell you. Bart Baker and I argued right in the kitchen of the White Oaks Resort. Anyone can know it because lots of people heard us. I almost lost my job because of that despicable man. It took me over an hour to convince Mr. Frick I had a legitimate right to the recipes. Bart had been trying to blackmail me, and I wouldn't give him any money for what was rightfully mine. I told him I would see him in court, and if he came around again, I would get a no trespassing order against him. I did not kill Bart Baker. With a huff, he got into his car and drove away. I watched him leave, feeling a little shaky in the aftermath of his wrath. I honestly could see him killing Bart in a fit of rage with maybe a knife or a cleaver. However, I didn't think poison would be his weapon of choice. 
Poison was a deliberate act. One had to be absolutely certain only the intended victim was to receive the dose. Otherwise, someone else could be an unintended victim. I didn't believe Tacky had killed Bart. Now I had no idea who could be the killer. Sighing, I walked back to my car and saw the crowd at the police station had grown even bigger. I blinked as I realized I could see lines of people waiting on barbecues. The event had turned into a regular cookout with people from the Happy Camper Resort selling all sorts of items. Walking across the street to join the commotion, I found Herb happily flipping burgers at an outdoor grill, an apron tied to him and a jaunty I'm the chef hat on his head. This seems a bit extreme, I ventured. I'm not certain this is legal and you are cooking right on the front lawn of the police station. Herb just grinned. What are they going to do? Arrest all of us? The jail doesn't have enough room. Besides, we are raising money for the legal fund to defend Jackson. I'm hoping we can find the real murderer and Jackson doesn't need a legal fund, I remarked. Always have a plan B, a sage herb advised. He popped a burger onto a bun. Would you like one? It's on the house for our favorite investigator. <laughs> yes, please, I gratefully took the burger. Condiments and veggies are over there. Herb pointed a spatula at a table. Cold drinks are by B. Thank you. I proceeded to the condiment table, loading up my burger to my satisfaction. B waved, and I received a can of iced tea from her. Have you seen Thelma? I asked. I was hoping to see if she had found out about Melinda and Tristan's alibi. B nodded. Thelma asked around. Turns out Melinda was at a dress rehearsal for the Little Miss Oaks pageant. She's coaching a couple of girls. Melinda lied about her and Tristan's being in the city. It means he's back to being on the suspect list. I took a bite of my burger, wiping ketchup from my lip with a napkin. These are good. Herb is great at a barbecue, agreed B. He knows exactly what to put in a burger. Has anyone talked to Jepson yet? I questioned. Conrad is following up with Jepson. Could be a while, warned B. When the two of them get together, they like to shoot the breeze about the olden days. Isn't anyone worried about being arrested out here? I gestured to the barbecues and crafts they were selling. You were right out on the police lawn. B laughed. Mayor Whitcomb was out earlier today with the paper for a photo op. Whitcomb made it more than clear he's on our side, and the chief of police ought to be considering his position very carefully as the town pays the chief's salary. Oh dear, I murmured. I hadn't intended for things to go this far. There are consequences for everything we do, an irritated voice said from behind me. If this keeps up, I might be permanently on foot patrol. I turned to look up into the steely blue eyes of an unamused Armand. This wasn't my idea. Chapter 14 Phase 2 I don't care who thought of it. This needs to stop, growled Armand. He frowned as he looked over the sea of people across the yard of the police station. B just laughed. Why don't you have a soda and calm down, detective? Calm down? Armand's voice became dangerously low as he looked at to be. I grabbed him by the arm, pulling him away from her. I wanted to talk to you, I chirped in an effort to distract him, leading the detective through the crowd to try and find a quieter place. I got your message, he said dryly. I know what you're doing. What am I doing? I asked innocently. You were trying to distract me from the chaos you have created. He grumbled, patting his pocket for a cigarette. When he came up empty, he scowled further. Actually, I wanted to talk about Jackson's case, I began, but Armand cut me off. You know I can't discuss the investigation with you, he reiterated, annoyed I was pursuing the subject. True, I conceded. However, I found out something significant. Or it could be significant. Armand looked like he would rather bite off his tongue than ask, but he ended up questioning, what is it? The apricots in the photo I happen to accidentally see from your case file, are they the food the poison was in? If so, those apricots didn't come from Grubb's farm, I proudly stated. How do you know? A disbelieving Armand inquired. They had stickers on them from the food mart, I pertly replied. Grubb's farm doesn't use stickers. However, all store-bought produce has stickers on them. Those particular stickers are from the food mart right here in town. How can you know the apricots are from the food mart? Armand crossed his arms, looking down at me. I recognize the stickers, I shrugged. You are more than welcome to check it out for yourself. I will, affirmed Armand. Not that I'm confirming the apricots had poison in them. 
or Bart died by poison. I gave the detective a reprimanding look. I was at the station when the police labs came back. I know Bart was poisoned. Armand let out something akin to a growl. This whole thing is one big mess. What motive does the chief have for Bart's murder? I wondered, half thinking to myself, half talking aloud to Armand. He has to think there is a reason why Jackson might be the killer. I honestly don't know, admitted a reluctant Armand. I think he just added up the evidence at a two plus two equals five's equation. Then you don't believe Jackson is guilty either, I said softly. No, I don't believe so, sighed Armand. However, there isn't much I can do about the situation. I'm not privy to the investigation. Not true, I argued. You can keep digging into what happened. I'm not going to give up, and you shouldn't either. With that partnering shot, I walked away. Munching on the last of my cooling burger, I went back to my car. I needed a plan. As far as I was concerned, I might believe some of what the suspects had said, but that didn't mean they were off the hook. I was going to think about while I got a few chores done at the Happy Camper Resort. Once back, I changed into some old clothes. Taking Cookie and Cupcake with me, we proceeded down to the dock to try to sand down the wood. I had a bunch of extension cords, which would reach the leaning kayak shack. Hopefully, the electrical outlet still worked. Unlocking the kayak shack was difficult. The lock had rusted shut, and it took soaking the thing in oil before the key would finally turn. I looked into the dim and musty interior, which housed ancient canoes, kayaks, and boating paraphernalia. As I had feared, the life jackets had been turned into homes for various rodents and insects over the years. Most of the stuff would need to be junked and replaced. Likely, the entire building needed to be rebuilt the way it was leaning and looked like a good stiff wind would easily make the shack fall over. Grimacing, I plugged in the extension cords and headed for the dock with my sander. I had bought the cheapest one at the handy hardware store in town because I didn't intend to use it beyond sanding down a few things. The dock was first and foremost on my list. Once it was sanded, I had a couple of cans full of stain for it and the new board walk surrounding the office. Three hours later, Cookie and Cupcake happily puffed, watching the boaters and other wildlife from a spot in the shade of a tree. As for me, I was heartily sick of sanding in this afternoon sun. My knees hurt, my hands felt like they could vibrate all on their own, my lungs were choking on the dust even with the protective dust mask, and my shoulders hurt from the strain of pushing the small sander around. I was on my last patch of sandpaper, leaning over the edge, trying to reach the very last spot when my hand slipped. I fell onto my stomach on the dock, my hand hanging over empty air. With a glunk, the sander fell into the water. Immediately, I heard a loud popping noise behind me coming from the kayak shack. With a sinking feeling in my stomach, I quickly sat up, looking toward the shack. It appeared okay. I didn't see any fire or smoke, which was a good sign. Carefully getting up, I went to the shack, looking inside the dim interior. It smelled awful inside, even worse than the mustiness of when I had first opened the shack up. Acidic and something distinctly electrical reached my nose. I flicked on the light switch, but nothing happened. Taking out my phone, I switched on the flashlight app so I could better see. The outlet where I had plugged in the sander was black, with more black suit trailing up the wall. I grabbed the plug and pulled out the extension cord. Great, I muttered. Just great. Not only had I killed the sander, possibly the extension cords, but the hydro to the shack was now in question. I would just have to add it to the many things on my list to repair. Hopefully, my blunder hadn't affected any electrical on the rest of the campground. Tugging on the extension cords, I pulled the sander out of the water. Cookie and Cupcake barked ecstatically as they recognized a person walking down the trail toward us. Having a problem? Conrad joined me, frowning at the dripping sander. That's not good. No, I sighed, it's not. The only good thing about it is I managed to finish sanding the dock. Conrad inspected the dock. You did a good job, nice and smooth. Thank you, I had a half smile. I came by to tell you what I learned from Jepson, started Conrad, fingering one of his suspenders. There have been a rash of lawsuits when it comes to Bart. Seems like he was being sued by his business partner Maurice and his landlord Horace. Then Bart was suing Tacky Young from the White Oaks Resort. Bart has done little more than file the lawsuit before his death. This could add up to a lot of lawyer fees, I stated dryly. Bart was countersuing Maurice. He didn't like the split equation of the business Maurice was proposing. Maurice wanted a 50-50 split, but Bart wanted more of a 70-30 split in his own favor. 
It was dragging the process out. In the meanwhile, Bart wasn't paying any rent to the landlord and was fighting an eviction order. Conrad shook his head. What a mess he was in. Bart kept stalling the lawsuits every time something didn't go his way. He pleaded all sorts of made-up medical issues and had histrionics in court. Everyone was starting to reach a breaking point. If you ask me, I think either Horace or Maurice could easily have done it just to get the whole thing over with. Bart had already stretched out the court cases past a year, and it doesn't look like they were going to wrap up anytime soon. <laughs> then it looks like most of my suspects are still suspects, I groaned. It would appear so, agreed an unhelpful Conrad. Well, I'm going back to the office. If you need me, you know where to find me. Thank you, Conrad, I replied before setting the useless sander back in the kayak shack. I shut the door, locking it. What I needed was a plan, a way to draw out the murderer. However, I wasn't certain how to go about it. Taking the two bossies for a walk, I aimlessly wandered, trying to think of what to do. Cupcake and Cookie pulled me along, heading straight to Bee's camper. Bee was outside, her feet up and a book in her hand. Once she saw me, she set the novel down with a smile. How was your talk to the good detective? When I was done my shift at the protest, I went looking for you, but you were already gone. I had decided to sand the dock and collect my thoughts. I had a seat in one of her lawn chairs, suddenly glad Cookie and Cupcake had brought me to be. She was exactly the person I needed to talk to. Cookie gave me a knowing look. I gave her and Cupcake a pat, thinking they couldn't possibly read minds. You are not answering the question, cried B, her eyes sparkling in delight. I can see a few sparks between you and Armand. I rolled my eyes. Of friction, maybe. He's very arrogant and irritating. He's been demoted for a little while. It tends to get to a man who is proud of his position in the world, noted B as she took a sip of coffee. Would you like something to drink? Thank you, but no, I refused. I came by for a different reason. I would like your opinion. Right now there are just too many suspects in Bart's death, and I want to reduce the number. I thought all this questioning was to reduce the suspects on our list, frowned B. If anything, I have expanded the suspect pool, I moaned. I'm adding Melinda since she lied to us. Perhaps she likes Tristan enough to kill for him. A little extreme, I'll admit, but possible. Melinda has always been a bit too focused and determined to get what she wants, B nodded in agreement. What do you plan on doing? I don't know, I admitted. I would like to somehow coerce one of them into admitting their guilt, but I'm not sure how. I was hoping you might have an idea. B pursed her lips, thinking. She glanced at the book in front of her, drawing on an idea from her extensive reading of mystery novels. In the double-cross caper, the detective used a false clue. He told all the suspects something was going to happen, but it really wasn't. The detective was hoping to see if any of his suspects would take action by revisiting the crime scene. When only one suspect did, the detective knew who the murderer was. How would it work for us? I wondered, mulling over the idea. Maybe if we do it as a group. Each of us take on a suspect, letting it slip to the suspects we think a vital clue was left behind at the Tasty Treats Bakery. We'll be vague and just drop it into the conversation. B warmed up to the idea, enthusiasm gathering in her voice. Then someone can do a stakeout. They will watch the bakery to see who comes hunting to remove the incriminating evidence. Whoever does must be our guilty party. It could work, I nodded, liking the plan. However, the bakery is off-limits. The police have it, it still as a crime scene. None of us are going to break in, explained B. We just sit out front and observe what happens. If one of our suspects does break into the bakery, we'll call the cops. Then the police will have the suspect in hand who will have some explaining to do. It's a well-known fact the guilty person usually revisits the crime scene. Why? I asked curious. If I committed a crime, I think I would like to be as far away as possible. Some criminals don't think they'll get caught, and they want to watch what the police find out about them, answered B. Others are worried they might get caught and want to know just exactly what the police know. I guess they figure if the police find out too much, then they will flee. Usually by then, it's too late, and they get arrested. Criminals don't always make very good decisions. I think it's because they're usually anxious or arrogant. Either emotion isn't a good one to make choices with. I like the idea, I admitted. I'm not a particularly good liar, though. I'm not sure I could keep a straight face and tell someone the police left clue behind. What if they started asking questions? And what if they asked what the clue was or how I knew about it? You don't need to worry about it, assured B, patting my hand. You can't be the one to do the task. Why not? I questioned, a little affronted. Sure, I wasn't a great liar, but I could fudge the truth a little if the situation warranted it. 
Everyone knows you were investigating Bart's death. B shook her head. You've already questioned the suspects, and you can't just tell them they may have forgotten a clue at the crime scene without them getting suspicious. No, you let me and the others take care of this. She did have a point, I had to admit to myself. Then, when should we do it? Fergie could leave at town at any time. Tomorrow, first thing in the morning, decided B. I'll organize it, and you can stake out the Tasty Treats Bakery. Of course, we need more than just you there. Perhaps a few people can watch the bakery for any of our suspects. I think Tawny's granddaughter has some of those walkie-talkie things we can use to communicate. I'll ask her tomorrow. I grinned at B. This could work. Of course it could, B smiled back. You just leave it in my capable hands. I'll let you know when to begin your watch at the front of the bakery. Okay, I decided B had it under control. Wishing her a good night, Cupcake Cookie and I walked back to my trailer. We had a late snack together. Afterward, I had a shower, and then we all curled straight into bed. The next day was clear and cool in the morning. However, the weather forecast spoke of building heat and possible showers later in the day. I checked on Don Miller and his crew, who were busy fixing the hole in the clubhouse roof. A picnic table had been moved, so it was beside the building. Someone had put up an umbrella with it, and atop of the table was a cherry tablecloth weighed down with a couple of rocks. I gave it a distracted look. Don was pulling an extension cord out of the van. Some old lady says she's bringing us lemonade and cookies for our lunch. That's nice of her. I wondered which happy camper resident it was. I could think of a number of old ladies who fit the description. How's it going? Do you need anything? Already tore off the damaged part of the roof, grunted Don. Working on shoring up a few areas when we lay down a repair. Roof will look a little odd with one part not as faded as the rest, but it will keep out water. Good, I said in relief. As long as it keeps the inside dry, I am happy. I'm planning on having this done today. Tomorrow we can start on the office. Don headed for the ladder. When you want my nephew to come for the electrical. I thought about the kayak shack and all of the sites which needed electrical updating. Whenever he's available? I'm busy today, but any time after is good. Don nodded. I'll give him your number. His name is Evan. Good kid. Smart and knows his stuff. Great, I managed to smile. All I could see was dollar signs, but it was necessary to spend to update the electrical at the camping lots. The last thing I needed was for someone to plug in their camper and have a repeat of what had happened to me at the kayak shack. I couldn't afford to replace someone's camper because the electrical outlets were old and dangerous. I reminded myself that I had garnered a 10% discount for having hired Evan Miller. With a wave, I left the roofers to the work and headed for the dock. Tying Cupcake and Cookie in the shade so they could explore at their heart's delight, I opened the kayak shack to retrieve the painting supplies and stain I had stashed there overnight. Hours later, in the heat of the day, it was starting to wear on me and the sun climbed higher into the sky. The breeze, which had been so nice in the morning, left, leaving the air heavy and muggy. I hoped the stain would dry before any rain came. I would probably get a sunburn. With a flick of the paintbrush, I looked at my progress. The dock looked great. I was proud of the work I had done. All it needed was to get the last patch of wood where I was sitting. That was the point I suddenly realized my mistake. I had stained myself into a corner at the end of the dock. The lake water surrounded me, and the beach was a wet, stained dock away. I couldn't go across the dock without making marks in the stain. Huffing with annoyance, I stood, staining around my feet as best I could. Setting the brush on top of the can, I resigned myself to getting wet. Thankfully, a wooden ladder had been built onto the end of the dock. I was able to stain the last patches and head into the water with a closed can of stain and a paintbrush held high in the air as I paddled to the shore. Cookie barked excitedly at me while Cupcake whined for my safety as I came out of the water, clothes dripping. Wow, is there anything you don't do? An odd voice asked. Chapter 15 DIY Disaster Excuse me? I had an uncertain little laugh as Topher came to the beach, a towel over his arm. His pale form was clad in overly large swim trunks reaching past his knees, outfit complete with a pair of sandals. You do construction work? You run a business? And are starting another business, pointed out Topher. Rumor has it you're going to solve the latest murder. You are some sort of super person. Hardly, I smiled at his flattery. I'm just trying to do what I can. Well, the people at this campground think the world of you. He glanced at the dock. I guess the dock is out of commission for a little while. Maybe you should put up a sign. 
I guess I should. I hadn't really thought about it since most of my campers don't use it. I shrugged. Where are your friends? Some of them are sleeping in from last night, explained Topher. We had a little too much of fun at the local pub. One of the guys is taking a local girl out for the day, and another had to do some work for his boss, but he'll be back tonight. I thought I would just chill at the beach for a while. The water is nice, especially since the day has gotten so hot, I agreed. I was glad the group of tenters hadn't been any trouble with my regular campers. So far, I had heard no complaints from either side. Enjoy! Hey, what are you doing today? asked Topher. I was hoping to either stain the new boardwalk by the office or just put a coat of roofing on my camper. I shuddered a little. What's the matter? Don't like heights? grinned Topher in amusement at my lack of enthusiasm. Not particularly, I admitted. And let me, volunteered Topher. I'm a champ at heights. I'll help you out. I can't ask you to help, I protested. You're a guest. I won't take no for an answer, Topher insisted. I'm helping. Just lead the way. I'm sorry, but I can't allow you on a camper, I told him, the liability alone. You can stop talking now, Topher put his fingers in his ears. I can't hear words like liability and negligence or tort. I have to hear them at work, so I don't listen to them while on vacation. Now, I'm going to help you put on the roofing stuff, so lead the way. Despite myself, I smiled and gave in. Okay. Yes, my first construction job, exclaimed Topher in delight, unplugging his ears. Oh dear, I murmured, wondering what I had gotten myself into. Topher kept up a chatter of what he and his friends had been up to while we walked back to my camper with the doggies. Pulling out the roofing materials I had purchased, we read through the fine print. Looks pretty straightforward, commented Topher. I bet this can get done in an afternoon. Soon enough, a ladder was propped up to the camper and Topher expertly climbed it. I took my time, my heart in my throat. Topher took pity on me. You could just hand stuff up from down. It's not a big deal. This is my camper and I'm responsible for it, I murmured. Plus, I have an idea where the worst leaks are. I stubbornly helped with the patching and recoding, staying mainly towards the middle of the camper until Topher finally told me I was more in the way than helping. He could finish on his own and I would be safely on the ground. Grateful, I made my way to the ladder. The ground seemed extremely far away. I clutched at the top of the ladder, debating how I was going to get down. Don't look at the ground, advised an amused Topher. Easy for you to say, I muttered. The distance I needed to cross from the camper to roof to the ladder suddenly looked like a large chasm which couldn't be crossed. Ivy. Topher set down his tools, coming to crouch down right beside me, oblivious as to how close he was to the edge. You can do this! One step at a time. I took a deep breath, tamping down my fears. Okay. With jerky movements and Topher's help, I managed to get back onto the ladder. Topher coached me as I slowly made my way back down towards solid ground. That's it. Just a few more steps. I looked up at Topher, pleased I had survived my little adventure. Only a few more rungs to go. I'm good. You can finish and I'll get us some... I was about to tell him I would fetch us a snack when I heard a loud crack and my foot went through the ladder rung. I scrambled to find my balance, only to fall sideways, taking the now broken ladder with me. Ivy, grasped Topher, watching me fall. Oof! I hit the ground hard. Pain shooting up my ankles, I sprawled onto my back in the grass, looking up at the blue sky and trees. The next thing I knew, Topher was right there, holding up a couple of fingers. How many fingers? What is your name? Do you remember what day it is? he asked anxiously. How did you get down from the camper without a ladder? I questioned in alarm, pushing his hand out of my face. I jumped, Topher shrugged, starting to calm down a little. Are you okay? My ankle hurts, I admitted. Otherwise, I seem to be fine. Topher quickly checked my ankle. He gave a whistle. Your foot is swollen pretty bad. You should probably get it checked. It's fine, I sat up, ignoring the stabbing pain from my ankle as I moved it. I'll put some ice on it. Could be broken, Ivy, he warned. It's just a sprain, I insisted. I hoped it was just a sprain. I couldn't afford a broken ankle. I'll stay off it, and in a few days it'll be good as new. Okay, a doubtful Topher helped me stand. He assisted me to sit in one of the Muskoka chairs. Topher got me some ice out of the camper, a cold drink, and watered the Bosties as well. Setting the ladder upright, he avoided the broken rung and climbed back up to the roof of the camper to finish the job we had started. My phone chirped as I gratefully took a sip of my drink. Sighing, I saw it was from B. Hi, B. 
We are ready, declared an excited bee. All you need to do is get in front of the bakery somewhere out of sight, but you need to have a good view. In all of the excitement of getting some projects done, I had forgotten all about the stakeout we had been planning. Oh no, what about the dogs? Agatha is coming right now to take care of Cupcake and Cookie, explained Bee. She also has your walkie-talkie. Sure enough, I could see Agatha marching forward along the path, her tiny form determined in her mission. Okay, I murmured, but Bee had already hung up. I quickly drank a few swallows of my drink, then carefully got up. Hopping to the camper, I retrieved my purse and keys. Hey, where are you going? called out Topher. I have an emergency, I answered with a wave. Thanks for all your help on the roof. Agatha handed me the walkie-talkie. Don't change the channel. This is how you turn it on, and here is the volume. Now, go catch the killer! I grinned at her enthusiasm and hopped into the car. It took a little over five minutes before I was parked across from the Tasty Treats Bakery. I slumped in my seats, watching the bakery and waiting for something to happen. Are you in place? came B's voice over the static of the walkie-talkie. Which one of us are you talking to? came Conrad's voice back just as I was about to answer. You need to be specific. I suppose I was talking to each of you, grumbled B. I'm in place, Herb told us. I'm in the park, watching the side alley. I'm at the back door of the dental office, informed Conrad. I can see out the south side of the back alley if someone approaches. Thelma, barked B. Are you in position yet? There was a moment before Thelma replied. I'm here, B. I'm at the back window of the luscious lock salon. I can see the other side of the alley. Ivy, asked B. I'm across the street from the front of the building, I spoke into the walkie-talkie. Great. Then we're all in our places, came B's satisfied response. Where are you? grumbled Conrad. I am in the storyteller's loft. The used bookstore beside the Tasty Trees Bakery, answered B. If you recall, there's an adjoining door between the two businesses. It helps them capitalize on each other's customers. Now we have all the entrances watched. We'll be sure to see if anyone tries to get into the bakery. I slumped further in my car, watching out the window, trying to make it look like my car was unoccupied. Hours later, I had a crimp in my back, and my ankle was throbbing. Businesses were closing for the night, and it was starting to rain. I was terribly hungry. B, I questioned softly. Maybe we should call it a day. No, came the stubborn reply. We wait. The suspect won't want to be seen, and will be more apt to wait until night to try to break in. I yawned. I should have been baking today for Saturday's farmer's market. I checked my watch. It confirmed it was past supper time. The rain beat down harder, and people were starting to leave the downtown area unless it was near the restaurants or bars. The passenger door ripped open and someone sat down next to me. Are you crazy? I groaned at the sight of a wet Armand shutting the passenger door. Then I grinned. He did not look comfortable in my tiny, compact little vehicle with his tall body. It was kind of funny, in my opinion, so I chirped, How are you doing today? Being driven out of my mind, he glared at me, by a petite woman who can't stop interfering in Philippe's business. I smiled happily. Did you bring anything to eat? I'm starving. Why would I bring something to eat? growled Armand. More importantly, why are you parked for the entire day outside of my crime scene? This is not your crime scene, I pointed out in a smug voice. You are not the detective on the case. No, he pulled out a pad and pen. I'm the officer who is writing tickets right now, and I failed to see you feed the meter once. I frowned, trying to look out the window, but Armand was in the way. There isn't a meter here, is there? Put in by the town just this week, Armand muttered darkly. It means I get to write you a ticket. I slumped. Please don't. Tell me why you were here, he negotiated, pen hovering over the ticket pad. This isn't very nice, I muttered. No one said I was nice. A hard edge was in Armand's voice as he spoke. What are you doing, spying on the Tasty Trees Bakery, Ivy? Trying to figure out who killed Bart Baker, I admitted. We have a theory the killer will return to the crime scene. Someone has been watching too much crime television, commented an unamused Armand. Someone revisiting the crime scene is not likely to happen. My eyes scattered away from his, looking at the walkie-talkie on the dash. You and your seniors are on a stakeout, he surmised. What aren't you telling me? A lot, I muttered. The car seemed too small suddenly. 
Armand was taking up too much space. Ivy, he practically growled. Fine, I huffed. V came up with an idea. We let it slip. The police may have missed a clue at the bakery, then see who shows up to try to figure out what our fake clue is. Whoever does is the killer. Armand ran a hand over his jaw. His serious eyes met mine. What did you expect to do if one of your suspects show up? Confront the killer? This is dangerous. No, I protested. We aren't stupid. If someone does come and tries to break into the bakery, we're going to call the police. Then the police would question the person and maybe it would set Jackson free. Stickers and a possible break-in at the bakery aren't going to set a murder suspect free, sighed Armand. It isn't enough. Then the stickers are important? I questioned uncertainly. Yes. Armand put his ticket pad and pen away. He looked out at the rain, which was falling pretty hard now, contemplating what to do. His features hardened foreboding in the waning light. I bit my lip, hoping he might, just might, start talking about the case. The street lights turned on, bathing the area in some light even as the rain combated it. A movement appeared out of the corner of my eye, and I turned my head to see the Tasty Treats bakery just in time to see someone peering into the window, hands cupped around their face as they stood under the awning. They were dressed in dark clothes, with a hoodie up, hiding the majority of their head. It could be him, I breathed in excitement, forgetting I was supposed to wait to see if the person broke in, or call the other members of my senior stakeout team, or to even call the cops. I opened the door of my car, jumping to my feet and exclaimed, Hey, you! The person turned, spotted me, and ran. I tried to run after the fleeing figure, but I felt the terrible pain my foot gave out. I landed in the street with a thud, rain pouring on me. I could hear Armand run past me, then stop, letting out a string of expletives and other not-so-nice words. He came back, crouching beside me as I sat up, holding on to my injured leg. You need to chase him, I pointed to where the shadowy figure had disappeared into the night. He's getting away! Instead, Armand pulled out a pocket flashlight, flicking it on. He put it in his mouth as he used both his hands to pull off my sneaker and gently prod my ankle. I let out a hiss of pain, followed shortly by a whimper. Taking the flashlight and putting it back in his pocket, he grimaced, Your ankle is likely broken. No, I shook my head. I can't afford a broken ankle. It's probably just a sprain. I'll ice it and it will be fine. It is purple and twice the normal size. Armand stood up. He left me to go rummaging around in my car, then locking the doors before he returned. What are you doing? I asked as he handed my purse to me. I'm driving you to the nearest after-hours clinic. Armand crouched down, handing me my sneaker as well. There's no way I'm going to be able to drive this tiny contraption of yours. My foot will never lift high enough to hit the clutch. We will go in my vehicle. There is no clutch, I mentioned as he slipped an arm under my knees, the other around my back. I quickly put my arm around his broad shoulders to help balance myself. I can stand and hop. How is there no clutch? grunted Armand as he stood, carrying me. It has a manual stick shift. A car is a semi-automatic, so a clutch isn't needed, I explained. You can put me down. You want to hop all the way to the police station where my car is? He questioned wryly. I didn't. However, I also didn't want to have him carrying me downtown in the rain, no matter how much my ankle was throbbing. It was disconcerting, to say the least. I can drive myself. It's your right ankle, he replied. You shouldn't be driving. We are both going to be soaked by the time we get to your car, I grumbled. I don't need to go to the clinic. You need an x-ray to determine if the ankle is broken, he insisted. Why are you being so stubborn about this? I let my health insurance lapse, I admitted quietly. A muscle ticked in Armand's jaw, a sign he didn't like what he was hearing. Before I could help myself, I found I was trying to explain my decision. I'm usually healthy and hardly ever use it. It was going to only be for a little while, just a stopgap measure so I could use the money around the campground for important things, I told him. I didn't think I would need it so soon. Important things, Armand shook his head. What is more important than your health? Stopping roofs from leaking, I pointed out, or anyone from being electrocuted, or the water and electricity from being cut off for non-payment? Those are pretty important. I'm sure the town would like the back taxes so the campground doesn't get foreclosed on. Armand's face softened a little as he listened. I didn't realize it was that bad. If you recall, you did call the place a dump when you first saw it, I said dryly. Grandma left me with a lot of bills, and I'm trying to get it functioning as a business. I can't afford an x-ray or a doctor's visit. 
you're still going to the clinic. Armand walked to a nice black SUV in the parking lot of the police department. You need the x-ray. We don't know it's broken, I pleaded as he set me down, fishing in his pocket for his keys and unlocking the car. It could just be a sprain. Sprains heal fine on their own with a little downtime. Broken bones don't heal by themselves. Sometimes they need a little medical help, warned Armand, opening the passenger door for me. The last thing you need is a long-lasting effects because you refuse to get your foot treated. I hesitated. I knew he was right. This would just be one more bill to add to the pile. With Armand's help, I climbed into the vehicle and endured the ride to the clinic in silence. My stomach rumbled. Armand helped me out of the SUV. I hopped for a couple of feet before he just picked me up again, striding through the automatic doors. At the instructions of a nurse practitioner, I was set on a bed. Armand stood back, folding his arms and watching the proceedings. I completed paperwork admitting I had no insurance and no idea of how I was going to pay for any of the services they rendered. Thankfully, I was assured I could put the whole thing on payments. At the word payments, I tried not to wince. Soon enough, I had my ankle poked thoroughly, had a couple of x-rays, and was told I had a fracture. Armand gave me a look that basically proved his superiority. I gave him a dark look in return while being fitted for an obscenely expensive air cast. The boot, which looked like they would do any skier proud, now gazed my foot, accompanied by a pair of children's crutches since they didn't make adult crutches in my size. The crutches were lime green in color. Thanking the clerk at the desk, I ran my credit card through the machine for the first payment. Fingers crossing in silent hope, miracle of miracles, the credit card company didn't realize I had overstended my limit and pay the payment. The only other option would be to take it from my Ethel Murley fund, which was legally supposed to be used exclusively for the repairs of the campground. My inheritance was running out fast. I'm sorry, the card is declined, the woman stated with pity in her eyes. Can we try it again? I asked softly. Here, Armand stepped forward. I've got this. No, I stated firmly. You're not paying for this. I made you come to the clinic. Armand wiped his card through the machine before I could protest further. You will pay me back at some point. I could add it to the groceries I still owed him for, I thought silently to myself. My card had declined at the food mart last month when I was purchasing items for my grandmother's memorial. Armand had been in line behind me and had paid for my purchases. Annoyed, I put my card away, taking the receipt. Since the town pharmacy was also closed, they had given me a small amount of pain medication and a prescription for the next day. Have a nice night, the clerk at the desk said as we made our way back outside. Armand's SUV was still in the way of the doors. He opened the passenger door for me. Tired, cold from the air conditioning on my wet clothes, and super hungry, I got in the vehicle. Armand rummaged around the back of the vehicle a moment before getting into the driver's seat. Here. He held out another police hoodie to me, and I gratefully took it, wrapping it around me before putting on my seatbelt. Armand started the vehicle and we drove for a while before I realized he was pulling up to a local restaurant, the Groovy Grill. It was nearly empty. They close in about twenty minutes, noted Armand. What do you want? I'll get it to go. I don't know what they have. I have never been here, I admitted. The restaurant is basically a burgers and fries sort of place, clarified Armand. Then burger and fries, I chose. I wondered why he was paying out for dinner, then decided I didn't care. I was too hungry to argue with him and would just add it to the grand total I already owed him. In the meanwhile, you can read this. Armand reached between the driver's seat and the console, extracting a file. On one condition. Chapter 16 A Bargain Made I looked at the file which was remarkably similar to the one he had been reading in the park. Is that the file about Bart's death? It is, he confirmed. The file is yours to read on two conditions. Hey, I protested. It was just one before. One, you keep quiet about this. The last thing I need is for the department to find out I shared police information with you. Two, you need to tell me everything you know about Bart's death and promise to stop pursuing his killer. The little stunt you pulled tonight could have gotten you killed, Armand scowled. That's three conditions, I noted, eyeing the folder. It was certainly tempting. I'll add a fourth if you want, promised Armand grimly. I'll agree to the three, I said archly, on one condition. Armand sighed. What? 
I want you to keep me apprised of what's happening with the investigation, I shrewdly negotiated. I want to know what's going on and what you're doing to find Bart's killer. I don't want you just suddenly shutting me out of the investigation as soon as I hand over what we have found out. Fine, Armand agreed. Read the file. I happily took the file as he left the car. Armand must have hit a brick wall in the investigation to want to trade information with me. Touching one of the interior lights, I scanned the reports. There were the lab results, indicating strychnine from the pesticide had been in the poison. It was the apricots, as I had guessed. I assumed Armand had scribbled the word stickers on the photo of the fruit. There were two question marks surrounding the words, Why Apricots?, followed by a note it was well known Bart loved the fruit and would order double the first few weeks of the season just to eat the extras. Anyone who knew Bart might know that he would eat the fruit, and with such a quick time before symptoms of poisoning then death set in, it was likely no one else would be poisoned. I flipped a page, finding a small treatise on different types of apricots from domestic varieties to those imported. Food Mart, where the stickers were generated for, had a different variety than what Jackson had on his farm. Armand had determined the origins of the apricots were not from this country. There were no fingerprints on the container of poison found at Grubb's farm. They couldn't find any evidence that the pesticide had been used on the farm. Armand had gone through the same list of suspects I had. However, it appeared Tristan did have an alibi. He was seen by several people at the Renaissance Festival in a neighboring town. He had left Thursday night and didn't return until Saturday afternoon, after Bart was poisoned. Bart had gotten his weekly order from Grubbs Saturday morning at 7.30 in the morning. Someone had to have switched out the apricots fairly quickly. The person who switched out the apricots would have to have access to the area near the kitchen. Maurice also had an alibi, according to Armand. He was boating with his family. Armand had tracked down a few witnesses who had indeed seen him at the lake, according to their statements. The detective had also interviewed Fergie, finding her story the same as what she had told me. Since she had been with her film crew the entire time, Armand had stroked her off the list of suspects as well, leaving just Tacky and Horace. Armand didn't seem to believe Horace was involved in the murder. Tacky was obviously Armand's best suspect. He had copious notes on the White Oaks chef, which ended abruptly when he had found out Tacky had been at baking competition, leaving late Friday and returning Sunday. Armand really was at a brick wall. I felt like the man who I had seen in the bakery tonight was taller than Tacky anyways. It certainly hadn't been Melinda or Fergie. I sighed, shuffling through the paperwork, trying to find what we had missed. The door opened and Armand slipped in, followed closely by the smell of delicious food. Handing me a drink, he pulled out of a brown bag a container for me. I didn't know what sauce you wanted, so everything is in the bag. I practically drooled as I opened my container. Thick-cut golden fries stared back at me. A juicy burger with all the trimmings and a container of gravy. Complete joy, in my opinion. Armand took out his own container, popping a fry into his mouth. Your thoughts on the file? <laughs> You're at a dead end, I remarked, digging through the bag and sorting through the sauces to see if I wanted any of them. What is this? It's cheese. Armand took it out of my hand, ripping open the bag. Why would you want cheese? Isn't it already on your burger? I frowned. I am about to introduce you to one of the best sloppy foods there is. He spread half the grated cheese on his fries, then dumped the rest on mine. Hey, I wasn't sure I liked this. You do like gravy, right? Armand suddenly asked. Yes, I answered. I liked most sauces. Put the gravy over the cheese. It will melt it. Armand happily dumped his gravy on his own fries. Normally cheese curds are used, but in a pinch this works. Why? I carefully followed suit, wondering if the cheese was going to add any layer of flavor to a good gravy. Really, could it even be tasted through all the rich sauce? It's called poutine. It's a Canadian thing. He shrugged, handing me a plastic fork before digging into his own. I am at a dead end when it comes to the investigation. My last suspect is Horace Retz, and I don't believe he did it. Bad for business to have a body show up in the store of a landlord is trying to rent. Are you Canadian? I wondered. No, I have family up there, Armand said shortly. You miss Melinda, whatever her last name is, I remarked, carefully trying the cheese and gravy concoction on the fries. It was delicious. Just delicious. I decided Canadians might be okay if they enjoyed food like this. She is part of the amateur playgroup and does beauty pageant coaching. Melinda Stratton, 
questioned Armand curiously. How did she make your suspect list? Suddenly I wondered how he knew exactly who I was talking about. Armand hadn't been in town much longer than I had, yet he knew the name of the former beauty queen. Ignoring the curiosity, I continued, she lied to me about where Tristan was. Plus, I've been told she likes Tristan so much she would do anything for him. You thought Melinda might have killed Bart? A disbelieving Armand asked. She made the list, I shrugged. However, I think we can both agree the person outside of the bakery tonight was a man. There is no way to tell for certain if the person outside the bakery tonight was Bart's killer, pointed out Armand as he took a big bite of burger. I dipped burger in the gravy before taking a bite out of it. There is no reason for anyone to be looking at the window of Tasty Tree's bakery except our suspect. That's why we set the trap. Plus, this guy ran. Running doesn't indicate guilt, observed Armand. The way you burst out of your car screaming, I would run too. Unfair. I rebuked before taking a long drink and another mouthful of fries. What else have you found out? He enjoyed another bite of burger. I told you about the stickers already, I pointed out. Melinda's a liar. The killer, which I do believe is the guy who ran at the bakery, is therefore male and still here in Oaks Crossing. That's it? Armand said in disbelief. That's all you have found out? To be fair, we had the same suspects and came to the same conclusions, I remarked. I gave my entire file to you, and all you have in return is Melinda. Armand shook his head in disbelief. I think I got played. There is something else, I replied, slightly irritated at his comment. What? sighed Armand. I don't know. At his frustrated look, I explained. That's the thing. There has to be something else, something we are missing. Whether it's a suspect or clue, something is missing or we are overlooking something vital to the case. We both looked through the material again, trying to see if we could pinpoint what might have been overlooked. Sighing in satisfaction, I finished off my fries and burger, sipping the soda. Where do you put it all? Armand gave me a look of bemusement as he put my garbage in the brown bag. You're tiny and you just took down a full meal. I like to eat. I quickly rescued the sauces and threw them in my purse for later. Unless you want the sauces. They're all yours, said a generous Armand. Speaking of food, I mentioned, I still can't understand why one of my brownies was in Bart's hand with a bite out of it. However, no brownie was found in Bart's stomach. The only thing I can think of is the murderer took a bite and put it there. But why? My guess is one of Fergie's entourage accidentally dropped it and it landed where it did by luck, replied Armand. The group was high when the police came to the murder scene. Maybe one of them put it in Bart's hand as a joke and won't admit to it. I digested his words in the food, thinking that he might just be right. I continued to look through the file as Armand pulled out of the parking lot. I was so engrossed in the file, I nearly missed him driving past my bug. Hey, are you going to stop and let me get my car? Nope, Armand kept driving. Your right foot is in a cast. You can't drive. I'll drop you off at the campground and someone else can pick up your car. I decided not to argue since he had supplied me with food and a file full of facts. What about leaving the car overnight? Will it be towed? I put a piece of police tape on the driver's side mirror, explained Armand. It won't be towed or ticketed. Thank you, I said graciously, looking over the picture from Fergie and Bart's culinary class again. Something was bothering me about it, and I didn't know what. Armand pulled up outside my camper. Shutting off the vehicle, he came around to open the passenger door and help me out. Unlocking my camper, I hesitated at the steps. Where are the dogs? inquired Armand. With Agatha. Putting my crutches aside, I hopped up the steps with one foot and bracing my hands on the sides of the door. Once inside, Armand handed me the crutches. If you think of anything, let me know, Armand said, and no more chasing after people or trying to find the murderer yourself. It's my job, not yours. I stuck my tongue out at his retreating form as he got back into his SUV. When getting ready for bed, I realized I had left the entire stakeout crew on their own at the Tasty Treats Bakery. Grabbing my phone, I called B to tell them the murderer was a man, and he had gotten away. You had a date with a streamy buttered rum latte? gasped Molly in awe. She leaned forward in excitement. How was it? Did you kiss? It was not a date, I exclaimed. There were no kisses. 
"'Honey, the boy took you to dinner, and you spent the evening together.' Thelma raised an eyebrow, fanning herself with a magazine to get some relief from the heat. "'It's a date.' "'Even if they didn't kiss at the end?' wondered Agatha. "'I think a kiss would be essential to a date.' "'He paid for a food, didn't he?' inserted B. "'It was not a date,' I grumbled, repeating myself. We were gathered in the kitchen as Molly and I baked again in preparation for the next farmer's market. The detective and I discussed the case. Plus, we went to the clinic for my foot. "'He actually let you see the file?' questioned a surprised Conrad as he pitted cherries for me. I would have liked to have seen the autopsy report. He did let me read the file. I repeated an earlier statement I had made before we were all sidetracked by the matchmaking ladies in the group. However, I didn't find much in the file we didn't already know. The only difference is Armand was able to confirm alibis. Tacky, Maurice, and Tristan are all off the list. Does that mean Horace is our guy? Agatha scrunched up her face a little. She measured out sugar for a recipe. I would have never thought rats would be a killer. I don't think he is, I confessed. Neither does Armand, which means we have zero suspects right now. His first name is Luca, mentioned Thelma with a raised eyebrow. Tawny Tilbury told me. I rolled my eyes and turned on the stand mixer, drowning them out in the noise for a moment. Thinking about Tawny Tilbury, I remembered I hadn't mentioned my visit with her at the tea house, nor had I told Armand about the strange reaction from Fergie's crew or the mayor. What was it Tawny had said? One of the members of Fergie's crew had asked if she had known what he had done? If Tawny was such a good mind reader, then she should turn him in? I wonder if I recalled the wording correctly. I stopped the mixer thinking about it. Had it been a confession? Why would one of Fergie's crew kill Bart, unless they thought they were protecting Fergie somehow? Poor Ava, breathed Thelma. The girl is going to be heartbroken if we can't figure out a way to get Jackson out of jail. Molly, do you still have the class picture with Fergie and Bart on your phone? I questioned suddenly. Sure, she pulled out her phone, tapping at it until she got to the correct picture. Here. I took the phone. Using my fingers to make the picture larger, I looked through all of the classmates carefully. What is it? questioned B. What are you looking for? I stopped, the bottom of my stomach sinking. He was right there. The whole time, he was in the photo. Younger, thinner, a goofy grin on his face, but in the photo for anyone to notice. Somehow, we had all missed it. I supposed it was because we had not been looking for him. I grabbed my phone, dialing for my contact list. Look at the class photo, I immediately said, skipping the formalities of a greeting. Bottom left, third person in the second row. It's him. The guy who does the sound for Fergie. He's the one who totes around the boom mic. His name is Connor. It looks like the guy, Armand admitted after a pause. I think he killed Bart, I stated, excitement in my voice. Why? A curious Armand asked. What motive could we have? I don't know the motive, I admitted. However, after the murder, the film crew and Fergie went to Tawny's tea shop. She heard them talking about the scene at the bakery. And one of the guys, it could have been Connor, accused Tawny of mind reading and that she knew what he had done. It may have been a confession. The police report stated that they were all high from your edible brownies. This Connor guy might just be one of the few people who get paranoid when they're on pot, pointed out Armand. Or he could have killed Bart Baker, I retorted. Are you going to question him? To prevent you from trying to question him? Yes, I will, replied Armand. I think Fergie's crews are supposed to leave today. I'll make sure to drop by before they go and talk to him. Good, I smiled as I ended the call. So now you're telling the haughty detective everything? Molly wondered. We made a deal, I gave Molly back her phone. I tell him what we know, and he will pursue it for us on the condition he tells us the results. Not as much fun as if we were investigating it for ourselves, murmured B. I'm sorry, I sighed. However, I wanted to read what was in the file. Molly cocked her head to the side. Technically, you said you wouldn't go chasing any more suspects, right? That means everyone here is still fully capable of investigating without violating the terms of your agreement with buttered rum latte. Why does she keep referring to Detective Armand as a latte? grumbled Conrad. 
Trust Molly to find a loophole, I thought. Technically, you are right. However, I doubt Armand is going to see it that way. And Molly has a thing for describing people as food items. It's a game we used to play, grinned Molly. The more delicious the food, the more delicious the guy. That's just inappropriate, commented Conrad. Thelma and Bee looked at each other, intrigued. Isn't that a little tacky? questioned Agatha as she thought over the food-describing game. I'm high-classed white trash, commented an unconcerned Molly. Tacky is kind of my jam. However, I inserted, diverting their attention so the discussion wouldn't get out of hand, I'm sure Amon meant all of us when he asked me to promise we wouldn't go confronting any suspects. Conrad let out a harumph. Do you think it was him? asked Agatha. One of Fergie's crew members? I do, I nodded. I'm not sure why. However, I really do think he might have done it. He has a history with Bard as well. It's something Armand will have to question him about it. It's hardly fair, pouted B. This was our investigation, too. I feel like we should be able to ask this person questions. Please don't. I gave them a firm look. Armand said he would let us know what happens. If we go back on the deal, we may never get any information which could help Jackson. Has anyone asked the food mart who bought the apricots? wondered Conrad. What do you mean? found Thelma. Well, they must have some sales records who bought the apricots the day before the murder, mused Conrad. You know, how they traced your banking information and cross-reference it. Maybe something similar can be done. I picked up my phone, calling the detective again. Armand, came his reply. Has anyone checked who bought the apricots the day before the murder? I asked. Could you do that using store records? Then you might be able to find a suspect. I can't get access to banking records, Armand said shortly. I'm technically not on the case, remember? However, I did have one of the rookies put in a request for the video footage for a couple days before the murder. Hopefully, after sifting through hours of tape, he will find something usable. Oh, I felt a bit deflated over our big idea. Okay. Anything else before I write up my next parking infraction? Armand wanted to know. No, not really, I murmured. Bye. I ended the call, telling the group what I had heard. I'm not going to do it, declared B. She stopped cutting squares, setting her down her knife, and pulling off her apron. I can't sit idly by and wait for us to be told if something is going to happen or not. I'm going to talk to this film crew person. I'm with you, Conrad set down his implements, wiping his hands on a towel. No, I tried to rein them in. I promised Armand we wouldn't. You promised for yourself, honey. Thelma untied her apron, setting it on the counter. You can't very well promise for others. Hey, stop, I exclaimed, watching them leave. You might want to catch up to them, advised Molly. They are your grannies and grampies. I grabbed my crutches, following as fast as I could. Chapter 17 Kidnapped I can't believe we are doing this, I muttered as Thelma drove us to the Bluebell's bed and breakfast. She pulled up in the parking lot. We have to do this, declared B. It's for Ava and Jackson. I do hope those two will finally be together, sighed Thelma as she turned off the engine. They are the cutest couple if Jackson will just realize it. I'll have a talk with him once he's out of jail, decided Conrad. Sometimes a boy just needs his eyes open to see the truth. They were so meddlesome, I thought privately. I carefully got out of the car, grabbing my crutches. I don't think Ava would appreciate it, Conrad. I'm sure she would rather have things progress in a natural time. Might never happen then, grunted Conrad. We all entered the building, coming to the front desk. I waited with high hopes for the teenage girl to turn the group down flat, as she had when Molly and I had first inquired after Fergie a few days ago. "'Bluebell's bed and breakfast. How can I help you today?' she inquired politely. "'We are here to see Fergie,' blurted out Conrad, "'and the people who work for her.' "'I'm sorry, I can't help you,' the teenager gently replied. "'Why not?' demanded B. "'We know they are here. We just need to speak to them privately. It's police business.' "'Are you a police officer?' asked the teenage clerk doubtfully. "'Well, uh, no,' sputtered B. "'I'm a retired coroner.' inserted Conrad. Honey, Thelma waved off Conrad and B. 
What they mean to say is there are some questions involving a murder which need to be resolved. To get some answers, we need to speak to the men who work for Fergie. We don't even need to talk to her. Now, would you be so kind as to fetch them, or have us escorted to their rooms? I leaned against the counter to better watch the confrontation and take some of the weight off of my foot. I was still getting used to the crutches. Glancing down, I noticed the guest registry. I can't do that, she repeated. Why ever not? groused Conrad. Because they left this morning, I noticed, pointing to the entry in the book. The clerk snatched it away from me. I'm sorry, but unless you are going to book accommodations, you need to leave. They're gone, exclaimed a disappointed Thelma. How will we question the guy from the culinary class photo? We let Armand figure it out, I told them. There is nothing else we can do. With a lot of grumbling, I led the seniors back to the Mercury. We returned to the campground kitchen where they dejectedly got back to helping me bake. How did it go? asked Molly. Did you find anything out? Just that our best suspect has skipped town, muttered an unhappy bee. Maybe we can figure out where they are going, I mentioned slowly. They have to have some sort of tour schedule. Then we can confront him later, bee brightened considerably. I decided not to say that it would be unlikely that we would get the opportunity to confront them on tour. A group of seniors were chatting so happily about the prospect, I didn't have the heart to put a damper on their mood. Remembering my ill-decided attempt to confront the shadowy figure before at the bakery, I suddenly had an idea of all which might have gone wrong. Maybe I should invest in some self-defense lessons, I thought to myself. However, after this investigation, I had no reason to pursue any others. I was only doing this as a favor to Ava. Hours later, we were finished in the kitchen. I looked at the long list of improvements the health inspector had left and resolved the repairs would need to get done this week if we were to get our pass certificate. I asked Thelma for a ride to town so I could pick up my bug and hit the handy hardware store for supplies I would be needing for the kitchen improvements. True to Armand's word, the bug had no tickets, and it was still parked where I had left it. Thanking Thelma for the ride, I carefully drove it using my left foot to the hardware store and got the supplies I needed. It came out to a pretty penny, and I hoped we would make it up in sale soon for the baking booth. I also stopped at the Oaks Crossing Weekly newspaper office, asking if they did business cards. While I wouldn't have the cards for the farmer's market this weekend, once I did have them, I could just hand them out to prospective customers, which would be a lot easier. Happy with my design choices and the supplies for the kitchen, I crutched my way back to my car, noticing the crime scene tape for the Tasty Treats Bakery had been taken down. The business was still closed, and a sign hung in the window. I came closer to read it. The Tasty Treats is under construction, and will reopen soon under new management. Stay tuned for details about the grand reopening. Making the place look different was probably a good idea. Then people wouldn't associate the bakery with the death of Bart quite as much. I briefly wondered if it had been Horace or Maurice's idea, then decided it really didn't matter. Just as I was about to turn away from the door, I thought I saw something move in the shadows of the shop. Perhaps Maurice was there, although it seemed odd with the lights being off. Just to be sure the shop wasn't being broken into, I checked the front door and found it unlocked. Hello? I carefully asked, propping the door open with a crutch. Is anyone here? There was silence in the shop. I looked at the door lock, trying to get the bolt to work, but it appeared to be, have been broken. Taking my phone out of my purse, I decided to call Armand. It was odd. The door was unlocked, and I couldn't just leave with the building not being secure. Anyone could come in and take something. A hand snaked out, grabbing me by the arm, pulling me off balance. I dropped the phone, my purse, the shopping bags, and a crutch as I hobbled to keep myself upright. I squeaked in surprise as a man pulled me further into the shadows of the bakery. "'How did you know?' an anguished voice said. "'How did you guess? It was the perfect crime. I made sure of it. No one should have guessed it. Yet you did.' I stared in horror at the sight of Connor, who was part of Fergie's entourage. I was alone, in the Tasty Treats Bakery, with the man who had probably killed Bart Baker. I couldn't think of any other reason for what he was saying. My mouth moved, but no sound came out. He seemed to make up his mind about something. Pulling out a stool, Connor pointed at it. Sit down. I obediently sat, glad he had let go of my arm. I thought about my options. I couldn't possibly outrun him. I had no idea if my call to Armand had gotten through, or if I was on my own. Perhaps I could talk to Connor, convince him to let me go. Yet what should I say, I wondered. 
He began to pace the small room, keeping to the shadows. Running a hand through his hair, he suddenly turned to me. Where is it? What? I squeaked in surprise. My mind drew a complete blank of what he might be talking about. The clue! He leaned forward, a hand on either side of me, bracing against Bart's cashier's countertop. One of your lackeys let it slip to Fergie that there was a clue in the bakery which was going to lead the police to the murderer. Where is the clue? The clue is gone, I shrugged helplessly. The police took it. What was the clue? He demanded, face perilously close to mine. The photo of your culinary class, I told him. The one which had all three of you in it. You, Bart, and Fergie. He had a photo of us? Connor breathed in disbelief. After all this time, Bart kept a photo of us? I nodded emphatically. On the wall, here, at the bakery. It was framed. Then the police know. He backed up abruptly, starting to pace again. Yes, I readily agreed. The police know everything. At least, I certainly hoped one particular policeman knew exactly what was going on right now. I tried to glance behind Connor to see if my phone might have called Armand. However, it was face down, so I couldn't tell. We need to leave, decided Connor. We? I questioned, my voice coming out a little high with anxiety. Both of us, nodded Connor. He grabbed my arm in a punishing grip. Where is your car? You can drive me out of here. Why not take your own car? I questioned as he dragged me to my feet. I don't have a car here. I told the group to leave without me and I would get a rental. I made up an excuse saying I'd booked a flight since my mother was sick and I needed to go back home to see her, answered Connor. He propelled me toward the door. You can drive. I can't drive. I pointed to my foot with my free hand. I have a cast on my right foot. I'm not allowed to operate a vehicle. Then I'll drive, he opted. Give me your keys. They are in my purse, I gestured to my bag on the floor. You can just take the keys. I'll just stay here and you can take the car. Shut up. Connor let go of me to grab my purse. He rooted through it to find the set of keys. Once he had the keys, he tossed my bag back onto the floor. You're coming with me. I swallowed hard. Maybe I could trip and manage to get a hold of my phone. I took an exaggerated step over one of my shopping bags, pretending to trip on it. I was just beginning to fall before Connor caught me. Let's go, he growled, shoving me along. I looked longingly at my phone one last time as we headed out the door. Which way, he asked, holding onto my arm. Left, I answered. The streets were quiet. It was the end of the business day, and most places were in the process of closing. I didn't have much hope anyone would spot us and think it was suspicious I was being forcibly helped by a stranger. Coming upon the bug, I stopped. This is it. This? He looked in disbelief at the compact vehicle. You are more than welcome to take it, I offered once again, hoping it would just take the car and leave me here. You'll just call the cops and report it stolen. He unlocked the passenger door, wrenching it open. Get in! I awkwardly slid in, looking around the street to see if I might see anyone who I might call out for help, but the street was empty. Pulling my crutch in, I flinched as Connor slammed the door. Connor got in the driver's seat, hunching over the wheel, his too tall body filling the space. He started the car and seemed confused by the lack of clutch. The car is a semi-automatic, I hastily explained. It doesn't drive like a normal car. Maybe you should just take someone else's vehicle. I'll figure it out. With a determined look, Connor shoved the stick into first and started driving, laying on the gas. I put on my seatbelt. We drove through the town before Connor's mood seemed to change. I hadn't planned on this, confided Connor. Well, I mean, I planned to kill Bart. I just needed him to leave Fergie alone, you know? If he would have just left her alone, it would have been fine. Yet, Bart wouldn't leave Fergie alone, I echoed, hoping to keep Connor talking. The longer he talked, the longer I was alive. Exactly, exclaimed Connor in agreement. He always wanted money. If she didn't pay him, he would expose her as a fraud. He would show her pre-plastic and weight loss surgery pictures to the press. He would leak the story that she'd been kicked out of culinary school. His list just kept going on and on. He was blackmailing Fergie, I surmised, not really surprised from what I had learned about Bart. I hated him. Even in school when we were young, he was always such a selfish, mean guy, growled Connor. A bully, I saw applied helpfully. Maybe if Connor thought I was on his side, that I agreed with him, he would let me go. Yes, nodded Connor. He was a bully. Bart started blackmailing Fergie as soon as her show went national. 
I was lucky. After I realized I wasn't meant to be a chef, I learned the film industry and got a job as a sound technician on the set. I got the first few letters and was able to make certain I intercepted the rest before Fergie could ever see them. I tried to reason with him, but Bart just wouldn't listen. If he had followed through on his threats, it would have tanked her career. So you gave him money, I guessed, connecting the dots. You're the one who's been paying Bart. Does Fergie even know? Of course not, Connor shook his head. She would never have let me pay it. Knowing Fergie, she would have laughed off Bart's threats. However, I knew not to underestimate him. Bart doesn't threaten lightly. He follows up on his threats. He had to either be paid or made to shut up. If you were paying the blackmail for so long, why did you decide to kill him? I wondered. He wanted more money. Greedy son of a... Connor blared the horn at a car which was going too slow for his liking. I had maxed out my credit paying him. I couldn't afford anything more. I had to kill him. I planned it so carefully. It was easy. Use a pesticide. Pesticides get on produce all the time. I had access to the tour schedule and deliberately altered it to make Oaks Crossing one of our stops. The night before the murder, I grabbed some apricots from the local store. Bart loves apricots, sneered Connor. He can't help himself. He used to eat half a basket of them at a time once the season started. You'd think it'd make him sick. The guy had an iron stomach. How did you get the pesticide in the apricots? I wondered when the conversation hit a lull. I had a syringe. Dissolving the pesticide grains in some water and a thick mixture, I just took the syringe and needle poking each apricot and putting the mixture in a couple of the places. It doesn't take much to kill someone, noted Connor as he turned a corner, heading for the highway. Then I went into the bakery right off the grubs fellow had left and exchanged the basket of apricots. Bart didn't even notice. He was so busy sucking back an apricot and mixing something up at the stove. You saw Jackson Grubb's truck with the logo on it, I speculated. When you saw him, you came up with the idea to frame him. It was a perfect coincidence. Here I had some guy who could take the fall. I looked him up on the internet, agreed Connor. After I wiped off my fingerprints, I put the pesticide in the shed on Grubb's farm. No one was at the farm, since the guy had headed directly to the farmer's market right after dropping off Bart's order. Door to shed was unlocked, and it didn't take very long. Then I returned to the bluebells. Fergie was just getting up, and we went for breakfast. No one even suspected I had been gone. Why was one of my brownies in Bart's hand? I asked, wondering what the errant clue had to do with the murder. Connor had a huffing laugh. It wasn't one of amusement. Jack, that's one of the film guys. He was so high he thought it would be funny to put the brownie there. I don't know why the police confiscated our video. All it had was those two fools giggling and being stupid on it. Oh, I said in a sort of let-down surprise. The brownie hadn't been important at all. Fergie was horrified. She couldn't believe what had happened, spoke Connor with some regret. I didn't want to put her through this. I thought someone would have to come to the bakery and discover Bart long before we did. I didn't expect us to be the first to stumble upon the body. I never wanted her to see it. I realized Connor, in his weird way, might just be in love with Fergie. He thought he had been protecting her all along. First by dealing with the blackmail threats, then by killing Bart. It was kind of sad, and I wondered if Fergie knew. And you saw me the other night, trying to break into the breakery, and I knew you had to have figured everything out, Connor growled. Chapter 18. Help Arrives I did see you, I replied carefully. Where are we going? I don't know. Where can I go where the police won't find me? He muttered almost to himself. Connor, running isn't going to make the police stop looking for you, I ventured. Do you want to live your life looking over your shoulder, wondering when they might catch you? What choice do I have? cried Connor. They'll lock me up. Bart was a bad guy, and no one seemed to care about that. Bart was a bad guy, I agreed. Fergie wasn't the only one he was trying to blackmail. You see? I had to make him stop. He wiped out his sweaty forehead. If you run, you will never see Fergie again, I mentioned. What? Connor glanced at me in surprise. What do you mean? The police will keep an eye on her, hoping you will mess up and contact her, I shrugged. 
They will catch you if you keep in contact with Fergie. No. Connor hissed through clenched teeth. I did this for her. I did this all for her. I'm sure she would appreciate it if she knew, I soothed. I started to roll down my window. What are you doing? he asked suspiciously. Don't you find it a little hot in the car? I explained. I just wanted a little air. Connor seemed satisfied with this answer. Casually, I put my arm on the frame of the door, hoping that if a vehicle drove past, I could flag them down. I looked in the rearview mirror, but didn't see anyone behind us. My stomach sank. With sudden movements, Connor put on the brakes, pulling over the side of the road. He held onto the wheel, taking gasping breaths and shaking. Are you certain I won't be able to see Fergie? If you're on the run, I don't see how it's possible, I slowly stated. What if Fergie came with me? He desperately threw out the question. Fergie is a national celebrity, I cautioned. She will be recognized wherever she goes. Connor's voice turned desperate. His eyes pleaded with me. I don't know what to do. Tell me what to do. I think you should call the police. I shivered as I said the words, uncertain of how he might react. They'll lock me up. Connor ran a hand down his sweating face. The judge will be more lenient if you turn yourself in, I cajoled. Plus, Fergie would be allowed to visit you. Isn't the chance of her visiting you better than never seeing her again? Connor swallowed hard, looking out the windshield. You wouldn't have to be afraid anymore, I mentioned. You wouldn't have to worry about the police finding you. I'm scared to go to prison, whispered Connor. I held my breath, waiting to see what he would choose to do. I don't know. He shook his head, conflicting emotions wrestling across his face. Do you have a lawyer? I asked tentatively. Maybe a lawyer would help. A lawyer. Connor latched onto the idea. A lawyer might work. He pulled out his phone, tapping at the screen. Putting the phone against his ear, he waited, then cursed. Voicemail. Leave a message, I urged. What should I say? He muttered. Tell him you need his services. Tell him you would like him to call you at the Oaks Crossing Police Station, I suggested, watching Connor carefully, that you've done something and need help. Okay, okay. Connor took a breath and repeated my suggestions into the phone. Afterward, he ended the call and looked at me. Fear and uncertainty graced his expression. Maybe I should be the one to call the police, I ventured, holding out my hands for the phone. It's very brave what you're doing. I don't feel brave, responded a tense Connor. I don't want to do this. What would Fergie want you to do? I held my breath, hoping he would do the right thing. Connor pushed the phone into my hands. With shaking hands and fumbling fingers, I dialed 911. Placing the phone against my ear, I kept an eye on Connor. 911 operator, what is your emergency? I would like the police. I cleared my suddenly dry voice. There's a gentleman here who would like to turn himself in for a crime he committed. What is the address? I looked around the road. We had traveled some distance from Oaks Crossing. On westbound road outside of Oaks Crossing? We were just before the main highway which leads to the city. On the side of the road, parked with an orange vintage Volkswagen Beetle. What is your name, and what is the gentleman's name? My name is Ivy Thurman. I hesitated. His name is Connor. I I'm not certain of his last name. I looked at Connor appealingly, but he put his head in his hands, avoiding the question. Is Connor with you right now? Yes, I replied to the affirmative. Can you say what crime he committed, or do you think it is unsafe to do so? The operator asked. He murdered Bart Baker, I whispered, keeping an eye on Connor for his reaction. He didn't move or seem to have noticed at what I had said. Does the man with you, Connor, does he have a weapon? No. I revised my answer now uncertain. I don't think so. He hasn't shown me one. Is there any way that you can lead the area to a safer place? I looked down at my cast. Not really. Police are on the way, the operator assured me. They should be there soon. Stay on the phone with me until they arrive. Thank you, I breathed, praying the police would hurry. Minutes dragged on, but it couldn't have been very long before Connor looked up and saw the police lights in the mirror. They're here. It's going to be okay, I said, not knowing if it was true or not. I can't do this, he muttered, becoming upset. You can, I tried to coach him. Just follow their instructions. 
I can't, he wailed. I can't go to prison. Suddenly, Connor wrenched open the driver's side door, lunging out of the car. He ran down the asphalt as the police car came to a halt. Cutting across the road, Connor leapt into the ditch, fought through weeds, and disappeared into the brush. Another cop car screeched to a halt, lights flashing. Within moments, it felt like I was surrounded by half of the Oaks Crossing's police department. Police were chasing after Connor, others talking on their equipment, another poking his head into my car, which still had the driver's door wide open. "'Are you okay?' he asked. I recognized the blonde rookie cop from the carnival game, and I managed to nod. "'Stay right here and lock your doors!' He gently shut the door of the bug and went to talk to someone else. I locked the doors, then realized the phone was still talking to me. "'Hello?' I responded. "'Are the police there?' the operator asked. "'Yes,' I replied quickly. "'Yes, they are. Is Connor still with you?' "'No, he ran away,' I answered, trying to look to see where he might be through the activity. "'The police are chasing him. "'Where are you right now?' I'm locked inside my car. I rolled up my window, leaving it open just a crack for airflow. Good. Then you are safe, the operator said. I'm going to hang up since the police are there. Okay, I murmured. Soon enough, the call ended, and I set Connor's phone on the dashboard of the car. Shivering, I waited and watched. Time seemed to pass slowly as I waited to see if the police would find the fleeing Connor. A knock came at the window beside my head, and I jumped, heart pounding. Turning, I saw an unamused Armand looking down at me. "'Open your door,' he commanded. I complied, unlocking, then opening the door. "'Keys,' Armand held out a hand. Surprised, I pulled the keys out of the ignition and handed them to him. Armand pocketed them. He stepped aside, clearly expecting me to get out of the car. Grabbing my crutch and hopping on my one good foot, I complied as best as I could. "'Where's your other crutch?' questioned Armand as he helped me across the uneven surface beside the road. The crutch is at the Tasty Treats Bakery, I told him, where I found Connor, or rather, Connor found me. I thought we talked about your confronting suspects, he muttered, teeth clenched. I did not try to confront him, I hotly replied. I noticed the door to the Tasty Treats Bakery was unlocked. You just happened to notice it was unlocked, came Armand's sarcastic response. Yes! I thought the bakery might have been robbed. I was about to call you to report it when Connor grabbed me, dragging me inside, I explained. We walked over to a police SUV. Armand opened the passenger door. Have a seat. Gratefully, I sat. I did not plan on talking to him. I thought he had left town. Armand pulled out a pad of paper and a pencil. What happened at the bakery? I shrugged, thinking about it. Strangely, it seemed so long ago. He was searching for the fabricated clue. B had let it slip to all of our suspects that there might be a clue to solve the murders that had been left behind by the police. The one you and your gang of senior sleuths said was still at the bakery, drawled the detective. Do you want me to tell you, or are you just going to poke fun at my friends? I scowled at him. Please proceed, stated Armand. I told him we had seen him in the class photo, and the police now had it, I answered. Connor decided he needed to get out of town and commandeered my car. I don't know why he took me with him, maybe so I wouldn't call the police. We talked about why he had decided to murder Bart. Apparently Bart was blackmailing Fergie, but Connor had been interceding on her behalf all these years. Connor was the one paying the blackmail money, but he couldn't afford to anymore, and Bart was raising the amount he wanted. Connor poisoned Bart, framed Jackson, and was now looking to escape. Yeah, you were able to call emergency. Armand didn't look up as he jotted down notes. Connor didn't realize a life on the run meant he wouldn't be able to see Fergie. He was just trying to protect her, I said softly. Once he understood this was going to be the cost of his actions, he was ready to turn himself in and face what he had done. Yet he still ran, noted Armand. I guess he panicked when he saw the police cars, I murmured. Is he going to be okay? No one is going to hurt him, right? The police are searching the brush right now. We will do our best to take him in with minimal confrontation. It all depends on his actions, advised Armand. Did you see any weapons? No, I shook my head. No known weapon, spoke Armand into his radio before turning back to me. Does he have his cell phone? No, Connor's phone is in my car, I replied, on the dash. What about your cell phone? Armand raised an eyebrow. It's at the bakery, I answered. 
I dropped it on the floor with my purse. Did he say where he was going? He wrote something down on his pad of paper. He wanted to turn himself in, I insisted. Yet when he saw the police car, Connor panicked and ran. I don't think he's planning on going anywhere. He's just reacting right now. Which is a dangerous state of mind, frowned Armand. Anything else I should know about? I don't think so, I admitted, my mind in a whirl from the events which were happening. Good. Stay in the car. Armand helped me put the crutch in beside me and shut the passenger door of the vehicle. I watched as he walked over to the chief of police. The two of them stood talking until a group of muddy officers appeared out of the brush, leading a muddy and handcuffed Connor with them. The group slowly walked through the ditch and then across the road. Connor was placed inside the back of a police car. Opening the door of my car, I hopped out, leaning against it. Is he okay? Haman and the chief of police shared a look before the detective walked over to me. You're asking if a murderer is okay? I guess, I mumbled. I feel a little bad for him. He killed Bart and let Jackson go to jail instead of him, Armand stated dryly. He would have let Jackson go to prison if you hadn't talked him into letting you call 911. So are you saying I was an integral part of this case? I mentioned slyly. That maybe you couldn't have solved it without me and my amateur senior sleuths? Armand rolled his eyes. Get back in the car. Grinning smugly, I did as I was told. An impromptu party was taking place at the Central Park in Oaks Crossing. Everyone was invited, and the crowd had grown quite large. People brought food, beverages, and lawn chairs. All monies raised for Jackson's release were being redistributed to the fine citizens of Oaks Crossing in the form of free hamburgers and hot dogs. Will Knapp's karaoke continued to entertain. The guest of honor, Jackson Grubbs, was inundated by hugs and goodwill. It was easy to see Jackson was happy to have been released from police custody. The charges dropped as Connor had immediately confessed to his crime. People lined up to greet and congratulate Jackson, a beaming Ava sitting at his side. They are just too cute, drawled an unimpressed Molly as we slowly made our way forward. I still get the impression he has no clue how she feels. Don't interfere, I warned in a hushed tone. Ava needs to be able to tell him in her own time. Ivy! Jackson greeted us. He stood up to give me a hug. I'm so glad you came. I was hoping to thank you for everything you did and make me a free man. I didn't do much, I deferred. However, I am happy that you've been released. Didn't do much, exclaimed Jackson. Ava told me everything you've been through. Produce for this season is on me. Jackson, I can't, I protested. I've started a baking business with the campground. I can't get free produce from you. It's too much. I insist, Jackson stated firmly. I'm also bringing a basket around to each of the people who organized the sit-in demonstration protesting my arrest. This is the least I can do. She will enjoy the produce. Thank you. Molly pulled me away before I could refuse further. Molly, I objected, trying to keep my balance as she propelled me along. It is unfair to take groceries from him for the rest of the season. I don't want to bankrupt the poor guy. He offered, and you need to save the money, insisted Molly. You can let him back out next month if necessary. For now, take the reward of finding the killer and getting him out of jail. I suppose, I murmured, not entirely convinced. I noticed Molly's attention had been diverted. I followed her gaze to see Chaz Bison talking to some people while he waited at the end of a line for burgers. Be nice to Chaz. Remember, he's a good Christian guy. I'll be more than nice to the Irish cream dream. Excuse me. Molly wandered over to Chaz, striking up a conversation. Shaking my head at her boldness, I couldn't help but smile. Molly would never change. I just hoped Chaz was ready for her. Yoo-hoo, Ivy! Thelma raved a hand from a nearby picnic table. Thelma, B, Herb, Conrad, Mabel, and Agatha were all gathered, enjoying the celebration. We saved you a spot! With a grin, I crutched towards them.